Come back inside. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. You got rid of the robot android cyborg? No, even better. Potty, I guess I really misjudged you. What the? When worlds collide. Pretty sweet, eh? Crap. You can run. But no can hide. When worlds collide, you'll laugh so hard, you'll swear you died. When worlds collide, hold my hand, I'll be your guy. When worlds collide, buckle, buckle, buckle up for the sweetest ride and prepare to have your mind blown wide. When worlds collide, when <laughs> Yo, check it out. When worlds collide, it's a curious thing that you never heard a robot and a caveman sing. In his metal chest are some word gift parts. How is that different from my beat in art? I'm from the future. And I'm from the past. But that don't mean this friendship wasn't built to last. He was made in a lab and I was born in a cave. So let me hear you holler for this inter error raid. Word. I am Spongy Strong. You, 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 you can run. But you can hide. I guess you were right. The future is cool. Just to show you there's no hard feelings, I got you a present from the prehistoric times. Oh, what is it? A new loincloth? No. An enlarged forehead? No. Oh, what is it? There was once this famous game developer who had begun with humble beginnings developing rather niche games, but would one day step into the spotlight when they put out a game that would take the industry by storm. Their work helped to inspire a generation, and they had big shoes to fill. One day, the studio announced it was doing something it had never done before. This beloved developer doing something new and ambitious was surely a formula for one of the greatest games of this generation. Pre-orders went through the roof. There was a lot resting on the studio's shoulders, and they were unconfident in their ability to get it out in an acceptable state. But the time had come for it to release. Besides, wouldn't want to miss the holiday sales. So, it was released to the world, in whatever state it ended up in by then. The results were atrocious. The game barely worked on hardware it was designed for. Game crashes weren't exactly uncommon, with even issues of corrupted save data cropping up for some users. Models didn't really work. Frame rate didn't really work. Rendering didn't really work physics didn't really work. It was overall a broken, unfinished game that could have easily used another couple of years in the oven. The backlash was unprecedented. Many users were refunding the game, refunds being offered despite the parent company of the digital store's usual policy on refunds, which really speaks to how bad it was. The game got memed into oblivion. Investors were furious and started coming after the company, whose stock price dropped by half. It truly seemed like an ordeal this company would have to take a very long time to recover from and regain the trust of their player base, if it was even possible. The story you just heard is, of course, talking about CD Projekt Red in Cyberpunk 2077. Sure, it draws a lot of parallels to the story of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, but the difference here is in the end of the story. The reception and consequences. While big reviewers typically complained about the performance and glitches, it was often with the caveat that it didn't interfere with an otherwise great game, and that this was a good step in the right direction. Good step in the right direction being the thing that we've heard for the last several years now. Pokemon's stock has gone unchanged. It's actually seen a slight increase with the release of the games, which is pretty standard for a successful game launch. And, as always, the game sold like hotcakes, becoming the most successful Nintendo launch ever. It's Pokemon, so no matter what state it ships in, it's going to perform splendidly, and dodge scrutiny that other titles of similar quality like Cyberpunk would be subject to. Or, at least so I thought would turn out to be the case. While Scarlet and Violet still got a decent Metacritic score, to the point that it beats out actual amazing Pokemon games, what the heck? It's the lowest rated mainline Pokemon game in series history, 
just beating out BDSP. Despite generally positive critic reviews, the ratings change drastically when you look at user reviews. Yeah, that's not what most people seem to think is a good game. While Legends Arceus' bugginess was a lot more under wraps, with not a lot of people talking about it, Scarlet and Violet got the cyberpunk treatment and got memed to oblivion. On my Legends Arceus playthrough, it wasn't exactly uncommon to be getting comments salty at me for my criticisms, whereas on my Scarlet and Violet playthrough, that barely even happened anymore. It's almost as if we've gotten to the breaking point where more people are starting to see it as indefensible. Nintendo themselves became well aware of the quality this game shipped in, considering they began to issue refunds after so many people were asking for them, contrary to their usual stance, similar to how Sony and Microsoft would give refunds for Cyberpunk despite their usual stance. My original plan for this intro was to lead in with the story of Cyberpunk to say that these two games' stories parallel one another in terms of the hype behind them and horrendous state they shipped in, but Pokemon, by being Pokemon, was shielded from any criticism, but it honestly didn't quite turn out that way like I thought it would. These stories are actually closer than I expected. Nintendo and the Pokemon Company have felt repercussions, even if it's nowhere to the same degree. And is it enough to warrant actually putting effort into these games though? Probably not. It's Pokemon, it'll sell like crazy no matter what. And with Cyberpunk, this was an isolated one game incident. It's not like people keep on buying Cyberpunk 2, 3, and 4 that continue to release year after year after year, and continue to be surprised Pikachu when it turns out the game is incomplete. But Pokemon has been consistently proving they're willing to put out half-baked games, and the player base has been consistently proving they're willing to buy them, regardless of the evidence and in past instances that indicated the game would turn out such a way. I've long said around here that mainline Pokemon's quality has only been getting worse and worse with each successive title on the Switch, and I find Scarlet and Violet to be shining proof of that. It feels like every subsequent title has been the Pokemon company experimenting how low effort and cheaply can we make these games while still selling like crazy. And how much these games are being fleshed out has only been getting worse and worse, only it seems Scarlet and Violet marked the breaking point for many players. Even with the Dexit drama, it's like the player base was pretty split, but Scarlet and Violet is the first time I feel I've actually seen the majority of people be like, yeah, this game quality sucks. Or maybe I'm wrong on that. It's been genuinely surprising, but good to see. Of course, anybody familiar with my video essays knows that we go deep into analysis, that I'm not here to be like insert any generic game reviewer who says, the performance issues aren't great, but the gameplay is so absolutely amazing that it excuses it. These are some of the best Pokemon games ever. It's so great they took a single step in the right direction. Yeah, that's not what we're doing here. This video is the culmination of over half a year of work, because there's a lot that warrants being covered in this game. To make it easier to manage, this video is divided into seven key chapters, most of which cover some pretty standard things like gameplay, soundtrack, story, so on. Chapter 1 is everything before release, so pre-order bonuses, release schedule, marketing stance. Chapter 2 is everything about Scarlet and Violet being open world games, as that's something that these titles brought to the table, and the gameplay chapter proper is everything else about the gameplay. Chapter 5 is something a bit different that I haven't tried in a video essay before. It's a full story rewrite that I spent a couple months working on. As always, the legend will be in the description with timestamps if you want to jump to any specific chapter, and this time, rather than just the full chapters, I've decided to cut them into subsections in case there's any specific subject matter within the chapter you'd like to jump to. All music and footage credit will be in the pinned comment, and its replies, as I'd be very surprised if everything there is to credit could fit into a single pinned comment, as we have over 6 hours of music to credit here. And I'd highly recommend checking out some of the talented music creators responsible for the themes used in this video. In case it's easier for anyone, I'll also put the full credit in a doc in the description. We have a lot to get into in this video essay adventure, so without further ado, let's go seek our treasure. Whether we find it though, well, we'll find out. Scarlet and Violet were announced really soon after the last title, and I mean really soon. The announcement trailer went up on February 27th, 2022. 
Pokemon Legends Arceus released on January 28th, 2022. That's a difference of only one month. For about a year, Pokemon went all out on the marketing of, hey, look at this Generation 4 content we've got coming up. Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl, and Legends Arceus are our grand return to Sinnoh for new and old players alike. BDSP released as an incomplete game, missing several features even with the hefty day one patch that was nearly as large as the physical game itself, and would only be truly finished as of May 26th, 2022, when home support was added. But before BDSP could even become a finished game, here's Legends Arceus, the new most current title and what the Pokemon company wants you focusing on. So you start playing that, and Pokemon gives you one month before they say, look here, Generation 9 is coming out later this year. You should get all focused and hyped about this upcoming title. Legends Arceus is old news by now, it's time for the next game. And then for some reason, in March, they try to get players to go back to BDSP again by having content that's made available in it, by having a finished save file of Legends Arceus. Perhaps they waited on this a bit because they wanted to bring players back when their game was actually more finished. I also find it really funny how the prerequisite for catching Arceus is catching Arceus. Anyway, the Pokemon company announced there was a tiny smidge of new content for BDSP and Legends Arceus, and then these games were pretty much over. Now the full marketing focus is full steam ahead on Scarlet and Violet. It's like you barely get any time to really savor a game before having the next one pushed in your face. Because these games aren't meant to be savored, they're meant to simply be consumed. And I find this push for title after title rather suffocating. Scarlet and Violet got announced while I was in the middle of making the video essay on Legends Arceus. I wouldn't be surprised if the next games got announced while working on this video. There are very few IPs in the gaming industry that pump up mainline titles at speeds that could even compare to Pokemon. Most notable examples would probably be Call of Duty or sports games, which I'm sure we all know by now are famous for their unparalleled consistency for quality. Pokemon was able to make do with regular releases a lot easier in the past when it was handheld rather than home console. The titles within each generation would just use the same engine as one another, and enhanced versions would get released to essentially try and sell you the same game again. All these three factors that would make consistent releases easier have been eliminated from the equation. The Switch is a handheld home console hybrid, and the production demands are going to be a lot higher than on a purely handheld device. Every Pokemon title we've seen on the Switch has been different. I mean, not in terms of this core design, which only Legends Arceus is something a bit different for. But rather, in the overall region, method of exploration, and type of world you're interacting with. This means you can't recycle as much, and is going to increase the workload. And finally, we're not getting enhanced third versions that essentially resell the same game but better. And don't get me wrong, I don't mind their absence. I don't think it's right to just resell an enhanced version a year or two later. But if you're going to continue the exact same release consistency with all completely different games, or even faster release consistency, considering in the year from November 2021 to November 2022, we had three games release, then it shouldn't be at all surprising that the production quality is going to take a major hit with their absence. Even if I use the D-pad for the grid, it- WHAT?! Now, there are other ways to make a regular release workload more manageable, one of the biggest ones being to have different studios working on different games. Then your in-house team can work on one project while another studio works on a different project. And I feel like this can result in some of the greatest passion we can see poured into a game, giving a studio the opportunity to work on such a massive IP, such as Ubisoft given the chance to make a Mario game, or Mercury Steam given the chance to develop the Metroid 2 remake in Metroid Dread. Just imagine how much passion an established studio given the chance to work on such an IP like Pokemon would have, as we've already seen in things like Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. But the very first time a mainline title is given to somebody else with BDSP, it's an outsourcing company that typically just helps with parts of games but has never made an actual full game before. So on the right track with being willing to let others work through your IP, but to give it to Ilka, who I would imagine was probably just one of the cheapest and easiest options, and, well, we all know how that went. At least this did take some workload off of the shoulders of Game Freak, who still need to figure out how to divide their team in such a way that they'd get two games out in the same year, Legends Arceus and Scarlet and Violet. Game Freak isn't exactly a small studio, but not exactly super large either, approximately being at around 169 staff. Which, for games in the highest grossing media IP, isn't exactly a whole lot considering staff sizes of other large game studios. 
such as Monolith Soft, who when Xenoblade Chronicles 1 released in 2010, had about 80 staff, and nowadays has over 270. Game Freak has grown over the years, but not by a lot. So why hasn't Game Freak continued to grow to the same degree, when they're responsible for such a massive IP on their shoulders? Well, I can't know for sure, but I can't help but feel like it's because it's going to sell well anyway because of the strength of this brand name, so why pay for extra staff when it's not needed? For example, back in 2019, Activision Blizzard had a record-setting year of revenue, but they wanted to boost their earnings even more, so they laid off about 800 staff who were seen as unnecessary. Hiring more staff for Game Freak is unnecessary when a name like Pokemon will be some of the highest selling games on the console by name alone, so why bother? Hiring an experienced studio to make a high quality version of your remake is unnecessary, again because of the name. So why not instead give it to a cheap studio who's never made a game, and seemingly cut down their ambitions and just make the most one-to-one -one game they can from the original, to the point that a lot of the code was copy-pasted and allowed for very quick manipulation of the game's glitches and code because people already knew how it worked. Pokemon no longer has the quality safety net of being on a lower, purely handheld console, using the same engine across all games in the same generation, and releasing enhanced third versions. But rather than continuing to grow and match the new industry demands, we just see the cheapest roads taken. These factors, combined with this push to always be relevant, always have a new game on the horizon people are looking forward to, always have new merchandise to sell, it's going to have consequences on the product being sold, and that's exactly what we saw here leading up to release. Less than a year out from launch and we've got a reveal trailer with textures that look like they're being rendered on the PS2 and frame rates that are clearly struggling. Even in trailers just a few months out from launch and the game is looking like it's still in an early development state. The greatest graphical improvements seem to arrive in trailers just a month out from launch. I've had my discussion on vertical slices in previous Pokemon essays, so I'll give the short version here. For some reason, a lot of people seem to have this idea that the entire video game is being worked on equally at once until it's eventually finished, when this is far from the case. After you've got your core systems figured out, you're typically going to want to start working on vertical slices. If your entire game is one straight timeline and you take out one specific section, that's a vertical slice of your game. If you've ever played a game demo, that's a vertical slice of the full game. Work on fleshing out sections to near complete states, and you can use them for marketing, promotion, demos. This is what you share, while the stuff you're still working on stays under wraps until it's done. Pokemon doesn't have this regard though. They're being rushed out so fast that they have no choice but to show you what they're working on right in your face in the months leading up to release. Scarlet and Violet to me is the biggest instance on the Switch where it's like, wow, the game footage really wasn't final. And I see people praising that game footage not final resulted in drastic change before release like some prophecy was fulfilled. Not realizing that saving such vital details until the last stretch before release is the opposite of indicative of a well fleshed out product. Now, there's a comparison here that I like to draw attention to. In September 2022 was one of the biggest leaks in gaming history being of Grand Theft Auto 6. This game was still in early, early development, far from a state where Rockstar would be willing to show it to the public. And yet, at these leaks, you had people denouncing the company for the quality of the game, and saying no way were they going to buy the game now. This obviously isn't what the final game is going to look like. It was a leaker that showed early production of the game. It's not like it was the company itself choosing to release an official trailer where the game looks clearly unfinished, as we might see if your name is Atari. Or Pokemon, who will show their far-from-finished game less than a year out, and try their best in a mad scramble to finish as much as they can before release. And the reason I wanted to draw attention to this is because this reaction that some had to the GTA 6 leak seemed to get some people from the Pokemon community to lump people who judged an early production game, which is so far out it doesn't have a release date yet and most likely won't anytime soon, and was revealed to them by a leaker rather than the company themselves, for being unfinished, as people who judge a game that should be in its final stages of development, which has a release date set in stone mere months out and is being shared with them by the company for being unfinished. Yes, I'm sure these types of people are exactly the same, hit the nail right on the head. So, I didn't think this is something that would need to be explained, but I guess it's no surprise Twitter would prove me wrong. 
If you've got an unfinished game without a release date because it's unfinished, well, that's normal. But if you've got an unfinished game with a release date right around the corner and are just rolling the dice hoping that you'll be able to finish what you need to in time, then that's concerning. Especially considering Pokemon has shown us in the past that they can't finish in time. I'll reiterate something I've said in previous essays. It's good when there's improvement before release, but when something as basic as your graphics aren't even done until within the months before release, then what's that supposed to leave the consumer with in terms of expectations for the rest of the product you're selling? But I suppose that doesn't matter when you've got a brand name that unshakable. Now then, pre-order and early buying bonuses. In BDSP, we saw a whole early buying bonus chart, where the only way to get everything on the chart was to buy the digital double pack. And while these rewards aren't much since they're easily earnable in-game, kids, who are the main focus of Pokemon's marketing, aren't really going to know that. All they're going to know is that the only way to get all the things is to get the digital double pack. There was also the early buying bonus which lasted until a bit past the release of Legends Arceus, so that players of Legends who didn't buy BDSP might take notice that they're permanently locked out of the Darkrai event unless they shell out for BDSP, so it gets them thinking about whether they want to buy BDSP. And what's this? Better decide within the next month or else you'll never have access to this content in BDSP. It'll be impossible to ever have a perfect save file. Legends Arceus had an early buying bonus as well, so if you get the game past that date, I guess you'll just never be able to have a perfect save file unless you hack, which you should never do because it's just as bad as nuzlocking. We thought that this would be a fun idea for a Nintendo Minute we video. We did, so that, yeah. So we pitched it to the Pokemon company and, and said, hey, get slapped. we would like to do a nuzlocke run. What do you think? And they thought they were going to fire us. They said, here's what we think. Bam! Yeah, no, seriously. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, shoot. So Sorry. they said, we consider this to be on the same level as, as using like hack, a ha a hack game, ROM. ROM hacks. Like, how is that the it's same? Like, Excuse me? Creating ROM hacks or doing spicy challenge runs like Nuzlocke's isn't an inherently bad thing. But Pokemon hates people doing it for the same reason Nintendo hates people pirating their legacy content. Because it takes absolute control away from them. And this is why we see emphasis on things like early buying bonuses and content locked behind other games. It's not like it's forcing anybody to buy said products, but it's the little nudges of a master marketer saying, hey, look at this thing right here. The only people who are going to be able to have the full thing are those who buy early and buy every title. So what do we see from Pokemon Scarlet and Violet? Once again, we have an early buying bonus, being Flying Pikachu so better get the game soon after it comes out. But what's strange is that while in recent history Pokemon had typically been doing an early buying bonus instead of a pre-order bonus, here they have both an early buying and pre-order bonus. Now, sometimes there's certain sellers that will include something small physically as a pre-order bonus, which Scarlet and Violet do have, but they also have permanently missable in-game content if you don't purchase from a certain seller. And who would that be, you might ask? Why, Pokemon Center, of course. This backpack is obtainable only if you pre-order the double pack directly off of Pokemon's website. $119 for a Pokemon game? With a backpack code, Mr. Squidward, with a backpack code. Anybody who purchases from anywhere else, even if they shell out for the double pack, is out of luck. It'll be impossible to ever have a perfect save file unless you do this. Now, I don't usually 100% games, but I at least like knowing that I have the option to do so if I put in enough effort, instead of being told, best I can give you is 99%. Sorry you didn't buy the game in this one specific way when you had the chance. I mean, I think it's really, really cool, so I'll go like 100 a quarter. I mean, that's, that's the best I could do. Um... It just feels like a serious lack of respect for the player in these kinds of situations. Now, why would Pokemon do something like this? Restrict something behind Pokemon Center? Two main reasons. The first being to eliminate the middleman. If you go through another seller, well, they're going to need a cut so they can turn a profit too. But what if there was a cheat code to further diminish the already dying middleman from the equation to generate more sales in a way where the only additional expenses is production and shipping costs? Why, such a solution does exist. Just offer exclusive in-game content that's impossible to ever get otherwise. 
And then we can make it even more appealing by offering digital rewards that are clearly trash from other sellers. You ordered the game from Amazon? Here's a few healing items. Now you can heal like 20 HP of your Pokemon a few times, cure some poison, and get a few revives. You ordered from Best Buy? Here's six berries. Yep, one of each from the looks of it. You may heal each of these status conditions once. Wow. I sure wouldn't want to be that unfortunate sucker who didn't get a copy from Best Buy and gets burned once with no way to heal it. But dang, if I get poisoned twice, then that guy who ordered from Amazon will be able to heal while I'm stuck poisoned. As well, if you go through pretty much any seller, it seems like there's some extra Pokeballs in the deal for you if you buy the double pack. Which, by the way, just like previous double packs from this IP, comes at no cheaper than buying the two games individually. Technically, it's even one penny more expensive. For those unfamiliar with Pokemon, the difficulty of earning these types of items in-game is trivial. In terms of in-game content, only one seller offers something truly exclusive, while the others offer some of the most trivial consumables imaginable that can be earned in-game in no time. But then you may wonder, why would this be behind Pokemon Center where they still need to pay for manufacturing and shipping costs? Why wouldn't this reward be exclusive to the Nintendo eShop where they can make the most revenue on each purchase? Especially since that's what they tried to do with BDSP. And that's an excellent question, astute viewer, and I'd say there's a couple things to consider here. One is that there's many players who try to go physical whenever possible, have something they can put on a shelf, lend out, keep a piece of gaming history. I'm somebody that gets physical games for this reason. People in this group really aren't going to want to buy digitally, even if you offer something exclusive to it. It'd be strange for 99% of my library to be physical, and this one other title is digital. Even with BDSP, we saw that the content restricted to the digital double pack is items earnable in-game, rather than exclusive content. As for the second big reason why you'd want to offer this through Pokemon Center, while the games are what Pokemon is centered around, they are far from the highest revenue generator for this IP. Pokemon is the highest grossing media IP in history. You've got the video games, the anime, the movies, the trading card game, and the highest revenue generator of them all, the merchandise. Pokemon Center is a decently known site, but it's not exactly super well known. It was only even made available in the West towards the end of 2014. Most people who want to buy Pokemon products are probably going to go through some other seller. So what if you made this site known to a greater audience by offering something exclusive for your upcoming new generation of games? And perfectly during a time that you're rolling out all sorts of new merchandise for the new generation. And all sorts of new merchandise for the holiday season. Having exclusive content behind pre-ordering the double pack on Pokemon Center means that Pokemon maximizes its revenue by eliminating the middleman while still offering a physical product for consumers who want a physical copy, while also serving as an advertising campaign for their true highest revenue generator, merchandise, and the most direct way you can purchase it. And by locking this exclusive digital content behind a pre-order bonus means that the only way you can get it is by purchasing it before it releases, before people start playing it and sharing their opinions before you can see any reviews or videos like this pertaining to these specific titles that might make you have second thoughts. There's no need to know what people are saying about the game. You've heard it from us that the game is good. So make your choice before anyone else can tell you differently. The people behind Pokemon genuinely are marketing geniuses. There's a reason Pokemon has continued to stay on the top. Their ability to crack the code to find new creative ways to push the sales of both games and merchandise is honestly fascinating. But anyway, that's just talking about digital content being offered for pre-orders. What about the additional physical content? Well, if you pre-order the double pack from GameStop, you get the GameStop exclusive pin set. If you pre-order from Japan's Pokemon Center, you get exclusive cards and a whole bunch of other stuff. If you pre-order from Pokemon Center in Singapore, according to Game 8, you get art books. But I instead found the Steelbook on Singapore's Pokemon Center, so we're going with that instead. I could only actually find set art books on Japan's Pokemon Center, and apparently there's a separate one for Scarlet and Violet? If you pre-order from Game in the UK, you get starter Pokemon figurines, and the seal book if you buy the double pack. If you pre-order from the Game Collection in UK, you get a double side poster and sticky notes. So let's say you're a collector, you want to have all the bonuses for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet when it releases. What crazy combination do you do for it to probably be the cheapest? And how much is it going to cost you? Well, let's do the math here. 
My first step to solve this mystery would have been to get the double pack from Singapore's Pokemon Center to secure both the Steelbook and the Pokemon Center exclusive backpack, but strangely enough, I didn't actually see any mention of the backpack on Singapore's site. Heck, I didn't even find the backpack on Japan's Pokemon Center site. And that means we need a double pack from a different Pokemon Center to secure the backpack. This will also get us the 200 Pokeballs, so let's say we're at $120 USD. But then of course we need to order the double pack from some other seller anyway to secure the Steelbook, so add another $120. We need to order a double pack from Japan's Pokemon Center to secure the art book for both titles. Has to be a double pack or we only get one art book. And ordering this means we also get the commemorative card. It'll come in one of three delivery boxes, which are just randomly selected. You'll get a special serial code, which according to Game 8 gives some sort of exclusive wallpapers, which probably won't be exclusive for long if people share them online. The special promotion card. And of course, there's Flying Pikachu, though everyone who buys early gets that. And 200 more Pokeballs. Don't let the 100 throw you off, it's two codes for 100. This costs 13,156 yen, which at the time of writing this script is $91.39 USD. Seems that over in Japan, it's both way cheaper and gives you way more stuff. I did check, and it still holds true that the double pack is no cheaper than the two games individually. And then we need to pre-order another double pack off GameStop to secure the pins, so add another 120. And then we need to order one copy from the game collection in the UK for the double side poster and sticky notes. That's going to be £43 or $45 US. Then we're going to need one copy from Game in the UK for the starter figures. That's going to be £50 or $53 US. Now we've secured all the physical things and exclusive digital content, clocking in at a total of $549.48, not accounting for taxes or shipping costs. But if we're that much of a collector, we're probably going to want the other digital goods as well just to have that little slip of paper that includes the healing set and the berry set. These don't need the double pack, so we'll just get one of each. So let's add 60 USD twice to bring the new total up to 669.48. But of course if we're that much of an insane collector that's willing to spend that much, then we'd naturally be wanting the exclusive Switch OLED as well. According to Best Buy, its retail value is $359.99, and it doesn't even come with a copy of the games. This brings our new total to a bit over $1,000. But if we actually want everything that Scarlet and Violet is being bundled with, then we're gonna need those other Japan boxes. We could say, instead of the double pack, we ordered two individual ones, and just add one more individual one for 6,578 yen, or 45.65 USD. So, a grand total of nearly $1,100. Assuming we had good enough RNG to get a different box every time. It could just go higher and higher if you don't get good enough RNG or you could just buy the box off someone directly. This nets us a grand total of 13 copies of the game, a Switch, one exclusive digital backpack, 13 flying Pikachus, three art books, three exclusive shipping boxes, each of which is different, three double pack boxes, two steel books, one for each game, one double side poster, one set of sticky notes, one set of pins, one starters figurine, three commemorative cards, three promotion cards, three special serial codes, six codes for 100 Pokeballs, one healing item code, and one berries code. While we don't need multiple of each, buying that many is required to have a minimum of one of everything. The point I'm trying to make here isn't that consumers who want everything are going to have to pay that much, but rather that it puts consumers into a situation where it's near impossible to obtain all the things the game is being bundled with at launch. It's not feasible, and it's specifically designed not to be. There's a little something to push you in the direction of any one of these options, though some options may be far more appealing than others. What almost all the best options seem to have in common, though, is that they're the double pack. Buy both versions of the same game bundled together for the same price as buying two full-priced video games. To delve a bit into my perspective on pre-order or early buying bonuses, here's what I think. A digital pre-order or early buying bonus itself is fine, as long as it's something meaningful that can be legitimately earned by other players, and can be easily accessed. Let's tackle all the parts of that statement. First, that it's something meaningful. Offering players who pre-ordered a code for some basic healing items, or a small handful of berries, or a reward of Pokeballs for buying the double pack, these are near meaningless. The impact they're going to have is probably barely even going to be noticed, if at all because it's some of the most easy to obtain items imaginable. 
Instead of potions, antidotes, and revives, you could have included some full restores, TMs, stat boosters. Something that actually gives the player a smidge of an edge, without going too hard on handing them easy keys to victory like BDSP with Miu and Jirachi if you own Let's Go and Sword and Shield. Find a nice middle ground. Instead of six berries, here's a few of every berry in the game. And in the game itself, have it be so that every player can manage berries at any time. So, the portable berry plants from Heart Gold and Soul Silver, or even better, the Pokemon Pelago from Pokemon Sun and Moon. Have berry farming be implemented in a meaningful way where you can continue to work on it at any time, rather than having to trek across the world for them or plant them across the world like most titles. And then, by giving some players a distinct edge in berries, it's going to set them up pretty well, while still not breaking the game in two. Instead of Pokeballs, have it be dozens of Ultra Balls, or maybe several of the more niche and difficult to obtain types of Pokeballs, or maybe just one Master Ball since you usually only get one of those per playthrough if you don't get lucky with RNG based minigames. Turn the rewards into something genuinely meaningful, instead of useless trash. Another example would be customization items. BDSP, the Platinum Outfits. Yes, that's absolutely a meaningful reward but also something that really feels like it should have been base game considering it was just the Platinum default outfit. I mean, those games really did Platinum dirty. Legends Arceus, a Growlithe set. Alright, that's pretty neat. Sure, that's meaningful too. Scarlet and Violet, a backpack. Eh, teetering on the edge of meaningful in my opinion. But then we come to the second part of my statement. It needs to be legitimately earnable by all players. This means don't be giving something only to your early buyers that will be impossible to obtain for anyone who decides to buy later. Either make it earnable in-game, such as a Master Ball where you'll typically only get one and getting more is possible but it's difficult, or make it exclusive only for a limited time. For example, let's say players who pre-order get an exclusive outfit, but once the game has been out for a year, everybody gets it. That way you've still got an exclusive thing that you're able to show off in the opening year when the game is trending. But a year later, once things have fizzled down and it becomes more niche, everyone just gets access to it. If I buy a game a decent bit after a release, and enjoy it so much I decide I want 100% it, well, then I can rest easy knowing the day will come I get the small piece I'm missing, instead of just killing my motivation to 100% the game by knowing it's impossible. And the final part of my statement, it can be easily accessed. By having this backpack exclusive to pre-orders from the Pokemon Center Devil Pack, you've alienated players who wanted to play digitally, You've alienated players who wanted to only purchase one game instead of both. You've alienated players who want to purchase from some retailer that's more convenient or maybe they want to support. And you've alienated those who want to play on day one because even though it says it's supposed to have been shipped to arrive on day one, games that are ordered very seldom do in my experience. So instead, have this backpack be available to players who purchase the game digitally or from any other retailer have it be available to players who only purchase one copy of the game instead of two, and have it be available to every player after a certain amount of time. What about physical pre-order bonuses though? I've argued before that physical bonuses are fine as something small additionally that has nothing to do with the content available in the actual game you've bought. Whether you've got some special pins for example is going to have no effect on whether you're able to obtain everything that's possible to obtain within the actual video game. So if you universally have some physical pre-order bonus available, well, that can be neat. However, rather than some universally available pre-order bonus, we seem to see something completely different from these countless different retailers, overloading the potential consumer in choices that it can be difficult to figure out where they're even going to purchase this game. It's a mess. It's also worth considering how a lot of games will have a special or collector's edition of some sort, where you get a special set filled with all kinds of goodies that makes these editions quite sought after. Nintendo special editions I'd pay $120 Canadian for. Full price games here in Canada are $80, so this is like paying for 1.5 games to get the game and a box of goodies, and that's typically the way that special editions by Nintendo published games go. And then there's Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. If you want some special set, Pay for two copies of the game at no discount for the bundle, and you'll get one small additional reward which will be completely different depending on what retailer you bought it from. If you actually want a collection of goodies like a special edition would get you, be prepared to buy even more copies of the game on top of the two you already have to get the various bonuses. Pokemon forces consumers to jump through countless hoops and shell out so much more money to even come close to the same quality and quantity of products being delivered by 
virtually any other Nintendo published game that has a special edition. It's such an outlier. Let's come back to that two versions and double pack idea for a hot sec. I won't spend too long on this since it's nothing exclusive to Scarlet and Violet, but continues to be a problem that plagues Pokemon. I do genuinely believe that when Pokemon first started, the multiple versions did exist to bring people together, trade for version exclusives. Pokemon rose so quickly as it was a handheld RPG of the time unlike any other, the freedom to set up your team of six however you like, and the ability to battle and trade with any other players with the same generation of games, something I've called Pokemon's magic in previous essays. Version exclusives would bring people together in a way no video game had done before, get people to trade what's uniquely available in their version of the game, and I think that's really special. But somewhere along the way, that vision shifted. Rather than bringing people together first and profit second, it became about profit first and only then bringing people together second. Pokemon stands will defend double packs having no discount over both individual games by making the assertion that you're not supposed to buy both versions, but we see this clearly contradicted any time that Pokemon offers exclusive rewards for owners of the double pack, which we see stronger than ever with Scarlet and Violet. Double packs weren't a thing in Pokemon for most of its history, they only started as of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire in November 2014, it only began within the last decade. We're no longer seeing multiple versions as a means to bring people together, but rather because the Pokemon company knows that there are those willing to buy both copies. So they continue to try and put more types of bait on their hook, to see if they can reel in more fish who decide they're willing to bite the line and buy both versions. So, rather than feeling like something I'm missing is pushing me to get out into the world to find the missing pieces, the Pokemon company dangles the missing pieces in front of me saying, It could be yours. We've got some exclusive offers you won't want to miss if you take the deal. I'm no longer supposed to seek the missing piece among my fellow players, as much as the company hopes that I'll just buy the missing piece. And with such a strong name as the highest grossing media IP, they figure it's feasible to sell the bundle with no discount. Exclusive offer! Get these rewards we're offering at the cheap price of basically one game for the price of two. I made this joke during the BDSP essay, and I'll do it again. Pokemon has just straight up become the Magikarp salesman. I normally charge $100, but for you, I'll throw in an egg laying set, childcare set, and an education set for only $300. How about it? <laughs> I'll take it! I can tell. <laughs> You're going to be a very rich man. A very rich man! <laughs> Let's face it, open world games are cool. It can be immensely satisfying doing things in whatever order, and finding your own solutions to things rather than going the exact way the developers expect you to or else you get punished. There have been several pushes for open world games in the industry before, and right now we're still in the lingering wave of Breath of the Wild. Yeah, Breath of the Wild was a fun game, but after playing games like that, a lot of people seem to adopt this mentality that open world is inherently better than linear. If you go open world, then you're naturally better than a linear counterpart, and this is the wrong way to view this. There's pros and cons to both stances, without either one necessarily being better than the other. Linearity is still pretty default, because things typically happen in a linear order. You get X ability, it allows you to do Y thing. Now you can get past this bit and into the next area, but now there's another challenge to overcome, and you rinse and repeat. Or take a story for example. Stories are, by nature, linear. You can't open a book, flip to a random page to read, and then flip to another random page to read and have it make sense. A story is linear. First thing A happens, then B, then C. A lot of open world games will need to sacrifice something if they want to pursue open world. In Breath of the Wild, for example, the thing it had to sacrifice was story. The story that you experience within that game is you wake up, go mess up Ganon, and free some Divine Beasts and Champion Spirits if you want. It had almost no story in the events of the game itself, instead electing to have a story that already happened 100 years ago. You don't experience a story while playing Breath of the Wild, you just hear about a story that already happened. Rather than surpassing challenges to unlock the next vital bit of story, having the story take place through the actions of the player, and having a story that can go through ups and downs by having scenes that are meant to hold more weight than others, you just kind of find memories around the world in whatever order, and all holding equal weight to each other. 
It results in such a disconnected feeling story that you never get to move forward, apart from defeating Ganon at the very end. So while the story of Breath of the Wild had a lot of really cool things going for it, like Zelda's character arc, Breath of the Wild itself wasn't capable of really delving into this story by nature of it being open world, which is why I'm glad the linear game Age of Calamity exists as the Breath of the Wild prequel, as it dove into this story properly. Finally, I got to experience that story I only heard about in the other video game. The Zelda series is well known for the stories it tells, not because they're top-of-the-line masterpieces or anything, but they are consistently good and feature characters for players to really connect with. Breath of the Wild was a fun game, but this is what it had to sacrifice for the sake of open world. Despite this, it's one of those games that everyone just kind of looked at like, Masterpiece 10 out of 10! Because the video game was so dang fun that it means that all aspects of it must be perfect and there was no sacrifice here. And ever since, there's been the current push of open world games that Breath of the Wild fueled, because so many people are like, this game is proof that open world good, linearity bad. It's because of open world becoming the trending thing after Breath of the Wild that I feel Pokemon pursued open world, not because it was the natural next step for Pokemon. The label of Pokemon is going to sell a lot of units, and the label of open world is going to sell a lot of units, and with their two powers combined, well, this was my local GameStop when the game released at midnight. There's pros and cons to both open world and linearity but the harder approach of open world is usually going to need a sacrifice. So, what did Pokemon sacrifice? Was it story like Breath of the Wild? Because we all know Pokemon's famous for the stories it tells. Nope, what Pokemon sacrificed for the sake of open world gameplay was gameplay. Alright, let me explain. Pokemon is a naturally linear system. You begin with a starter Pokemon, go to the first area, take on those wild Pokemon and trainers, level up. Move on to the next area, take on those wild Pokemon and trainers who are a little tougher, level up, move on to the next area that's a little harder, so on. This is a linear system, being applied onto an open system. Returning to Breath of the Wild, this game took away the linearity of Zelda by giving you all your main powers at the beginning. You can take on any shrine, dungeon, or boss at virtually whatever point. Maybe some players will have the skill to overcome this challenge at this point. Others might have to come back later once they're stronger, and that's alright. Your skill and equipment grows throughout the adventure, but I'd argue the biggest deciding factor on what you can clear at any given time in that game is skill, and it can feel nice to clear something at low power. Pokemon, however, I'd argue is decided by your team and level first, and only skill second, and that in and of itself is perfectly fine, it's just the type of game Pokemon is as a turn-based RPG. But it's not the kind of gameplay that naturally applies to an open-world system like an action-adventure game such as Breath of the Wild can. You can still push yourself by taking on things early, but you can't just take on anything in whatever order and still be able to win like you'd be able to in a more skill-based game. So there's not as much point to it as there would be in a series like Zelda. Or let's look at another open-world action-adventure game from the same year as Scarlet and Violet, Elden Ring. The Soulsborne titles take pride in the challenge they can offer players, and you might need to grind out some battle many times before you could finally overcome a particular boss. But you're driven to try try again, because you know it's possible. There's all kinds of things you can do and mechanics you can employ to make the game easier or harder on yourself, but no matter what, it's always possible. Whether you're fighting the boss with a Destructo Beam, Senator Armstrong and his Nano Machine son, or even just your bare fists. In a turn-based RPG like Pokemon, if you take on a foe ludicrously stronger than you, yeah, there's a good chance it might just be impossible, incentivizing you to not try until you overcome it, but rather to give up, leave, and come back another time. In turn, the open approach of Pokemon also leads to the possibility of ruining the gameplay experience by making it too easy. Let me draw my Pokemon Brilliant Diamond playthrough. It's no secret I was getting pretty darn bored of playing that copy-pasted game, and the Force EXP share and friendship mechanic meant that I could win by turning my brain off. I wanted some challenge, so by utilizing how shoddily made that game is, I sequence broke to the final gym, skipping a handful of gyms and story events in the process. I was a bit underleveled in Sunny Shore, I actually had to try, but with enough effort was just narrowly able to defeat Faulkner, and it was the most fun I had in the entire playthrough. To rephrase, by treating a linear Pokemon game like it was open world, I had the most fun in my whole playthrough. So what's the problem here? The problem is everything that followed. 
I did have to go back to do those gyms and story events I skipped, and now I was even more horrendously overleveled for them. So the game became even more easy and boring than it was pre-sequence break. I had a more fun experience in the now, at the sacrifice of future enjoyment. So a truly open world game would need to introduce level scaling, have your foes continue to be close to your level, or augment the strength of key story battles based around how many story events you've completed total. So naturally, for the sake of its gameplay, Scarlet and Violet would need to implement this, and of course, they didn't. This means that the gameplay ruining experience I had in BDSP that was the result of me using a glitch? Yeah, that's just straight up how the gameplay of Scarlet and Violet works. They put a linear progression system into an open world game, without changing anything about that linear progression system and just called it a day. Except, it's even worse than in the BDSP example. You see, in a linear Pokemon game, there's a clear order to your badges. It goes left to right. That's the order of weakest to strongest. So even if you do it out of order like I did, you know what you're getting into. In Scarlet and Violet, however, there's zero indication what the given strength of each of these challenges are. The text description hints at these two being the first gyms, but apart from that, just take a guess. So what is it then? The further away from the main city, the harder things are? Well, not quite. This is everything's level, so if you wanted to do them from weakest to strongest, your order would look like this. It's all over the place. People have been complaining for a long time about how linear the regions themselves have been getting, as opposed to all twisty turny like you're really exploring, especially considering Sword and Shield had just one straight line looking region. So Scarlet and Violet delivers this open region you can explore, and if you're taking things in order, you'll be going all over the place. Except the game gives you no indication of what that order is. If you want to know what they are, you need to look up the levels of every gym, Titan Pokemon and Team Star Leader, map them out, number them in order of strength, or just look at the one I already made to show you. But the thing is, they're not meant to be done in a particular order. This is an open world game after all, you're supposed to find your own path. So most players are probably going to set out and create their own adventure, taking on whatever challenges are along the way, and getting actively punished for it when they inevitably end up doing things out of order, whether that be getting destroyed by some challenge, or absolutely destroying some challenge to the point that it's boring. One of my mods, for example, went to the Psychic Gym early on, after all, it's the next closest gym after the weakest one, only to get destroyed with no chance of victory, because like I said earlier, the gameplay system of Pokemon is one about teams and levels first, and skills second. Unlike other open world titles where even though it might be hard, you can in theory take on whatever challenge at whatever point. Which again, does not mean that this is a bad gameplay system, it's just how Pokemon works, but it doesn't naturally work in open world. And you could make the argument that it's more like the anime then, where maybe Ash loses some gym, and needs to get stronger and come back later. So maybe you return when you're stronger, and you can feel good about yourself now that you're able to conquer this one challenge that stood in your way. And if you feel that way, I completely get it. That could be an incredibly rewarding feeling. I just wish there was some kind of indication of rough strength for these challenges, or like a recommended level or something like that, because you typically don't want to be losing. Let's look at how Dark Souls 1 handles an open formula, for example. You begin in this small hub area, and there's several ways you can go from here without any guidance. How you tell which way you should go is essentially which way kills you the least. These skeletons shred me, probably shouldn't go that way. These spooky ghosts are nutty, yeah, I really don't want to go that way. These guys, well, they're manageable, I suppose I should go this way. There's nothing stopping you from going whatever other way you want if you have the skill to overcome that area, but the game implies to you the natural way to go and progress by handling difficulty in these various paths. In this way, while open, it carefully pushes you in the direction best fitting your current strength, and this is something we've seen in titles since then as well. Yeah. In Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, well, there's nothing ever really impeding your ability to get anywhere. Trainer battles are optional now, nobody forces you into a battle. You can talk to them if you'd like to battle. Wild Pokemon rarely stir up trouble for you. Some try to attack you, but very rarely. It's not like Legends Arceus. Most of them just kind of hang around doing nothing. So the threat of wild Pokemon attacks isn't really an incentive to leave this area and go elsewhere. The most often you'll unintentionally get into wild Pokemon battles is because you stepped on one that was too little to even see. Or it'll pop in right in front of you because of the horrendous popping of this game. Or maybe sometimes they'll even be inside things and surprise you. 
Though we'll delve more into the new random encounters in the gameplay section. If you accidentally get into a wild battle, it's usually for one of those reasons. Not because the Pokemon are actually attacking you and telling you you shouldn't be here yet like you'd see in open world action games. So, Pokemon aren't a risk, and trainers are optional. Well, should you still battle them to gauge risk and decide if this is an appropriate area for you to be in? Well, not really, because Pokemon gives you reason to avoid losing. Every Pokemon of yours that faints is going to lose friendship level, which you might actually need for some evolutions, and every battle you lose is going to lose you some money. Plus, fainted Pokemon don't gain experience, which means if you do manage to narrowly scrape by a victory, any Pokemon in your party that have fainted gain nothing from this. You've just lost some experience you would have otherwise gotten. You can't run from trainer battles, and with the levels of these areas being all over the place across the region, leaving it as a mystery what the rough strength of many given areas could be, why battle them and take the risk if you've explored into some unfamiliar territory? Because they might just turn out to be much higher level than you, and now you've lost friendship and funds. Like, this area might seem like it's pretty close to the beginning and should be pretty easy then, right? Nope, get pranked, turns out it's the psychic gym area and you're on the path leading to one of the strongest gyms in the game. Or take this tiny hill outside of the main hub town that leads up to the league. There's two trainers here. This kid with his level 14 Meowth, immediately followed by this guy with his level 56 Crocodile and two other Pokemon of similar level. A lot of the time, how tough you should expect your opponents to be feels like rolling the dice, and as such, I very rarely engage in trainer battles in my playthrough, as I figured, why risk losing funds and friendship? And besides, I could grind my levels easy with a busted auto battle mechanic we'll talk about more later, and then just come and get the battle winnings from these trainers when I was for sure strong enough to fight any of them. To be fair, you can check the level of the wild Pokemon, either target them with the janky targeting system I kept forgetting even existed to see their level, or enter a battle with them and hope that you can run. Gather this information and determine if you think you should be here or not, so it's not like it's a complete mystery. But I honestly felt more incentivized to just keep trekking onward, not battling anyone, just in case. I scouted out most of the region early on. Now, which gym was going to be the best one to take on from here? You'd either have to take a guess and try it out, hoping you don't get wrecked, look at the rough level of the Pokemon in the area and try to roughly base your guess off of that, or just look everyone's level up. Exploring without battling anyone and rushing from Pokemon Center to Pokemon Center is something the game rewards you for, as you unlock the ability to fly to any Pokemon Center you visited. So even if you don't think you're ready to take on some given area yet, you unlock the ability to fast travel there whenever you want. You can come back here for the story content whenever you feel ready, as well as the trainer battles you may have skipped to get winnings from them when you can for sure take them on. And now, you've permanently gained access to the Pokemon in that area and therefore you now have more team options. And while it holds true in other open world games as well that you can trek into higher level areas unlocking things like fast travel points early, the difference here is in the risk you incur. Sure, you could try to trek into unfamiliar territory, but you run the risk of being overpowered by the environment the game presents to you, which can really push you to see just how far you can take trekking down this side route early. It's a high risk, high reward situation that can create a fun gameplay experience to push yourself through. According to Masahiro Sakurai, Game Essence is the fun of managing risks and getting rewards, which helps to explain why exploring higher level areas early in other open world titles can feel so fun. You're incurring a greater risk and challenging yourself by being here, but reaping greater rewards. In Pokemon, however, the risk of exploring high level areas early doesn't exist, unless you choose to seek out the risk by engaging trainers and wild Pokemon in battles, both of which are optional for the most part. You can still reap the reward of unlocking new fast travel points and Pokemon to find around the world, but incur no risk by doing so, diminishing the game essence. Imagine for example in Breath of the Wild if some tower was surrounded by a Bokoblin camp, but the Bokoblins just told you, yeah, we'll just kinda be here if you want to fight, feel free to go get that tower if you want. You don't have to work for any fast travel point in the world. It was because of this immediate free reward, and lack of reward by continuing to explore the areas I'd already been to, like what am I gonna do, just check raid dens now, that I felt incentivized early to unlock as many fast travel points as I could, trekking across the region immediately after the first gym. Unlike a game like Breath of the Wild or Assassin's Creed Black Flag, where I'd feel more incentivized to take my time in each given area to reap what rewards it has to offer. No big reason to go out to those foreign areas quite yet, I could take it at a more relaxed pace. 
these other open-world examples would have greater reason to stick around and take my time here by offering myriad things to discover here, and have a greater game essence by exploring early by forcing the player to incur risk by doing so, aspects that Pokemon Scarlet and Violet sorely lacks. Pokemon is a series all about, well, Pokemon. So increasing the options I had for Pokemon and making a team I wanted to see, well, it couldn't but become an early priority for me, and I'm sure there's many players who feel the same. So I explored without battling anybody or any wild Pokemon, covering most of the region. Sure, it can feel kinda risky, knowing that all the Pokemon around you are much higher level, and you've seemingly got no way to match their level. Except, that's not true. There is a way to match their level pretty quickly. You see, you don't actually have to battle them to battle them. In Scarlet and Violet, you can send out a Pokemon to auto-battle with wild Pokemon. The battle ends in a couple seconds, and if you win, your whole party gets a serving of EXP since the permanent party-wide EXP share returns, albeit not as much experience as completing a battle manually though. Unlike regular battles though, there is zero risk of your Pokemon fainting. There's basically no downside here. If you'd lose, they just seem to lose about half their health, but live at 1 HP if it'd make them faint. Sure, you could argue there's a downside if you were planning on battling trainers, but if you're in an area you're super underleveled for, you wouldn't want to anyway. Or maybe it's risky just in case you do run into a wild Pokemon battle and they end up knocking you out, but again, you're usually not going to run into wild Pokemon accidentally outside of occasional unlucky circumstances, and even then you can probably just run. When it comes to this auto-battling system though, I found that I'd usually win if I had the type advantage, even if my level was far below the surrounding Pokemon. So while there was a lot of lower level stuff earlier I had ran past, I was here now, and I wanted to be able to hold my own in this area, since it's what I was currently exploring and invested in. So running around defeating all the ice types with my fire type and running to and fro the Pokemon Center and it was easy level gain 101. Now my strength can be passable for this area. I'm a lot safer, and feel even more incentivized to keep exploring, which in turn would make my future gameplay experience worse and worse since the things I missed earlier are just going to end up easier and easier. This is a positive feedback loop. It was exactly like my Sunny Shore sequence break in Brilliant Diamond. I wanted to have fun carving my own path, so I found myself in more difficult territory, and may have had some trouble finding my footing in this new territory at first, but eventually found it, and was able to overcome the challenge of this path I set myself on. And in doing so, yeah, I had fun. But as a consequence, the fun factor of everything that had been skipped was diminished. By playing open world, pursuing my own path, I could have the most fun in the here and now, but as a consequence would have even less fun in the future. And it's not just the leveling you get kinda screwed in by playing the open world game as an open world game. Let's look at Breath of the Wild again for example. You get almost all your traversal abilities by the time you've cleared the Great Plateau, the tutorial of the game. The only specific traversal ability you unlock later is Rivali's Gale from the Rito Dungeon. There's also having more stamina, that means you can climb longer, which is obtained as part of your overall shrine progress, which are just all over the world. More of these you do, the more hearts and stamina you get. But even so, with enough skill, you never actually need Rivali's Gale or more stamina. You can still get anywhere. In Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, the game is marketed as open world, and they say you can go and have your own adventure. Seek your treasure. There's three stories in this game and you can do them in any order you want. This is true, but the best gameplay experience is still doing them in roughly the order the developers expect. You see, all the traversal abilities are locked behind the Titan storyline. So if you wanted to do each of these stories on their own through to the end before starting the next, like I did starting with the gym challenge, then you're going to get punished by only having the bare basic traversal ability. Thank goodness this game is so poorly made that I could still get everywhere I needed to. Or, let's say you commit to the other stories rather than the gym challenge. Well, guess your ability to catch higher level Pokemon and have them obey you is just going to be non-existent. Good luck ever expanding your party! And before I get comments saying, you just played the game wrong, it's open world. There isn't supposed to be a wrong way to play, and yet there seemingly is here. What does that say about this supposedly open world game? Pokemon applied a linear system onto an open world without changing said linear system to better account for the open world. It's an open world game that actively punishes you for treating it like an open world game. Because while you can do events in any order, it's still, at its core, designed as a linear game. 
the developers still expect you to do things in some rough order. Pokemon is, at its core, a linear game. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to pretend it's something it's not, there's going to be consequences. The sacrifice for open world was the gameplay. The sacrifice for a better gameplay experience in the short term is a worse gameplay experience in the long term. Don't get me wrong, I do believe the system Pokemon's been copy-pasting for so long now has been getting stale, and I'd rather play something different like this than just the same old same old, but it does feel pretty crummy to play a lazy impersonation of an open world game, rather than the real deal. So what does this mean? That a linear gameplay system just cannot be applied into an open world formula? That by nature of having a leveling based gameplay system it's not possible to succeed in open world? Not so. We can actually find an excellent example of this in another Nintendo IP, Xenoblade Chronicles. Now, the main Xenoblade trilogy aren't truly open world. They're kinda like Legends Arceus where you progressingly unlock new areas as the story goes on. There may be all manner of quests you can optionally do in that area. There are some insanely tough foes around here you won't be able to tackle at this point. They're linear games with some open world aspects, you could say. But there was one Xenoblade Chronicles game outside of the main trilogy, one that was an actual open world game, and that was Xenoblade Chronicles X on the Wii U. Which, can I just say, as a 2015 Wii U game looked like this, while 2022 Scarlet and Violet looks like this. Once you've completed the tutorials, the world is open and you can go pretty much anywhere. You can run pretty fast in this game, and if you wanted to run from one side of the world to the other, either east-west or north-south, that's about half an hour of running. It was one of the largest worlds the Wii U ever saw, the only rivals coming to mind for me being Breath of the Wild and Assassin's Creed Black Flag. You could go almost anywhere right from the get-go, though unlike something like Scarlet and Violet, you're way more likely to get attacked by the wildlife and get bodied if you're trying to get to crazier areas early on. But if you're familiar with where certain enemies are, or just have the patience to find the routes, yeah, you can make it and establish the fast travel checkpoints in this game, the mining slash data probes, no problemo. Of course, traversal does become a lot easier later on, and even opens up the possibility of getting to the few areas you can't get to by foot. But anyway, the leveling system. Xenoblade Chronicles operates on levels for its real-time combat system, where you use arts that are on cooldown as you position yourself strategically around the enemy. So while Pokemon, I'd argue, is about team setup and levels first and only skills second, Xenoblade has these aspects a lot closer to each other. It's more so skill and game knowledge based than Pokemon is, but if you go up against a ridiculously strong foe, you're almost certainly not going to have any chance at victory. Similar to Pokemon and unlike an action game, there are going to be several encounters that are genuinely impossible to overcome. So how does this game handle its level progression? Rather than laying out its story across the world for you to do in any order, that aspect of this game remains linear. There's a set order you have to do them in, you must complete chapters 1 to 12 in sequential order. It's like the gym leaders of Scarlet and Violet, which do have a weakest to strongest, except rather than telling the player you should do them in whatever order you like with no indication of the weakest to strongest, Xenoblade Chronicles X forces you on the path of sequential difficulty. Affinity missions, on the other hand, can typically be done in whatever order, being side quests for your party members, though sometimes they'll be locked behind doing another mission first, having certain main story completion, having a certain bond with particular characters, or, most notably, being at a minimum level. You straight up can't accept these affinity missions if you're below the minimum level for it. I suppose it's the developer's way of ensuring that you can at least beat this mission after you accept it, after dumping like an hour into it and working towards the boss, instead of having to drop the mission and come back to it later and having to redo all of that. Story missions, however, have no level minimum, or a level minimum of one to be more specific. So is it a mystery how tough it's going to be? Is it like Scarlet and Violet where you just have to cross your fingers and hope you'll be strong enough? Not at all. This is a game about exploring its open world, and so each story mission has prerequisites to complete of various other missions or objectives in the world. It's impossible to accept the story chapter until these are completed, unlike Scarlet and Violet where you could just skip every single wild Pokemon and trainer battle on the way to the gym and just challenge them straight up. These prerequisite objectives give you a good idea of what difficulty to expect in the coming story mission. If you can't complete the prerequisites, well, you're not ready for the story mission, and you're not allowed to accept it anyway. If you completed the prerequisites, no problemo, well, the story mission shouldn't be too difficult then. If you only narrowly scraped by the prerequisites, yeah, you should probably get a bit stronger before the next story mission, as it might end up being a bit sketchy. 
In this way, despite being an open world level based game, the game primes you for what to expect going forward, so it never feels like a shock that any given story or affinity mission is as difficult as it ends up being. Even the regular missions around the world, they'll become available as you progress the story, so it's not like some NPC is ever going to give you a mission that's unimaginably difficult for your current level, and if you choose to accept missions from the terminal, you can have an idea of how difficult each is by its star ranking. Level based games are naturally linear, and Xenoblade Chronicles X strikes the balance of having an open world that still maintains enough of a linear progression system, so as to never feel like you're getting thrown into the deep end, unless you know it's what you want to pursue. Unlike Scarlet and Violet which applies its level based game into a fully open world formula without any changes to better account for it. Xenoblade Chronicles X also has a mechanic I'd like to mention called Overdrive, which seems pretty underwhelming for new players, but for experienced players who know how to use it well, it's the most busted mechanic in the whole series. Using Overdrive, your game knowledge has a much more drastic outcome on the foes you're able to conquer than in something like Pokemon. You can reliably push through story chapters you're underleveled for if you know how to make effective use of this mechanic. So, it's possible, but you have to play so much smarter. Challenging higher level gyms early in Pokemon, whether that be glitching BDSP or playing Scarlet and Violet the way it was made, yeah, it could be fun challenging something that it seemed like I wasn't prepared for, but that usually just came down to using the right type advantages, and making good use of priority moves. It's not like Xenoblade Chronicles X where I had to learn some ludicrously complicated mechanic. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, it keeps Pokemon beginner friendly, keeps it as a game that can appeal to all audiences and not just say diehard RPG fans that want to break a game in two. But as a consequence, it's not going to feel as rewarding to pull off doing something early. Doing things early in Xenoblade X is like, alright, I had to make use of a really complicated game mechanic to beat this super tough enemy in a hard fought battle. Now I have this equipment most players wouldn't be able to obtain at this point. Awesome. In Pokemon Scarlet and Violet though, if you beat some gym early, your reward is no different than having beaten an easier gym at this point. You get a gym badge, higher level Pokemon will now obey you. But unlike previous linear games where it's like, you got X specific badge, now Pokemon of Y level will obey you, since you could only get the badges in one order anyway, Scarlet and Violet have the level Pokemon obey you at based on how many gym badges you've collected. So if you really challenge yourself and beat the final gym leader, whose ace Pokemon is level 48, as your very first gym, congratulations, Pokemon of up to level 25 will now obey you. Whoa, this is worthless. The only thing it changes about your journey is the number it shows on your map screen that shows the order you complete story objectives in. It's an open world game that serves zero purpose in doing objectives early, apart from just the bragging rights of you having done it early. Other video games would have taken this opportunity to reinforce the game essence, offer high rewards for taking greater risk. But if you take greater risk in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet by taking on gyms early, your reward remains completely unchanged. Well, what about exploring around and gaining so much more strength than expected early on? In Xenoblade X, you can get much stronger earlier than expected by truly learning the game by delving into the tricky to master overdrive mechanic which also helps to promote the replayability of the game. In Scarlet and Violet, as mentioned earlier, if you want to get to a higher level early, just run to a higher level area and spam the busted auto battle feature. In Xenoblade X, managing to take down a much higher level foe is going to take some good game knowledge and effective use of overdrive, and your reward is some high level equipment you wouldn't be able to get otherwise, time to shred things even more. In Scarlet and Violet, managing to catch a much higher level Pokemon can involve some strategy, Maybe you can inflict it with a status condition and get its health down some. Though, you might not be able to do that at all if they're so much higher level than you that they can just one-shot you and you don't have any priority moves and can't paralyze it with static or something. But coming out on top here is going to come down more so to luck. You can diminish how lucky you need to be the more you're able to whittle it down, but it's still going to be luck for if it stays in the Pokeball. And if you're trying to catch much higher level Pokemon than you, why not just go around throwing the 5 times catch rate quick balls until you get lucky? Well, let's say you do it, you manage to catch a higher level Pokemon, what's the reward? Now you can use that Pokemon to break the game, right? Nope, the Pokemon's not going to listen to you until you have enough badges, a mechanic extended past only traded Pokemon ever since Sword and Shield with its wild area. You're better off boxing this thing until you make enough progress to where it listens to you. So your reward for doing this early 
is having your reward be basically unusable until you progress to the point that if you did the same thing now, it wouldn't even be doing it early anymore. So, what even is the point? If you wanted to stretch, you could argue you get crafting materials for TMs early and might be able to obtain certain moves earlier than expected, but even that's not much of a case considering additional TM recipes are behind progression of the Team Star plotline. So if you're defeating or catching a high level Pokemon early, you might not even be able to use the materials yet either, leaving its only potential use as selling the materials for in-game currency. It's also worth noting that Pokemon materials are based off of the evolution line, which means if you want to grind materials you'd get from a Raichu, you can get the same material from a Pikachu, so why wouldn't you just take the easier option? There is no purpose in taking on higher level Pokemon early. No risk and reward to balance. No game essence. Alright, well there's gotta be some perk to exploring around early, right? Well, let's look to another open world example. Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag from a decade ago, 2013. Like Xenoblade Chronicles X, this game handled its story linearly, so as the story progresses, you have progressively harder missions as you go on. But after you've gotten through the introduction of the story and acquired your ship, the seas are yours to explore. There's an island over there? Well, maybe I should explore it. It means I could get some more pirate booty. Find new animals to hunt to craft new equipment. Maybe there'll be a warehouse I can sneak in and infiltrate for materials to upgrade my ship and goods to sell. Perhaps there will be new sea shanties I can listen to while exploring the seas. If there's a settlement, maybe there will be some assassination contracts I can take, get into a bar fight, so on. There's some other ships out on the waters. Perhaps I should go plunder them. I could get more materials to upgrade my ship, use their ship to repair my own if its health is hurting, or maybe recruit some of them into my own crew. It might be a bit tricky taking on some higher level ships early, but their rewards are greater than the ships closer to my level, so perhaps it's worth a shot if I can play well enough to pull it off. Sometimes events will happen as you explore around, like a ship convoy transporting a great sum of money, which will be much harder to take down than a regular ship on its own, but offer a far greater reward. Or perhaps there will be an ongoing naval battle, perhaps if I get in there I can capitalize on the mayhem and plunder both sides. What's this? I can't actually upgrade my ship past this point? It's not locked behind story progression, is it? Nope, it's locked behind exploration. You can get schematics for the highest level of ship upgrades from enemy forts you infiltrate, or even by diving into underwater shipwrecks to plunder the untouched loot while avoiding the sharks in these dangerous waters. You'll never need any of these things to actually beat the game, but by exploring around and making your own adventure in this open world, you'll continue to get stronger, acquiring new abilities, decking out your ship, completion percentage, and potentially even get some spicy spicy perks if you get all the collectibles tied to specific rewards, like the bulletproof armor. It'll make the game easier, but never mind-numbingly so, especially for the ship battles. Assassin's Creed 4 and other open world games like it will give you countless things to do and rewards to earn around the world. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet on the other hand, to sum up this chapter, what kind of rewards do you get by exploring early? Um, basically nothing. You can unlock fly points to Pokemon centers to save some time later, which, as mentioned earlier, did really motivate me to explore a lot early on. But then what do I do once I've marked every Pokemon center? There's not much point in catching high level Pokemon early unless you've been committing to the gym challenge up to this point, since they won't listen to you. You could battle higher level Pokemon, but what's the point? Materials? You can get those from the previous evolutions easier anyway, and new TM recipes are locked behind Team Star progression. Experience? No point. Just use the busted auto battle instead. There's some random items around, which sometimes might be handy, but most of the time is going to be useless junk you'll forget you ever collected. There's no point fighting the trainers if they're much higher level than you, since losing means losing some affection and in-game currency, and even if you manage to narrowly squeak by a win, you'll probably have lost some Pokemon along the way, which means they're not getting experience from this battle, so you're not getting the full reward of victory here. While Terra Pokemon are probably going to be around the level of that area, so there's not much point in going after them early. Going around to Terra Den Pokemon could be worthwhile, but 99% of the time is going to be some weird crap you'd probably never use. And if you want higher tier raids, you'll need to complete the story first, so there's no point in trying to find those early. I guess you can get Gimagool coins by exploring around if you're trying to evolve Gimagool. That's pretty much it. This is an open world game with barely any point in exploring it. There's no meaningful reward to be gained by exploring around. And we all know this world is too ugly to warrant exploration being its own reward. 
getting to new towns means there could be some new customization options, I suppose. But as we'll talk about in a later chapter, the customization in this game is kind of lacking because you've always got to be wearing some variant of a rinky-dink school uniform, despite almost never being at the school. But there aren't really spicy different types of Pokeballs to buy since those are locked behind gym challenge progression. Not much reason to explore for the sake of finding new NPCs, it's not like this game offers you side quests to complete. There is technically one side quest of collecting all these swords for the new legendaries, but the game never really gives you this side quest, though you may pick up on the hint if you explore around enough. But considering you need all of them, and you'd otherwise have to scour the entire region looking for the few you're missing, let's face it, everyone just looked up the answer and hit up the locations like it was a chore to be completed rather than a fun side quest. It's just a repeat of the Spear Tomb side quest from Legends Arceus, only unlike Legends, this game gives you no hints about how many you have left. Great to see we continue to take steps backwards. There are technically some side quests at the Academy, but they're just at the Academy, you don't explore around the region to discover new side quests. This is an open world game without enough reason to explore the open world. So, solutions to fixing the open world. What about that level scaling? I don't think it would be too tall of an ask to the biggest media IP to design teams based around your current story progression. And trying out ideas like this are things that other content creators have already experimented with the idea of. Some people have a strong aversion to the idea of level scaling, because they're afraid that by implementing such a thing, it would take away the increased fun they're having by challenging themselves in the now. Some have complained that this contributes to a wonky difficulty curve. Taking on high level stuff early means that everything before it will be made significantly easier once you inevitably have to go back to it. And this difficulty curve has caused some people with tiny brains and dysfunctional genitalia to call for level scaling. Let me put this bluntly, if you support level scaling, I am putting you on a list, the purpose of which I will not explain. Level scaling is how you suck all the fun and dynamism out of a game. It's literally what Bethesda does. You are asking for a video game to do what Bethesda does. Do you hear yourself? Do you hear how ridiculous you sound right now? God, I could just slap you. Hmm, if only there were a way to consistently give the player a fun challenge in a level-based game without the only semblance of challenge coming from doing things out of order and therefore creating a worse gameplay experience later. Well, as it happens, there is such a magic solution. I know it's a concept pretty foreign to Pokemon players, so I'll try to explain it simply. It's a little something called difficulty modes. <laughs> Essentially, it's options that allow the player to augment the challenge closer to their most enjoyable level of difficulty. Therefore, if a player is averted to level scaling because they enjoy the challenge that comes with doing things out of order, why don't you create a difficulty setting that results in that same level of challenge for every main battle in a linear-based system? Let the player experience that challenge they seek throughout their playthrough, instead of only in a small handful of instances. An offshoot mechanic of difficulty modes that Scarlet and Violet could also benefit from is the bonus experience slash level down system employed by the Switch Xenoblade Chronicles titles. In Xenoblade, you can level down your characters, and all that EXP you just took away from them is now bonus experience assigned to that character that you can reapply to them at any time. So if you move Noah from level 90 to level 5, you can put him back to level 90, no problemo. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 also did an interesting thing with this where you could trade bonus experience for exclusive items. It's a mechanic that allows you to assign about as much extra challenge of battles as you want there to be. Which is great if you spent 3000 years doing side quests and leveling up, and now you're overleveled for the story, but you still want the story to be a challenge instead of a cakewalk. Which is probably why they made it impossible to use this mechanic until you've beaten the story in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Oh Xenoblade 3, you'll be getting your video essay in due time. Unlike Xenoblade though, you could always change out your team in Pokemon to one that's lower level, but you'd have to find the Pokemon you want, which are lower than or equal to the level you want them to be, grind them up to that point, potentially use some consumable TMs if you're into that, and only then can you attempt to face this foe with the level of challenge you want. It's too much of a hassle, unlike being able to just level down in a menu. As well, the biggest selling point of Pokemon is its Pokemon. You're meant to develop an attachment to your team, for a lot of players, they aren't so easily boxed and replaced with some random wild Pokemon you just caught 
because you wanted the challenge the game failed to deliver you. In my opinion, the inclusion of level scaling, difficulty modes, and leveling down would have let this game adapt to an open world format in a meaningful way, instead of just taking the laziest possible approach of taking a linear game and slapping it into a completely open world with no changes and just hoping for the best. As for meaningful exploration, give the player some sort of side quest they can complete around the world. Legends Arceus had them, so why not this game? Have meaningful collectibles to discover across the region. Have mini-games and side activities the player can participate in like the Pokeathlon. Have Pokemon be something you need to seek out, instead of just spawning in in numbers rivaling plagues of locusts everywhere you go. Just do what you need to do to make the world not empty and boring. I don't believe the Pokemon company truly believed open world was the way to go for Pokemon, because from my analysis here in my view, it's clearly not. At least not without major changes to both level-based progression and rewarding exploration. But the Pokemon Company still put out an open world game because it's become the trendy thing to do ever since Breath of the Wild. Have you ever heard of Snake's Revenge? It's a sequel to the first Metal Gear game made by Konami, before Kojima made his sequel, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. In Snake's Revenge, Snake's not actually getting revenge for anything. 1990s Konami just thought revenge was a cool buzzword that would sell units in the West. Open world is not something that works for Pokemon as is, but it was slapped in for this title because the number one buzzword to sell units today, aside from Pokemon, is open world. Like Konami with the word revenge, it's not in there because it's used in a meaningful way, but rather because the label itself sells units. Open world was applied here without taking the time to rethink how a level-based gameplay system might be better applied to an open world formula, or how you might best strike the balance between linearity and open progression. And because of that, I can genuinely say I believe Scarlet and Violet are the worst open world games I've ever played, just like Snake's Revenge is the worst revenge story I've ever heard. It's an open world game that's only selling point is that it's Pokemon, and in that way, even excluding all of the performance problems, I genuinely believe this game was dead on arrival. Because it wasn't meant to be a breathtaking new open world game introduced to the industry, it was meant to be the next Pokemon game for players to consume that they'd feel more inclined to buy because of the open world label. And hey, it worked! Over 10 million units in 3 days! The most successful Nintendo launch ever, and all these glowing reviews that are consistently saying the only downside here is the performance problems. The game itself is absolutely amazing. Not because it's an actual amazing open world video game, but because it's open world Pokemon. I'd argue being in love with the concept rather than the implementation. Falling into the same pitfall Pokemon has for years, putting it up on some pedestal because it took a step forward. How many steps is it going to take before we get a game that's genuinely praiseworthy? Discussing the open world was, in and of itself, a discussion on gameplay, but there was enough to say on it that it warranted its own chapter. So, the actual gameplay chapter will essentially be the everything else. So, where to begin? How about with a new gimmick, terrestrialization? Is it good? I would say, yes. In terms of gimmicks, Mega Evolution was pretty neato. Z-moves were neat, was nice how the special thing could be applied to any Pokemon instead of just select species, although some would still have something unique to them. It was only one move it would affect though, so it was basically like popping your super in a fighting game. Dynamax essentially combined the ideas of Mega Evolution and Z-moves, and turned it into three turns of you're big now, and it was... meh. Terrestrialization, however, brings a lot new to the table. A Pokemon becomes monotype of that Terra-type. If it terrestrializes into a type it doesn't normally have, then it gets the stab bonus of this new type, while still retaining the stab bonuses of its other types, meaning it gets to use those types offensively without the defensive drawback of what those types could be weak to. So, for example, you could use a Giratina with the Terra type of Electric, which leaves this legendary with no weaknesses due to Levitate, even if it never uses an Electric type move. If you terrestrialize into a type you already have on the other hand, then you get a boost to your stab damage. And this gives some interesting strategic freedom. For example, in the Ghost Gym, I terrestrialized my fighting ghost Pokemon to pure fighting, which meant I could still hit my enemy ghosts with stab ghost type moves that they were weak to, 
but they couldn't strike my ghost-type weakness back because I was pure fighting. Visually, I think terrestrializing is pretty silly, as we'll talk about in the chapter on visuals and aesthetics. But gameplay-wise, yeah, it's a pretty cool mechanic. And only being able to use it once per trip to the Pokemon Center strikes a nice balance between Mega Evolution and Dynamaxing. Mega Evolution, you could do every battle, and it would get kinda annoying going through that animation every time. It would lose its charm due to overuse. Dynamax would be available too seldomly, only being available during gym battles for the most part, so you barely got to do anything with it. By having terrestrialization be once per visit to the Pokemon Center, Scarlet and Violet finds a nice middle ground here. You can pop it anywhere out in the world, but it might put you in a bit of a tricky situation if you don't plan on getting to a Pokemon Center anytime soon. It's a shame you barely get to play around with the creativity of this mechanic much at all in the main game. Any random wild Pokemon you catch will just terrestrialize to their primary type. There's no variety in the generic wild Pokemon. There are some wild Terra Pokemon, but it's not some randomly generated thing where each player's experience and what they find will be different. Nope, it's just a handful of hard-coded Terra Pokemon that will always be in the same location, and have the same unique Terra type. And they also have a chance of having their hidden ability, so that's cool. But it made me wish that there was more of them out in the world. Oh, never mind, who knows what the heck that was. Guess we'll never know! Raid Pokemon, on the other hand, are pretty random, so that's good, right? Well, sort of. If you're going to a particular area of the world for specific Pokemon, and while Pokemon could have spicy Terra types, well then, you'd for sure be able to find the Pokemon you're looking for, and it may have an interesting Terra type. Raid Dens are the inverse of this. You know ahead of time what Terra type it's going to be, but what Pokemon it is, you'll only find when you interact with a den and only if you can discern what the silhouette is. So you'll only find out whether it's a Pokemon you'd like or not when you get there, or potentially only even when you battle it if you couldn't tell what Pokemon that was. You can change the Terra type of Pokemon you've already caught using Terra Shards, 50 shards of the corresponding type, when you only get a few from raids 3 stars and up. 5 star raids will apparently give around 4 to 6 shards according to Eurogamer. I didn't have the motivation to grind my Pokemon to the strength they'd be able to take on 5 star raids themselves. And from what I can tell searching around online, it doesn't seem like 6 star raids give all that much more in the way of Terra Shards either. Let's say a 5 or 6 star raid cycle takes about 10 minutes. So that's including the time of actually finding a 5 or 6 star Terra raid den, and it actually being a type of Pokemon you want. And let's say these raids give on average 5 Terra Shards. You then need to do a 5 or 6 star raid about 10 times, or about an hour 20 minutes. And if we're going to be realistic here, you might not always be able to find a high level raid den of the same type of terror shards you're trying to get, and you might need to do either lower level raids, or do raids of other types to get the dens to switch to another type. With fingers crossed that you get what I would presume is a 1 in 18 chance of rolling the exact type that you're looking for, and it hopefully being a raid you can get a lot of terror shards in. So if you want to change the terror type of one of your Pokemon, this is probably going to end up taking several hours and pretty much just in the post game as well to unlock the higher level raids, and actually having the strength to be able to take on these higher level raids. This means if you want to use this mechanic in your own unique way, find your own solutions like open world games are often all about. You need to grind. A lot. It seems really strange to me for them to implement an actually really cool mechanic, but then lock the coolest part about it, creating your own Pokemon Terra combinations and strategies, behind an ungodly amount of grinding. How about the three story paths themselves? Let's start with the Gym Challenge, which adopts a style like Sun and Moon and Sword and Shield, where there's typically some minigame or objective you need to complete first. So, let's go through them. The Bug Gym has an obstacle course you're meant to push this massive olive through. It's got some trainers blocking some routes, who I would presume you battle, but wouldn't know because the fences are actually incapable of achieving their intended purpose and you can just push the olive over it. It's a joke, runs really poorly, is glitchy as heck, and it's crazy to imagine there are people assigned to implementing this olive pushing mechanic solely for this minigame that doesn't even work. Finding Ten Sun Flora could have been interesting, but they're not even all that creatively hidden. They even put three right in front of the starting point of the minigame for some reason. Maybe they felt inspired by this meme. The minigame of finding Clavel in the shot could have been interesting, but I typically saw him immediately at the beginning of any given shot. They did try to spice it up a bit by putting him in Nurse Joy's spot, and then on that random boat, but he's so bright orange and distinct that it's kind of hard to miss him. 
I wonder if it's harder in violet. I don't think genuine mistakes would happen all that much with this minigame unless you need new glasses. But if you do guess wrong, then you need to battle one of INO simps who are super crazy about her. And who's that? Oh, it's Mr. MVP! Simp! And everything about INO putting you on her stream and the whole thing about her solely wanting to up her numbers, her having these super fans, and even fans that are willing to whip out their credit cards and drop their savings on her so she can read their name on stream. It felt like it was a self-aware joke making fun of these kinds of streamers in their communities. And I'm gonna be honest, it really cracked me up. And it's super funny because it's like the game was making fun of the very people in real life who adore Ayano and the whole culture around these types of influencers. So you know what? Honestly, love this sequence. And this is the perfect time to be like Ayano and say there's some button you can hit or whatever it is YouTubers say nowadays. Easy plug. Mr. Clean's weird uncle nobody talks about forgot his wallet before trekking across the desert to attend an auction. So, you gotta bring it to him. You can do that at whatever point, so you could literally do everything else possible in the story at that point, and deliver his wallet to him forever later, and he'll still be there. Of course, nobody's allowed to talk to him for some reason, so this guy battles you. I'm surprised this happened for this guy and not, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Then Kofu asks you as a small child to go auction for him in what pretends to be a minigame. There is no minigame here. You don't have a Wind Waker-like auction sequence where you can actually strategize a bit. Nope, just bid an additional 5 or 10k each time. And it'll end off with you paying either 50k or 45k of the 50k initially that Kofu gave you. This pretends to be a minigame, but all it is is some dialogue and some simple if statements. This is genuinely the kind of thing that I could have programmed in like 10 minutes. So to prove it, I did it. I programmed it in 10 minutes. <laughs> now, this is pseudocode. You wouldn't actually be able to run it. And also, this could be cleaned up a little bit more, but I kept it in this format to make it a little bit easier to understand. So let's go through it. How about? So we initially start out with this line where the guy's just like, Oh yeah, Hoenn's legendary Wakame Seaweed will start the bidding at 10k. And then you're going to get the player's choice between these three things, either 10k, 15k, or don't bid yet. So, if the player choice is 10k, then the guy is immediately like, I hear a bid for 10k, do I hear more? We're currently at 10k, and the first NPC will say 15, the second one will say 25. But if the player instead says 15, then once again the same line, but then the first guy is going to have to say 20, and then 25. So, by doing it this way, and then don't bid yet, can just be like 15 and then 25, which means that it's always going to end up at 25 here. So, as is mentioned in this comment here, we don't actually need a variable bid price in these lines, even because it'll always be set in stone. It's an illusion of choice. Your choices literally do not matter in any way whatsoever. So, it's at 25k, so it's like, alright, next we get the player choice here. Is it going to be 30k, or is it going to be 35k, or is it don't bid yet? So, same kind of deal. I said 30k when I was playing, which resulted in this guy saying, what a big spender, which I would presume means that if you do 35k would be the exact same thing, which means that if you say don't bid yet, that he must do something like this where he's the one that does 30k, so that no matter what, the second NPC can bump it up to 40k. So in fact, we could even clean this up a little bit this way by in fact taking this out of all of these if statements and just having this happen like right at the end like that. Like, it doesn't need to be in all of these. It just, it's always the same thing. It always happened the exact same way. So now it's at 40k. So we're at 40k. Do I hear more? So get the player's choice between the last two options, 45k or 50k. Does the player want to spend all of what Kofu gave them or do they want to hold on to 5k? So the player makes their choice. I hear a bid for that. And then the second NPC gives up. So it's like, sold, sold for, this should actually be player choice here. Apologies there because, uh, yeah, that can potentially be 45k or 50k. So, apologies, I screwed up my code there a little bit. And there, done. I programmed this entire minigame. <laughs> like, is this all it takes to get a job at Game Freak? Hey, Game Freak, where do I turn in my resume? Larry's doesn't make a whole lot of sense logically. You get a hint about what the secret dish to order is, and you have to battle other challengers who, if they lose, need to tell you their hint. So, if there isn't enough challengers for the day to put all the pieces together, are the, like, one to two people who showed up just screwed? What about the other side of the spectrum? What if there's a lot of people one day and there's duplicate hints, and the few with unique ones never lose? Or what if there's only one person per hint? Wouldn't there only be one person who's stronger than every other challenger, who would therefore never give out their own hint, so nobody can put all these pieces together if they're not the strongest? I bet you, realistically, this gym doesn't exactly get many people who successfully get the challenge, Larry. 
Well, unless everyone just randomly guesses until they get it right, as there's no downside to wrong guesses, and there's only 135 possibilities. Which, if there's no downside, really isn't that bad. A challenger could just go through them all. Realism aside, in gameplay, I actually thought this was pretty neat. Hints wouldn't give you an answer, but rather a hint is where to find the answers, hidden in interesting places. I liked it. Yeah, welcome to the Moist Meter. Today we're looking at the Ghost Gym with me, Moist Critical Sludge. In this challenge, you take on multiple trainer battles, while I cheer you on like a crypto bro cheering on the latest blockchain rug pull. This would normally be pretty boring, but it's able to stand out a bit more by being double battles to change things up a bit. Which, speaking of, what happened to double battles being something that you just generally find here and there across the entire game? This gym gets carried by the fact that the mechanic used here, double battles, had been completely stripped from existing anywhere else in the game. So, changing things up with double battles can be pretty fun, but just because it doesn't exist anywhere else in the game. And that, on the other hand, isn't all that great. But yeah, that's about it. See ya. Tulip's gym challenge is, uh... Is there a point in doing it multiple times? <laughs> Look at the people back there that are frozen, just like that. That's not how gravity works. <laughs> this is life now. I don't know. This is so silly. This is just straight up so silly. Like, what do I even say about this video game at this point? Who thought that mini games like this and the ice one were, like, gonna be good fun? Like, yes, we should ship it out there. Like, this is great. I'm sure the players are gonna love that. The ice gym features you riding your legendary down an insanely short slope, which controls just about as well as it looks like it does. Oh, it's pretty janky. I keep getting, like, kind of semi-stuck whenever I'm turning. Look how much my speed, like, drastically decreases any time I go to turn. What was that weird glowy thing where Bob there? I assume I have to get through all of these? Oh, maybe they- Whoa! Okay, there's all the shadows loading in. Maybe they purposefully did that so you can do the turns that you need to? Maybe, but you could just pull back on the stick, you think, right? Yeah. <laughs> this plays- about as well as it looks like it plays. I think that that's all I can say here. So, one of the gym challenges had something interesting going for it, and one added some unexpected charm I was able to enjoy. But most of them just felt like the most generic, poorly implemented, and bland minigames imaginable, if you can even call them that. It feels like how a bootleg Mario Party minigame would play. The gym leader battles themselves would get interesting in how they use terrestrialization, in that everybody except Larry would use a Pokemon that doesn't have the type of their gym, but terrestrializes into it, was an interesting schmix up. As for Team Star battles, well, first we need to take a look at Legends Arceus. That game implemented a throwing mechanic, so of course Game Freak was like, alright, we put a lot of work into programming this aiming and throwing mechanic, so naturally, we need to implement it into our new story activity in some way. After all, programming something new would take additional hours and resources, so we gotta recycle whatever we can, as we do. So, what are we going to do? Let's have you throw bombs at the noble Pokemon to calm them down. Because yes, having something thrown in your face is sure to calm anyone down. Game Freak loves recycling to save on resources, so what is it this time? In Scarlet and Violet, it's, we spent a lot of time programming this auto battle mechanic, so we're obligated to make it a main story activity in some way. And so, the Team Star battles were born. You have to interact with the front gate to trigger a raid. If you try to sneak in, the game will attempt to boot you out. And by that, I mean if you tread anywhere on the main raid path, it'll play you a message telling you to use the bell and trigger the raid, and teleport you back to the last valid position you were on. Of course, since the marked areas to trigger this event only seem to be the main path, you can actually explore a whole lot of the bases as long as you stick to the hills around the path rather than the path itself, and find that the base is emptier than I imagined the theater screens that premiered Battleship were. There's just nobody here. At all. Of course, the moment you trigger the raid, a whole army shows up. The top three Pokemon of your party can come out and auto-battle. You have 10 minutes to defeat 30 Team Star Pokemon, 
and you can heal up with Clive at the gate or the vending machines placed all around these field-like areas. Except normally you press R to send out a Pokemon and it'll auto-battle foes it encounters along the way. But here, the R button only seems to work when you're really close to an enemy Pokemon for some reason? And even then it doesn't always work. I'm not entirely sure if it's a cooldown or what exactly it is, but it just felt incredibly clunky. There's no challenge, the 10 minute time limit is a joke. There's no time penalty to using the machines, which would have been a smart way to implement a trade-off, like every time you heal it shaves off a minute. And there's no risk to you at all. Team Star is like, we're gonna go all out and defeat you! But if you don't do anything, neither do their Pokemon. They just kind of approach you and make noises, all while the Team Star grunts cheer on. But now we're overlapping into the visual and aesthetics chapter. Point is, there exists no risk to you here, when you're supposed to be executing this high-stakes raid on an enemy base. At least Legends Arceus, when it recycled mechanics, made something that was fun, even if it didn't make sense, and could get pretty spicy at times. Like that Arceus battle genuinely was really cool. But Scarlet and Violet, when it recycles its new mechanic, it just results in this mess of a minigame. And it's such a shame because the idea of bringing in your squad to go all out with a raid on the base of your foes, who in turn is sending a small army at you, that's such a cool idea. But the execution is just anything but that. Once you've defeated 30 Pokemon, you face the boss, who at the end will use the vehicle Pokemon amalgamation they're riding to attack you, which is always purely their respective type. That was kinda interesting, not anything too crazy, but I appreciate it being something different here. And then there's the Titan Pokemon battles. You fight a big Pokemon solo once, and then with Arvin once. Yeah, that, that's pretty much it. To trigger this, for the Crab, Dawnfan, and Worm, you just waltz up to it and trigger the event. Though, you have to run up to the Worm a couple times. The Dondozo, you need to interact with all the Tatsugiri on the island until you find the specific one that triggers the event. <laughs> and the Bombardier, you need to run up to while avoiding the boulders it infinitely drops. If one hits you, it teleports you back to the beginning, and this game seems to have a questionable understanding of what hitting you should be. Also, are you just made of steel or something? These rocks completely shatter. Worry not though, you're completely invincible whenever you're in any menu. So anytime a boulder comes close, just open the menu, or maybe even your camera and take a selfie. Because everyone knows people who take selfies are immune to all harm. Gameplay wise, the Titan Pokemon battles are just kind of Meh. I mean, maybe they're fun if you do them at a lower level. I wouldn't know because I handled the open world game as an open world game, and did my own order to things, only coming to these at a point that I'd sweep them, having committed to the gym challenge prior. So if these are fun and challenging, I wouldn't know. I got Pokemon open worlded. Koridon and Miraidon. You get your legendary right at the beginning of this game. Although it's only able to assume its battle form much later on. It's battle form just being it literally standing up. I've fallen! Koridon and Miraidon is your all-in-one traversal tools you unlock movement abilities for it. You can swim through waters, climb mountains, even glide around. Before you unlock the swimming ability proper, I found it very uncertain what depth of water the game would actually let you swim at. Of course, if you go in without your legendary and it's either not in your inventory or hasn't unlocked swimming yet, then the moment you get into knee-deep water, it'll tell you that you manage to scramble back out and teleport you to your last valid position. Or the beginning of the game for some reason. But yeah, haven't seen many performance issues. Are you sure we're playing the same game? <laughs> Are you sure? What? Wait, why am I here? Huh? Wait, whoa, 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 wait. Good to have you home. Pokemon, I look a bit weird. Well, huh? <laughs> The random pool of water just teleported me all the way back to the beginning of the game! <laughs> Gliding can be kind of fun, but it absolutely destroys the frame rate. This is something I normally save until the visuals chapter, but the game speed is tied to the frame rate, so anytime you use this basic game mechanic of jumping and or gliding, it just makes the game feel so slow. In games like Breath of the Wild, you can absolutely destroy the frame rate if you have a lot of game knowledge but doing so typically requires a lot of setup, and is usually going to involve some sort of duplication glitch to cause way more of X thing to be rendered than the developers would have ever intended. You need to work at it, play the game in ways never intended, prove yourself worthy of breaking the game in two. I'm 
still worthy. But if you want to destroy the frame rate of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, it's as easy as just pressing the B button. You can glide around the region, but you'll do so incredibly slowly. So as you traverse the region, you have a choice. Stay on the ground to run and go faster, but risk having to deal with the new random encounters, or glide and be safe from this annoyance, but move at a snail's pace because of how much the game lags. Hey, maybe this game does have some game essence after all. We're balancing risk and reward here. It also doesn't take very long of gliding before you suddenly start plummeting much quicker. We can't let the player have too much fun after all. The ride Pokemon is actually a pretty neat concept and could be fun at times, but it feels like the surface level of what could have been so much more. A glider that lets you continue to glide, jumping and gliding that doesn't destroy the frame rate, swimming with some decent speed. Like how cool would it be to ride your legendary like the Hasselhoff, instead of this lizard slowly paddling around? And it would make sense as well because you could just say that the wheels are spinning fast enough to propel you across the water. TMs are implemented in a new way in this game, once again being one use per move, but you can craft more. The materials for crafting TMs though comes from battling wild Pokemon and like, skinning them or something? The game never really delves into how exactly you get these materials. That means if you want a wide variety of TMs available to craft, you gotta grind. Take on wild Pokemon because who knows when you might need their pelt to teach your Pokemon a particular move. Or maybe you'll scroll through the available to craft TMs and see one you really like and see the materials you need. Guess you'll need to hunt down those mons to obtain that move once. But is it really worth it or necessary, or should you just attempt the battle you're preparing for without it? I do think it's an interesting idea getting crafting materials around the world, but it just feels off. Look at Legends Arceus, where you could craft Pokeballs, healing items, most of the basic items in the game, honestly. Crafting materials will be found all over the world at resource gathering spots for ore, apricorns, or even just littered about the place. The materials were plentiful if you continued to collect them throughout your travels, which was pretty annoying since you had to dismount and remount your ride Pokemon every time, but that's neither here nor there. There are plenty of games that will have a handful of resources available all around. Keep on collecting them throughout your travels, and chances are you'll be able to craft most of what you need as you go on. In Scarlet and Violet, all of the materials are species dependent. Rather than some TM needing, say, X amount of apricorns, or X amount of wood, or insert what other generic resource here, you'll need a few skins of this specific Pokemon line. It's not the kind of thing you'd have probably already been collecting during your adventure, like a game based around a small handful of more generic resources you can find all around. Chances are, if you want to craft this, you'll need to specifically go and seek that Pokemon, unless you've just been battling like every Pokemon you've seen. How I would have changed this is I would have based the material system around more generic and plentiful resources, based on something like type rather than species. I've long said that one of the biggest reasons I couldn't really get into Pokemon Go was its emphasis on catching the same species or evolution line over and over again to power it up. A problem only made worse as they continue to add more and more new Pokemon as it becomes more difficult to catch the same species repeatedly, as it becomes a much smaller percentage of the overall available pool. I've proposed, rather than catching a Chikorita and it giving three Chikorita candies, it instead giving three Grass-type candies, which can be used on any Grass-type. Or if you catch a Bulbasaur, it could give you two Grass candies and one Poison candy. This would help future-proof the game by no longer diminishing your ability to power up specific Pokemon, by instead letting you catch any species of a particular type to get candies that help you power up that type. What if Scarlet and Violet use a similar idea? I just fought a Wiglet, so I get three Water Shards. Or maybe I just fought a Wattrell, so now I get two Electric Shards and one Flying Shard. Want to craft a TM like Rain Dance? Well then, that could be ten Water Shards. How about Shadow Ball? Ten Ghost Shards, or whatever seems like an appropriate number. Plus, then these shards could be saved up and used to change the terror type of your Pokemon, which would also solve the issue of raid grinding to achieve the same purpose. This way, it would actually give me some incentive to fight wild Pokemon, especially if I have a goal in the back of my mind for the typing of moves I like to craft, or the terror types I may want to switch some of my Pokemon to. I need some water moves or a water terror type on my team? I suppose that means I should battle water type Pokemon as I travel around. This makes things simple, easy to understand. As is, I don't really have incentive to battle wild Pokemon, because what are the odds that that Pokemon will have the one specific material I need to craft some particular TM I'll want later down the line?
Or here's another counter proposition. Infinite use TMs, which in part would fix the problem of there not being enough reason to explore the region. Let's look at Generation 6 to 7 for a moment. In Generation 6, to Mega Evolve, you would need a Mega Stone. Some are given to you during the course of the story to ensure that you can Mega Evolve at all, such as with the Kanto starters, but most aren't so simple. You actually need to explore around and find these, as they're hidden all across the region. These feel meaningful to collect because once you have that Mega Stone, well, you've now unlocked the ability to Mega Evolve that Pokemon forever. It's permanently unlocked a new option for you. Let's say I found the Mega Ampharos site. Now I can Mega Evolve an Ampharos whenever I want. I never have to worry about fulfilling this objective ever again. I have this option forever. Generation 7 had its Z-Crystals, which allowed you to use a Z-Move of that type, or one that matches that particular species. Most of them are given to you by advancing the story, which gives greater incentive to surpass the trials and permanently unlock new Z-Moves. But many of them are out in the region to be discovered, giving you reason to explore and potentially find some of the Z-Crystals you may be missing. As was mentioned in the last chapter, there's really nothing out in the world to go out and discover past fast travel points. So why not infinite use TMs? It felt good in past games to find a new TM in a similar manner to finding a new Mega Stone or Z-Crystal, as you now know that option is unlocked forever. Collecting all the TMs, Mega Stones, Z-Crystals was a meaningful side activity because it continued to expand your options within your already existing team. Let's say I explored this cave in Scarlet and Violet, and I found the TM Solar Beam. Oh, great, I found a TM. Don't know if I'll ever use Solar Beam, but hey, now I always have the option. That's pretty neat. All of these single-use TMs scattered all over the place, it becomes a lot easier to tune out collecting them when you know they're consumables, and eventually I just kind of stopped noticing the TMs I was picking up. So, my solution to the TM situation would have been infinite use TMs to discover around the region and give incentive to explore around and discover these new moves. If the world wasn't empty and boring though, my solution would instead be materials based off of a Pokemon's type that allow you to craft TMs corresponding to that type. Or perhaps even combine these two systems. One of the drawbacks of having some finite amount of things you need to collect in the world that aren't marked on the map is when you're missing just the last few, and they could be anywhere across the region like Spiritomb Wisps or Legendary Stakes or whatever these are, and chances are you're probably going to have to look it up. So what if you could find permanent TMs around the world, but you also have the option to craft them for a lot of shards corresponding to that type? That way you can for sure get the last few you're missing, or some in particular that you might really want. Then if you actually find that one you crafted out in the world, it just gives you a handful of shards of that type, though much fewer than it costs to craft it. This system would combine the meaningfulness of exploring the world to unlock permanent new options, and having easy to understand material rewards for battling wild Pokemon. Alright, what about side activities you can engage with around the world? Let's list them off. Raids. Picnics. School. And that's... pretty much it? Let's just go through them in order here. Raids like Sword and Shield are pretty slow and can be cumbersome to get through at times. In this game, they try to speed it up by changing it to a real-time battle system where there's just a cooldown on your actions. Luckily, this means that you no longer have to sit around waiting for 3,000 years for somebody to finish making lunch before they input the move or whatever the heck takes everyone so long in that game. But unfortunately, it also means that if they take a long time to input their move, then you're essentially down a person while waiting, which digs into the time limit. Picnics can be a nice way to interact with all of your Pokémon, and right there in the world as well, rather than in some pocket dimension version of the world. These picnics also allow you to experience a realistic depiction of what it's like to make a sandwich in real life. My only complaint is that you can't do this with Nintendo Labo. Who cares about it being discontinued? I need to experience the feeling of making a sandwich! They somehow managed to capture all the intricacies and depth that comes with making a sandwich. Like when you accidentally miss the bread and your cheese gets sucked into the Shadow Realm. This whole minigame, it's dumb. In a fun way. I honestly think playing with others and haphazardly stacking ingredients is fun, because you all just get to laugh at how silly it is. It's avocado. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> no! I jumped the avocado. avocado. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you know what? We did a surprisingly good job. Uh. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> However, I feel like this is more of a minigame you play with somebody once for the novelty and silliness of it, 
and then probably never do it again. It's probably not going to be quite as funny on subsequent times. The results, however, can be pretty interesting, bestowing all kinds of boons, which can even include things like supposedly increasing the shine odds, although I've heard people apparently getting better luck by not making sandwiches. It's too bad the minigame itself is just this simple thing that feels like it'd be fun a couple of times purely for laughing how silly it is, and then never really be fun again. You can optionally attend the school you're forced to constantly wear the uniform for at all times. You've got all manner of subjects you can progress through, which comes down to answering multiple choice questions. There's no penalty for getting the questions wrong in class, the teacher will explain the correct answer if you do, but it is important to get them right on midterms and finals so you can pass the class. It's an interesting way to handle optional tutorials as well as world building, but is it actually a fun side activity? I don't really think I could say so. And that's pretty much it for side activities. Many Pokemon games would feature meaningful side activities like the Pokeathlon, contests, or other types of minigames. Even something super basic like the Battle Tower, which is basically a freebie at this point. Uh, wait, don't tell me. There's not even a Battle Tower in Scarlet and Violet? What happens for those who want to test out competitive teams and practice against AI? Well, get screwed, I guess. And people say Scarlet and Violet are supposedly one of the best generations for competitive players. The post-game of this game is essentially Spiritomb Wisps, but worse since there's no way to check how many you have so far, as far as I'm aware. Rebattle each of the gym leaders once against level 65 teams, and then take on the Academy Ace Tournament. You can't even rebattle the league in this game for some reason, but you can at least rebattle the tournament. So, I suppose since Game Freak figured that was the new way to grind experience, there wasn't any need to implement rebattling the league. Perhaps they elected not to include a post game battle mode to give more value to the DLC content. The post game of this game and available side activities are pretty non existent. This feels very much like a Pokemon game where, unless you're a shiny hunter, developing competitive teams, or trying to complete the Pokedex, once you're through the campaign, this game gets shelved. I don't think I've had interest in playing a mainline Pokemon game fall off harder after beating it than I did this game. I suppose it depends on what counts as post-game in Sword and Shield. The trainer movement in this game is back to the bare basics again. Legends Arceus had the throwing, crouching, rolling. It wasn't perfect, but it felt pretty smooth. There's no rolling in this game. Why would it be needed since wild Pokemon are never a threat to the trainer themselves? Throwing sort of exists. And crouching is back. But as far as I could tell, it served no purpose. When do you ever have to sneak up on some Pokemon where you can just barrel into it full speed with your Time Lizard? I never once used this mechanic in my playthrough to sneak up on a Pokemon. Maybe it would have been handy if the Pokemon behaved like wild animals in Breath of the Wild where they run away if they spot you. Which is really strange because they showed trailers that implied that you could crouch to sneak up on Pokemon, but in-game, there's no reason to do so because it's not like the Pokemon are going anywhere. Honestly, the only times I crouch in this game was when I tried to hit B to jump, only to crouch instead, since it's the jump button with your ride Pokemon, but crouch button with your trainer. Totally not confusing at all. That's the only time I would have ever crouched, unless you count that time my trainer crouch walked up to help Penny, because every day is leg day. When it comes to other inputs, the D-pad has something assigned to each of its buttons. Up is emoting, left is customization, right is notices, and down is the camera. Honestly, it's nice to have quick buttons for each of these things, though I'd often forget what was what, which wouldn't be a big deal if the customization screen didn't take forever to load. Just enough time to let it sink in, you screwed up, pressed the wrong button. It may have been handy to have a Legends Arceus style UI that tells you what's assigned to what, though extra items on the screen may be annoying if you already have them memorized. So what I would have done is have it on the screen by default, but have an option in the menu to disable it, though it's not too big of a deal. To add to the confusion, the map in this game is probably one of the most nonsensical ones I've ever seen in a video game. You see, you can zoom out to this level, but if you zoom out one more, you'll get the whole map of the region along with all the main story objectives, but only the initial ones. If you do all of the initial story objectives of one of the three paths, it doesn't actually show you where the new final objective is. You need to zoom in more for that. Pretty strange, but moving on. Let's say you're trying to find, say, Ayano's gym. So you zoom all the way out to here, hover over it, and then zoom back in. And you would think your cursor would still be over it, right? Well, that would be a logical conclusion, but this is not a logical game. 
Instead, your cursor teleports back to where it was before you zoomed out. And this is made worse by the fact that you can't place an objective marker from the max zoom out for some reason. You just have to figure out where your objective is from here, based off of roughly where it looked like it was from being max zoomed out. <laughs> no, I'm not going that way. Wait, I should read the description to see if it gives hints about- I can't pull up the description here. I- I need to zoom in to be able to see the description. That sucks. Where is she? I don't even know where she is anymore! She was over here, right? Look, she was right over here. Ah, yes, my favorite part of Breath of the Wild. When I zoom out the map to find something I want to do, can't place a marker on it, and then zoom in and have my cursor teleported back to wherever it was before I zoomed out. Game design! Believe it or not, it actually gets worse. While the closer levels of the map can be rotated around, this max zoom out level is always just this exact image which always has north at the top. So if you are looking for something with the map spun around in some weird way, zoom all the way out to find where it is, and then zoom back in and have to find it, well, good luck. To somehow make matters even worse, if you're hovering over an objective, the zoom out button just stops working anymore for some reason. I said if I zoom out... Come on! Apparently the zoom out button just doesn't work while hovering over that for some reason. It's not marked on the map here. Weird. Really? For some reason, it just completely disables your ability to zoom out. Is it over any objective? Or is it just that? It's when you're hovering over any objective. Your ability to zoom out just gets disabled for some reason. We also can't forget that it doesn't even pick up objective flags after you've completed that objective. I love how it still sets this as my destination even though I successfully reached it and did the objective there, but it leaves the flag there for some reason. You'd think a map would be a pretty difficult mechanic to mess up so royally, but hey, Game Freak is a small indie studio, we have to give them some slack. While on the map, you can press the X button to open the sub-menu of options. The first is... wait... map? Pressing that just brings you back to the map. Do you know what else brings you to the map from this screen? Pressing the B button. Why did they make a whole dedicated icon that visibly implies there's a whole important thing you can access, when you can just press B to go back to it? Well, probably because they wanted to make it look like there's more things to do here than there actually is. Well, that or Game Freak just loves giving you multiple ways to pick the exact same thing, since that's apparently something they do now for some reason. I mean, technically there's a difference. You can choose to press A or B based on which sound effect you prefer. The bottom icon is Profile, which seems like a strange place to put it. Why not put it in the regular menu? I guess they wanted this whole sub-menu on the map. I think it would have made a whole lot more sense just to have X for the Pokedex on the map. The Pokedex itself, I actually quite like it in this game. It's like each one is its own physical little book entry. It feels way more meaningful than just a name on a list. This probably should have been saved for the visuals chapter, but there's not a lot to mention about the Pokedex, so I'm just mentioning it here anyway. Visually, I think this might be my favorite Pokedex. I do kind of wish I knew what this was though. Like, it looks like physical entries, but am I filling files on a bookshelf at the academy? Is it just digital on my phone? Because every region used to have a distinctly designed Pokedex, a thing where you know all this data is going. But in this game, it's like, what is the actual thing? Where is this taking place? Honestly, if they would have established that, I could have seen this as a near-perfect Pokedex layout. I think it's really, really neat. The Pokedex also gives you rewards as you fill it up, which doesn't seem to be much, but it does feel neat. It's a nice touch at least. I actually didn't know this even existed though until I really delved into the Pokedex for the sake of this video, so by the time my playthrough had already been done for a while, and so I started getting reward after reward, and there didn't seem to be any way to skip through. And once I'm on a new page of rewards, I can't go back to previous pages to see what it was the game even gave me. I'm not gonna go through my inventory trying to figure out what number changed. Like, obviously I can see what I got in editing here, but under normal gameplay circumstances you'd never be able to go back and see what it is you got on previous pages, unless you look it up or hit that screenshot button sometime earlier. Why? Speaking of weirdness that has no reason for being the way it is, I originally had in my script that for whatever reason, 
Every time you reload the game, every item in your bag reacquires the icon that says you haven't seen it yet, meaning you need to briefly hover over each of them for it to go away, which was really annoying. But it seems like while writing this essay, this did actually end up getting patched. I did an extensive portion of this playthrough without the day one patch, mainly to find if the rumors were true that the Elite Four battle music was behind the patch. And while I did find that other details got patched in, this bag weirdness was not one of them because it was an issue I continued to have for a while even after getting the day one patch. Hey, at least it was eventually patched, but it's such a weird issue for the game to launch with. The multiplayer of this game, it's, well, a thing. You can join one another's worlds, and you can catch Pokemon, do raids, and have picnics. That's pretty much it. And in regards to picnics, only the hosts can have their full party come out. Other players can only have one of their Pokemon out at a time. Because, unfortunately, the Switch is just incapable of dealing with multiple entities at once. And while the host gets all the main picnic features, everybody else just gets this. There's really not much to do out in the world. Some gym activities continue to exist in the world, such as pushing around the olive, or finding the hidden sunflora, but you can't even do these together. If anybody pushes the olive, yeah, that's only happening on their local game, not anybody else's. Just in case you wanted to play olive pushing alone, together. Wait, <laughs> does it show it? Oh, it doesn't show it bouncing around on yours, does it? Wait, are we each playing our own individual olive game? Yes. Yes, I Why? see you running around and this is nothing. But on the stream, you're bouncing it around. <laughs> that's, that's so dumb. So they set this up out in the world for you to interact with it at any point and you can't even do it with other people? No, it's, it's separate. Wow, that... <laughs> we're off to a great start then. All right, so that was not somewhere fun. All right. So we gotta, <laughs> we gotta find another location. We have to find something else <laughs> okay, that's okay. fun. Sunflora finding. Yeah, that's local as well. So the Sunflora will just be invisible to any other players. And if you're interacting with Sunflora, it seems the other players are going to turn invisible, but not their shadows for some reason. Heck, if you engage in pretty much any main activity, you're going to turn invisible for them and they're going to turn invisible for you. There's really not a whole lot to do here. It doesn't take long after starting multiplayer that it feels like you dry up the list of things the game gives you to do to the point that it felt like we had to come up with our own game modes to be able to find fun here, such as playing hide and seek. Now, it's not like the multiplayer is just one big con by any means. The fact that you can actually join into the same world and truly be playing alongside each other, that in and of itself is huge. You can chat with somebody about Pokemon stuff as you're right there with each other, rather than playing locally and just guessing at what's going on for the other person from what they're saying. In my opinion, playing games with other people where you're each controlling characters on the screen is something naturally fun, and I do appreciate being able to do that within the region of this game, rather than just in specific game modes, or only being able to be whisked to the other person's pocket dimension. So the fact that the option is here is nice. Unfortunately, much like the world it takes place in, it's just too empty and bland. So much missed potential. And finally, the Pokémon themselves. Most of the stuff on them will be in the visuals and aesthetics chapter, but there's a few things to get through that apply to gameplay, such as interacting with Pokemon in the world. This game took the steps forward of Legends Arceus and threw them in the trash can, reverting back to Sword and Shield style where you run into a Pokemon and trigger a battle on the spot. Just this time with the ability for your Pokemon to walk with you without having to open your wallet again, and being able to auto battle along the way. This relates not just to interacting with Pokemon, but all the interesting and unique mechanics across the recent Switch titles, but I honestly feel like they don't include too much cool stuff in any given game as a means to help sell their other games. Whatever you think is happening in that show, it's not, because if we actually did the cool thing you're thinking we're doing, then we'd have nothing to tease for future releases. This gets people talking about it. Hey, you should try out Pokemon Legends Arceus. It actually lets you interact with the Pokemon in the world in all kinds of ways. Hey, you should try out Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. It's open world Pokemon where you ride a dragon. No one game is ever going to have all the cool things. And if that means they need to specifically implement worse systems than previous games, well, I guess that's exactly what they'll do. There's no more decisions and creativity in how you deal with these Pokemon. It's just engage in battle, whittle it down, throw a Pokeball. This reversion to the Sword and Shield style becomes really irksome when there's literally Pokemon everywhere. In Legends Arceus, it was always your choice whether to engage a Pokemon in battle, 
though they could still decide to attack your trainer. In Scarlet and Violet, if you make contact with a Pokemon, well, that's going to immediately start a battle whether you like it or not. Which brings us into the new random encounter system. Ever since moving to the Switch, Pokemon had done away with random encounters, unless your name is Bugs Diamond and shipped Pearly. But the thing is, Scarlet and Violet brings back random encounters, just not in the traditional way. You see, Pokemon are absolutely everywhere. Everywhere you go when you're not in a town. Everywhere you look, there's another Pokemon. Well, assuming where you look is within 10 feet away. This game can't really handle Pokemon that aren't immediately beside you all that well. Unless they're the Titan Pokemon, which always get rendered no matter where you are in the world for some reason. Something that we'll talk about during visuals is I had hoped to finally be able to play a Pokemon game where the Pokemon feel like they're naturally existing in their environment. But rather, and the thing that applies to gameplay, is they just spawn around you in such numbers that it's actually a challenge to avoid them if you're riding your legendary at running speed. And because of the drastic step back from Legends Arceus, anytime you touch one, you're going to immediately get sucked into a battle. These Pokemon are not naturally existing in their environment. They're forming an obstacle course wherever you go. This makes it really easy to find yourself in battles you don't expect to. Not super high level Pokemon who are going to punish you for being in a high level area early, no. More like that tiny bird that popped in right in front of you. That Shinx you didn't even see because you were looking elsewhere. So on, so forth. And it's not just that. Remember how we talked about how opening any menu makes you completely invincible? Because Pokemon have no collision in this game, this means you could find yourself in a really, really bad position for punishment of pausing the game if you had to go do something. I suppose if you actually want to pause the game, you're going to need to press the home button. Whoa! 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 Oh no! I tried to open the camera app, not the, uh, I didn't remember which was which. The moment I exit this menu, I'm fucked. <laughs> this collision issue also creates another problem when Pokemon are as insanely plentiful as they are in the world. When you start a battle, your trainer jumps to a position a little bit away, which can potentially be directly inside of another Pokemon. They really put no checks in for this jump to make sure there's no collision with any other Pokemon, something even I can program. In herein lie the sealed ruinous tablets. Is that where the Switch Pros are being kept? Is that where they're hiding them? Um, Wait, Lechalk is a Twitch emote now. Yep. Yep, there. Gosh darn you! This is, this is actually so infuriating. <laughs> You know, random encounters are gone, and people are like, Oh my goodness, I don't have to worry about randomly running- COME ON! <laughs> I don't have to worry about randomly running into Pokemon. But I'm just like, are you sure about that? Are you sure- Get me out of here! No! No! Out! Out, out, out! <laughs> no more! I almost ran into you. Oh my goodness. Though, even if you don't jump into a Pokemon, it's always possible that one may casually meander into you during the battle. That means that the moment your current battle is through, you're getting pulled straight into another, whether you like it or not. Oh, okay, so it's gonna be first three Pokemon I party. Do you mind, Scyther? Can you, like, not? Do you mind? Can you, like, not? Hey! Alright, challenge team, start using the first three Pokemon on your party. And look, he just, like, runs right into me. Man, I'm so glad that Pokemon are finally naturally existing in their environment, like they would in the, uh, like they would in the anime. I feel so immersed! My immersion is unreal! And let's not forget the last type of random encounter. Pokemon attacking you through the wall. For whatever reason, when Game Freak was deciding where Pokemon could spawn, they literally just said, every surface as long as it's not a city. They applied specific effects to other areas in the world, such as Team Star bases only attempting to teleport you out if you traverse over the main path. But Pokemon spawn areas? Nah, every surface. The problem with this is, there's typically a ledge of surface on the other side of walls. That in and of itself isn't a bad thing. It's pretty typical in game design. It's not like the player will ever see it, so who cares. But it becomes a problem when out of bounds is still a valid place for your Pokemon to spawn. Turn the corner and just see a Flamigo sticking his head out of a rock. Yeah, we named him Dwayne. If they're close enough to the walls separating in from out of bounds, they can attack you. This happened to me in a way that was visibly noticeable at least five times in my playthrough. 
Maybe more than that if you count there being like three Pokemon in this shot here. And one of these instances of which I only even noticed in editing. So I'm sure the real number is probably far more than that and I just didn't notice every time. So I can't say for certain how much this is actually happening, since it's not like I can get my camera back there. But according to footage by other creators who do dabble in Out of Bounds secrets, it seems to be a pretty normal occurrence. And yes, this can occur to shiny Pokemon as well. Pikachu! Clear the walls. If a shiny Pokemon spawns out of bounds, sucks to suck, you'll probably never even realize it's there. So yeah, random encounters make an unexpected return in four different and very wacky and very easily preventable ways. Now then, the shiny Pokemon proper. Like the last several generations of games, the odds of a Pokemon being shiny is 1 in 4096. This was pretty darn rare with the old random encounter system, but nowadays with titles like Legends and Scarlet and Violet, where you're constantly seeing so many Pokemon on the screen at once, your odds of finding a shiny are so much higher just due to how many chances you're getting to get a shiny, as opposed to one at a time. Some people have complained that this makes shinies too easy to get, rather than a super rare and special thing that rarely ever happens. Something that isn't going to happen on most playthroughs. Instead, nowadays it's just kinda like, yeah, that happens sometimes rarely. During both Legends and Scarlet and Violet, I got a full odd shiny just by playing through the game, and at Legends I got an insane ton of shinies with extra rerolls. Though I was never actually actively shiny hunting. It kinda tuned me out of the bewilderment I would get from encountering a shiny. So by the time that I caught my first shiny in Scarlet and Violet, my reaction was more one of, huh, I'm surprised it took this long honestly. So I do completely get where people are coming from in saying that the rarity of shinies being greatly diminished with recent titles can, in turn, serve to diminish how special they are. But at the same time, I can imagine as a shiny hunter putting in countless hours trying to find a particular shiny, I'm sure the odds remaining the same across games despite the much greater amount of Pokemon you're seeing at once is probably welcome, as it means less hours that need to be put in to get it, unless you prefer something rarer that takes a longer time to get at least. So I don't feel all that particularly strongly on this matter either way. However, something that is pretty messed up in my opinion, is that there's no longer any indicator a Pokemon is shiny apart from the difference in colors, which for some Pokemon is barely anything. Legends Arceus had a sound effect and a sparkle to signify there's a shiny nearby. Boop. So if you get up to dex level 10 for a Pokemon, you get one shiny reroll. If you get up to uh, Scarlet and Violet, just hope you see it and can identify it from the rest. Not exactly a big fan of this step back. One of the really cool new pushes in the modern gaming industry is that of accessible games, to allow anybody to get the full experience. Heck, innovation and accessibility is even a category at the Game Awards. Many games continue to take steps forward to make them more accessible. Scarlet and Violet, on the other hand, take steps back, making their games less accessible. The player is colorblind? Good luck ever spotting a shiny Pokemon without the sparkle and sound effect we had no reason to take away. The player is sensitive to flashing lights? Good luck playing a game this poorly made without getting sick. We'll talk more about that second point in visuals and aesthetics, but returning to shiny Pokemon, what reason would there be to remove this feature that allows anybody to easily identify shiny Pokemon, regardless of how different their shiny color is to their base color, and regardless of the player's physical capacity for detecting color? And as we previously mentioned, they can spawn in walls and be inaccessible. To expand on that now though, Pokemon can also despawn, which includes shinies. As that's our next destination, I'll try it. Everything's vanishing! And this is made worse by the fact that the hitboxes on Pokemon in this game are sometimes really awful, or just fully non-existent. This means you could be trying to engage one Pokemon in battle, and engage somebody else instead, which risks the shiny Pokemon despawning during that time. Of course, there's also the chance that you just won't be able to battle the shiny Pokemon at all. If you're a shiny hunter in Scarlet and Violet, first off, why? And secondly, my heart goes out to you. Even outside of shiny hunting, this is honestly pretty frustrating. Bye, have a great time. Legends Arceus wasn't exactly a stranger to unobtainable Pokemon due to the game not being able to function properly, but Scarlet and Violet really said, hold my beer. Before we wrap up with the available Pokemon and Pokedex, last few little notes on gameplay that didn't really fit anywhere in this chapter in a logical way. 
Sometimes the A button to pick up an item just won't work, which gets you to retread the same item multiple times until the button does what it's supposed to do. Of the wild Pokemon that despawn, wild Terra Pokemon seem to be some of the most frequent victims that get sucked into the Shadow Realm. The trick is you have to approach them relatively slowly. If you approach too fast, the game won't be able to load them in time and instead just gives up and despawns them, I guess. The random glowing spot items seem to be randomly generated for where they can spawn, which gets placed around similarly to the Pokemon in the sense that they can also spawn in inaccessible locations, such as loading zones, making it impossible to collect these items. I had thought you could do the League interview and then prepare for battle. Nope, the moment you enter that building you get locked in before the interview even starts. Unlike previous games where, until you enter the room for the first Elite Four battle, you knew you could go and prepare however you liked. You need 999 Gimmagool coins to evolve into the Cheese String guy, really? Traversal in this game can get pretty wonky. That stupid elevator, you'd think you'd be far enough away from it, and yet it always manages to find a way to suck you in. What is happening? <laughs> I hate this game. <laughs> it's just a black and screen. You know, it's so oh, there we go. Dude, uh. <laughs> Sometimes after evolution, I find that the game would immediately input the throw command, despite me having never pressed R, forcing me into an immediate battle. Is that everything? I think so, at least. But if there's anything I missed, I'll likely put it in the pinned comment. Now then, the available Pokemon. There are 400 Pokemon in the Paldea Pokedex. I continue to this day to see drastic misunderstandings about the way data sizes work. So, it seems it's time for basic math again. According to Nintendo's site, the game size of Scarlet and Violet is 7GB. The day one patch is about 1GB, so the actual game size on the cartridge is about 6GB, which also means that Scarlet and Violet must be on the 8GB Switch cartridges. Now, just for the sake of visualizing this, let's assume that all of Scarlet and Violet's data is Pokemon alone. Everything else about the game is an infinitely small data size. Obviously not the case, but let's assume it is. To make this math easier to visualize, let's convert 6 gigabytes to 6,000 megabytes, and then divide by 400 Pokemon, giving us 15 megabytes per Pokemon. Then we multiply 15 megabytes per Pokemon by 1,008 total Pokemon, and we get 15,120 megabytes, 15.12 gigabytes. So, even in the reality, where all the data on the cartridge was only Pokemon, which is obviously a drastic exaggeration and in reality would only be a small part of the game's data size, it would still only be 15 gigabytes, able to all fit on a Switch cartridge just one size up. If we were to give them the benefit of the doubt here, to be fair, ever since Legends Arceus release, they have actually been using, debatably, better Pokemon models rather than just the same ones they've been recycling for the past decade ever since X and Y. They're actually making new models this time around, or at least just retexturing the old ones I don't claim to know. But if that's the excuse we're going with here, then surely it would be possible to include at least all of the Legends Arceus Pokemon in Scarlet and Violet. This is the new style of model we're going with after all, so let's build up that library. The total amount of Pokemon in Legends Arceus that aren't in Scarlet and Violet is 154. So, if we add 154 to 400 for 554, and multiply 554 by 15 megabytes, we get 8310 megabytes, or 8.31 gigabytes. Now, I don't know the data sizes of individual things in this game, but I think it's more than a fair assumption to say that the everything but the Pokemon aspect is a fair bit larger than 300 megabytes. You know, maybe just a tad. This means that beyond a shadow of a doubt, Game Freak could have slapped in all the Pokemon used by Legends Arceus, without even needing to bump up the cartridge size, so virtually for free. What do I owe you? Nothing. It's for free. <gasps> free? Unfortunately, additional Pokemon at no additional cost and Game Freak don't really go hand in hand anymore ever since Sword and Shield. Why would they include all these Legends Pokemon when they can just use exclusive bonds as a means to sell more different games and more Pokemon Home subscriptions? And we see further evidence that's exactly what they intended to do, considering when choosing what Legends Arceus Pokemon use in Scarlet and Violet, they made sure to cherry pick out every single Pokemon that got a new form or evolution, and then not include that new form or evolution. Pokemon is a very social game after all, so this gets people talking. Whoa, you have a Stantler? Did you know there's actually an evolution for Stantler? Ah, but you can't get it in this game. 
It's from a game called Legends Arceus. Oh, you have a Zoroark? Did you know they added a new form for it in Legends Arceus? Yeah, it's a ghost and normal type. It's pretty cool. Pokemon games are no longer about how can we sell units of this one particular game, but rather, how can we sell units of this game and use its success as a means to continue selling units of our other games and services? And all they had to do was suddenly claim, all these Pokemon, yeah, it's a bit much to handle, no can do, sorry. And all these loyal fans that place their trust in them will anchor off of this idea. This can lead people to make drastic assumptions, because they assume that the initial anchored idea is true, and then base their decision making off of that. Duke took my glass. That's what you told us he did. Wow, look at that dress spin. Bertie, that's amazing, just, just. You handed Duke your own glass. Clear as crystal, right in front of our eyes, all of us. And then told a bald-faced fabrication. And it worked. If you get any one takeaway from my video essays on these games, it should be this. Don't be afraid to look into things if they seem fishy. I'm just some idiot with a calculator and was able to figure this out because I took the time to look into it. Don't let some idea get immediately anchored in your head because this company said so. A company that has a lot to gain if a lot of people buy into this idea, which evidently happened. And this is probably the most profitable case of anchoring I've ever seen in the gaming industry. That goes for me too, don't just take my word for it. Don't be afraid to double check yourself, and use that to make your own judgement call. But anyway, it's about time we talk about the story of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. The story of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet goes a little something like this. Once again, you are a fatherless kid who's going to get a starter Pokemon to set out on a journey. Would have been neat to see the basic premise change a bit, but I don't think that's happening anytime soon. You're going to get sent to school, of which the school director personally comes to give you the documents you need, in addition to the starter Pokemon. He also goes over to see another student, your neighbor, Nomona, who you go over to meet as well and choose your first Pokemon between Weed Cat, Spanish Ducklet, and The Thing. Nimona is the type of character who's always going to be super wholesome and friendly to you, and just wants to be your best friend, aka the thing we've done for the past several games now. I know some people really prefer the more mean rivals that you're supposed to dislike and be competitive with, but for me personally, I just want change, the things to set each of these stories apart. I don't mind a rival that wants to be your best friend. What I mind is the fact that this has happened over and over and over for so many games now. That general premise is getting stale and make me wish that I was experiencing something different here. Nimona does have some qualities to set her apart though. You see, she's already become a Pokemon champion by beating the league. It seems rather than becoming the new champion, you just become a champion of the region, which probably makes more sense anyway so more people can hold the title than just whoever's the penultimate strongest. And being an incredibly tough trainer, well, it sucks because there's nobody to challenge her, which is why she puts this expectation on your shoulders, a tiny child who looks like they just came out of preschool who as far as she's aware knows nothing about Pokemon before this point, considering they're only just now getting their first Pokemon. Yes, surely this will be the person to truly challenge her, rather than literally anybody else in the region who's probably more experienced and has more of a fighting shot. I'm not entirely sure why, but Nimona picks out you to be the one who's going to grow strong enough to challenge her. I honestly don't really think it makes a whole lot of sense. My personal direction here would have been to have Nimona doubt your abilities, but as the story goes on and you become stronger, she starts to wonder if maybe you are the one, and eventually you manage to prove yourself to her. This would give us something we haven't seen before, along with a drive to surpass your rival, as opposed to her deciding from the get-go that you're going to be the one to challenge her. So she decides to turn into your stalker, uh, I mean rival, to keep tabs on your adventure as you go and gauge your strength so she can anticipate when the day will be that you two will be able to have an all-out battle that truly challenges her, like a child inspecting gifts before Christmas trying to figure out what's inside them. And so, she takes a starter Pokemon as well, which apparently you can just do by request despite the fact that nobody else but us three in this region have a starter Pokemon. And she chooses the one you have an advantage against, another thing we've been doing for the past several games now. This applies more so to gameplay, but it was only a small note so we're just including it here. One of the great game design features of the rival choosing a Pokemon your starter was weak to, was it would condition you to adapt to overcome this obstacle. The game would never tell you, you better expand your team if you don't want to get destroyed. It would teach you. So you beat Nimona, and you set out towards the academy. 
On the way, you take notice of a peculiar Pokemon, one who apparently roars so loud that it collapses the cliff, or maybe startles you so you slip and fall off. Luckily, a standard issue smartphone in this world has more life-saving abilities than the literal god phone from Legends Arceus. So you want to help this Pokemon in trouble, and you remember that your mom made you a sandwich before you left, so you give it to the Pokemon, who seemingly instantly heals, and raises a lot of questions about what it was your mom laced that sandwich with. For the sake of convenience, and since I played Scarlet, we're just going to call this Pokemon Coridon from here. Coridon and you trek through the cave to make it back to mainland again, but in the middle of your walk through, you're ambushed by a gang of Houndour and a particularly mean Houndoom, who just so happens to be here so the sequence can happen even though Houndoom only appears on the opposite side of the region, but who's keeping track? Coridon thinks for a moment, but then decides to scoop up your limp, useless body to save you. So, you make it out of the cave, reunite with Nimona, and Coridon loses its ability to be bipedal. Here, you meet Arvin, who is apparently Coridon's trainer, who isn't happy to see Coridon here. He's apparently pretty confused about why it's out here, and in this form. This form literally just being it being on all fours, because its true form is when it's standing up. Coridon's apparently familiar with the lab, even though, as we'll discuss later, it would presumably have never been at this lab before. Arvin then wants to make sure you're worthy of commanding this legendary beast, and so, yes. naturally, challenges you with his level 5 Squovet. I suppose this underwhelming battle plays into Arvin's mentality here, because he just wants Coridon gone, and so he gives you Coridon's Pokeball. So you make it to Mesa Gosa, and make your way to the academy. Here, you meet Penny, who's being hounded by some Team Star grunts to join them because apparently they're supposed to fill recruitment quotas. As the story goes on, we find out that Team Star aren't actually evil, another repeat trope of the past three games now. But if that's the case, then why are they harassing people for recruitment quotas? Like, it's not evil per se, but trying to fill quotas of indoctrinating people into your group is pretty trashy behavior in my opinion. So you rush in to save Penny, and Amona introduces you to terrestrialization. You drive off the Team Star Grunts and make it to the Academy. You spend maybe a whole 10 minutes in what I presume is the framerate hell where all the terribly optimized games get sent after they die, before the director essentially tells the whole Academy, School? Yeah, we're just gonna send you into the world and you can figure it out yourself. Fuck off! Isn't that the complete opposite of going to school? Man, I wish I could run a school where all the students just went out to live their own lives, but I continue to profit off of this without any legal responsibility for what happens to them. You just get to kick back, do pretty much nothing, and make revenue almost for free. It's basically Wigglytuff skilled. Genuinely, why is this whole game so school-themed if the school just straight up tells you to screw off, go have a Pokemon adventure entirely separate from the school, except for the Team Star plotline referencing the school? So, you immediately dip from school and potentially never come there for class ever again until YouTube comments let you know it's actually a thing you can do if you're me. There are three people that want you to embark on different journeys. Your Stan wants you to pursue the gym challenge to become a champion like her. You're not my dad wants you to help him find mystical herbs around the region. Yeah, he specifically wants your help despite the fact that you're the one with the Pokemon that he was so desperate to get away from. And finally, Aiden Pierce wants you to take down Team Star. Let's go through these in that order. The gym challenge features you going around the region and defeating gym leaders. The gym leaders themselves don't serve any purpose in the plot apart from obstacles to overcome. They never come to play in a meaningful way later as we've seen in titles like Black and White. And as such, I found them to be quite forgettable. Well, unless we're talking about the people's champion, Larry. Nimona battles you a few times during your journey, and her level actually scales based off of how many badges you have. She's excited that you're getting stronger, and looking forward to when she can go all out. Eventually, you face the League, and this time they wanted to throw a curveball into the mix, which is… an interview. Could have been kinda interesting actually, but Rika just asks the most basic questions, but then asks you which gym leader gave you the most trouble, what type they were, and what city they were from. Something I'd imagine could trip up a lot of people due to how forgettable the gym leader and city names are. And what does this have to do with being a champion anyway? I don't get it. You battle through the Elite Four? and face the plastic Barbie doll looking top champion and cheerwoman of the Pokemon League, Gita. After defeating her, Nimona is ecstatic to hear you successfully became a champion, and immediately challenges you to a proper battle as equals, where she can truly go all out. So you'd think she'd use whatever team she had that made her champion in the first place, like that Paldean Tauros she uses in the intro, 
Nope, nowhere to be seen. Hi, She's everyone. using the team she got during this stalking adventure, including the starter that's weak to yours. I thought she just said she was going to be going all out, but who's keeping track, I guess. So, you defeat her, and she's super happy that you did it. Story complete. Arvin's Tale, The Path of Legends. He wants you collecting Herba Mystica. HMs. Clever use of words there. These herbs can only be found guarded by Titan Pokemon who really like to eat them and it makes them big. You trek around the region defeating Titan Pokemon, and Arvin cooks the herbs into a sandwich. I didn't think you traditionally cooked a sandwich per se, but I suppose this isn't a normal sandwich. Well, Mr. Funny Man, is this how you get your sick kicks? What? It's just an ordinary crabby- OH MY GOODNESS! Koridon wants some sandwich now, clearly battling addiction after whatever Herba Mystica your mother must have put in that first sandwich. Arvin isn't too big on the idea because he doesn't like Koridon, but eventually caves. Again, don't know why he specifically requested the help of the person he dumped Koridon off on if he's so disturbed by this Pokemon. Koridon munches the sandwich and gains new traversal abilities. Mmm, that is delicious. Finally, some good fucking- FUCKING raw! Arvin reveals his goal, to heal his Pokemon Mabostiff, who's been gravely injured and has been deteriorating for some time now, it seems. I know that Pokemon loves its convenience in plots, but this has to be a whole nother level of convenient I haven't seen in a story in a long time, maybe ever. Herba Mystica seems to have four completely different effects. One ingested by humans, no visible effects. One ingested by Koridon slash Miraidon, it grants new traversal abilities. One ingested by Mabostiff, it heals an otherwise fatal condition. One ingested by literally any other Pokemon, it makes them big. Funny how this miracle herb always seems to give the exact effect the story needs it to give, all of which are wildly different from one another. Throughout this process, Sada is monitoring you. Maybe there's some weird tracker in Koridon or something. So, Arvin eventually makes all the sandwiches, and Mabostiff is perfectly healed. Sada then tells you to come to the lab. You and Arvin go, and now she tells you to come to Area Zero, setting up the final plotline after the main three. Arvin wants to make sure you're ready, and so he battles you, with his Mabostiff that just recovered within the last half hour because that's a good idea. You defeat him, and he decides that to go to Area Zero, you're also going to need somebody good at battling, and somebody good at hacking even though all our hacker man ends up doing later is turning on some lights. And there's that plotline complete. Team Star is this group of troublemaking students who don't show up to class, and that's a problem. Wait, isn't that what we're doing? Not showing up to class at the school that specifically told all of its students to screw off and learn things themselves is such an egregious sin, we need to bring a stop to them. So our mysterious phone hacker, or not Sada, the other phone hacker in this plot, leads us along as we take on Team Star's bases. Hmm, I sure wonder who our hacker could be. In this effort, we're joined by Clive, a suave and hip fellow student. Team Star apparently has strict rules set, one of which is if the leader is defeated, then that's it for the base, I guess? The Team Star leaders feature distinct and memorable personalities like the one who made the cars, the one who taught the others to fight. Guzma's weird cousin who apparently made the rules. Nimble Ninja? I thought you said Thimble Ninja! And finally, these boots were made for walking. As you defeat them, you uncover backstory that Team Star never actually bullied anyone. Except for that one time they harassed Penny into joining them because they have recruitment quotas to meet. Which implies that they harass other people about that regularly, but we're just going to completely ignore that information from this point on because it counters the thing we're trying to say now. Team Star aren't bullies! You see, they were the outcasts who were being bullied, and in that, they found companionship in each other, and wanted to strike back against the bullies. They had the intention to scare the bullies, but the plan worked a bit too well, and the bullies skedaddled before they had the chance, and Team Star were blamed for the bullying of this other group. What is this, a school administration system? Oh, wait, that's exactly the argument this plot is making. What doesn't make sense is how all of this went down a year ago, apparently, and yet nobody at the school seems to have been aware of this because all the staff must have changed in the past year, and I guess there's no repeat students either. Let's just conveniently ignore the fact that Nimona and Arvin are both established to be students before the beginning of the game. After taking down all the leaders, Hackerman challenges you to a battle at the school. Clive meets you and reveals his true identity. He was Director Clavel all along, shocking everyone. No way! Okay, so I just realized... 
How the hell do you wear pants underneath shorts? That... That's not how clothes work. What is shocking is him revealing himself to be Hacker Man, who isn't who I was expecting, and I appreciated this curveball. Until he told you JK I'm not, actually. You face off against Clavel, who actually has the starter with an advantage against you, which is pretty cool. You then come to the school at night to face Hackerman, who's revealed to be Penny, shocking everyone. <gasps> what? No! No way! Penny reveals she's the founder of Team Star, although she never revealed her true identity to the rest of the team. She's asked them to disband before, but they didn't listen to her because it didn't follow the rules. So, she asks for you to end Team Star for good by defeating her, the founder, and asks Clavel to record it as proof. Even though she never revealed her identity to them, and that means anybody could claim to be the Team Star founder and get defeated. And to give the benefit of the doubt here, I suppose she could just send the video under her username they know her as. Also, she has more than enough strength to defeat the Team Star leaders herself, which begs the question of why she needed to ask you. But I'll give the benefit of the doubt again, and say that it wouldn't count if it turned out the Team Star founder defeated the others, and having the founder defeated by someone else means it's well and truly done. But what still doesn't make sense is if she needed somebody strong who wasn't her to take down Team Star, why wouldn't she just ask somebody established to be strong, rather than somebody who just got their starter Pokemon maybe an hour prior? Why wouldn't she ask Nimona, an actual champion, and somebody who's actually looking for challenging battles? Or why wouldn't she just battle Team Star herself and keep her anonymity, so it seems like someone not associated with Team Star took them down? Ah, uh, of course, because then the plot wouldn't be able to go the way that it needs to. You defeat Penny, and the Team Star leaders come together in support of one another and agree to disband Team Star and come back to school. Clavel approaches them and tells them that they may keep Team Star together as long as they now use it as a force for good, a support network for those suffering bullying and helping to prevent it from occurring. So, wait, they're so strict about their rules that if their founder and leader tells them to disband, they won't. But if the school director tells them it's okay to stay together, they will? Let me just append something to the Team Star rules here. So, the Team Star plotline is concluded, and we have our team together to tackle Area Zero for the final tale. You meet Arvin at the entrance to Area Zero, and Amona's waiting for you guys here already. Arvin's confused about why the power is completely off, having forgotten his glasses at home and not noticing the myriad lights that are on all over the place. Penny displays her hacker skills by turning on some other lights, and then never uses her hacker skills again. And then the game gives us some foreshadowing. 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 So, the party decides to descend into Area Zero. Now, this is apparently a place that Coridon is so deathly afraid to be in that it won't come out of its Pokeball once you get there, but for whatever reason seems pretty happy to be gliding down into imminent doom with the party moments prior. And then the game gives us some foreshadowing. And then the game gives us some more foreshadowing. Effective foreshadowing in a story will give the viewer maybe one or two hints, often in a way where a lot of players might not even catch it. Some games will foreshadow strongly enough that all players are meant to catch this information, but aren't yet sure what to do with it. These characters look the exact same as two of our main heroes, but how? Who are they? And what does it mean? A really well-constructed story will even use its prior foreshadowing to further hint at the truth once it presents conflicting information if you caught the prior hints. Pokemon's foreshadowing, on the other hand, is just dumping blatant hint after blatant hint on you over and over and over again. Like, gee, I wonder if there's something up with the professor. <laughs> I'd sure be surprised if that turned out to be the case. It strips away the aspect of wonder and theory crafting about whether there's something fishy going on here, by instead just having the game constantly remind you, in case you didn't catch it the last five times in the last ten minutes, here's more foreshadowing. So you go around unlocking research stations to gain access to the lab at the bottom of Area Zero. As we explore around, assuming you don't get important parts of dialogue skipped as punishment for picking up an item. Ah, what? None of your business? Wait, what? What happened to the text? What? Why did they start getting mad at each other? 
They were just talking about how they were going to get out. And then all of a sudden, everyone's pissed at one another. We find out that Arvin is pretty upset spaghetti about having lived a bit of a solitary life without his parents, only having Mabba stiff around. As we make our way into the second lab, we have an unexpected encounter with my Jigglypuff from Smash 4. Truly a terrifying sight to behold. Turns out, they're ancient Pokemon of the past. Makes sense, my Smash Ultimate Jigglypuff isn't quite what it used to be. Asada tells you she's got a time machine down in the depths. It's what's summoning these ancient Pokemon. Traveling to the past, however, could only be a one-way trip. I'm sure they totally didn't include that little information drop so it won't come out of left field when they totally don't do it later, right? Arvin gives you the Scarlet Book that Sada wanted you to bring. In front of the research station, it's time for you and Arvin to battle as you face one of the Pokemon you previously face as a Titan. Turns out, it was an ancient Pokemon. Professor Sada seems to really like taking credit for things she never did, like entrusting Coridon to the player. Is this point of taking credit important to her character in any way? Not really, no. Unless you say that it establishes her as self-centered. She's the only one responsible for moving things forward, and doesn't acknowledge others around her of their accomplishments, but this is never really explored. Turns out, Coridon was the very first Pokemon retrieved from the past, but Sada was never able to bring over more than two, meaning there's a second one in the area. We make it to the depths of Area Zero, and there's something familiar to terrestrializing about the crystals here. Then, rather than showing you the story, the game continues to explain itself with text dump. They say in storytelling, show, don't tell. The example I used during my Scarlet and Violet playthrough was the first cutscene of Chapter 9 in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, which serves to establish the backstory of one of our main antagonists, Amalthus. Amalthus is quite devoted in his faith to the Architect, the god of this world who supposedly lives at the top of the world tree. He travels the land, gives speeches to the masses, and helps those in need, all while looking towards the world tree as if it is guiding his actions. It's the basis for why he is the way he is. One day, while traveling, he comes upon this house, the door wide open. There's the sounds of things being broken, and the sound of a baby crying. Someone has broken in to ransack the place, has presumably already killed the parents, and is about to kill the baby, but before he can, is stopped by Amalthus. Amalthus doesn't immediately take him down, choosing instead to stop him and see who he is first, which turns out to be the same person he was giving care for just earlier. While previously, Amalthus's eyes held that of compassion and care as these two looked at each other from equal level, this time, his eyes are looking down on this man, filled with disgust. Amalthus kills the man, retrieves the baby, and leaves the house. And after having just murdered someone, he once again looks to the world tree, to the architect, the figure he feels is guiding his actions. And then he speaks the only words of the entire cutscene. Oh, Architect. Is this the world that you intended? Amalthus is a villain who feels the Architect is guiding him towards the destruction of the world. That this world is a vile place that surely the Architect must want purged if he's to allow such atrocities to occur. And while some stories would say, that's it, believe us, this tale takes the time to establish the type of character Amalthus is, and what led him down this path with the most powerful scene of which only having one sentence being otherwise completely unspoken. This is never even known to the heroes. This is a scene shown only to the player to give them a better understanding of the characters in this story. How does Pokemon Scarlet and Violet give its exposition? Turns out that Sada was pretty absorbed into her research on the time machine, and so she wasn't really present in Arvin's life growing up, and Arvin blames Coridon for that. He projects these feelings onto Coridon like this Pokemon took his mother away from him. We never actually get to see anything along these lines. The only time we ever get cutscenes that take place before the events of the game is during the Team Star plotline, never during the main story. Instead, the game just takes all these parts of the plot the player doesn't know yet, and dumps them onto you all at the end through party dialogue as you explore Area Zero, which, as mentioned, you also risk not even getting to see all of if you dare pick up an item. It also turns out that Arvin's been here for a visit previously, and that's when Mabostiff got gravely wounded. These Pokemon out of time are dangerous territorial creatures. We need to bring a stop to the time machine before ancient Pokemon escape Area Zero and wreak havoc on the region. Now, this is where Pokemon Scarlet and Violet actually has a good example of showing rather than telling. 
While we never actually see the act of Mabostiff getting wounded, we can see Mabostiff wounded. We don't see the event itself, but we directly see the consequences of it. Ancient Pokemon are dangerous. Here's a key example to prove that. This would be good if it wasn't for the fact that... Objection! It contradicts the evidence! These Pokemon are supposedly so dangerous that we can't risk them escaping Area Zero. Well, one did escape Area Zero, and even became a huge Titan Pokemon by eating Herba Mystica. What do you suppose this Pokemon then did? Nothing. Huh? You heard me. Nothing. These ancient Pokemon are apparently such a drastic threat to the region. This would be a lot easier to believe if the ancient Pokemon that escaped and became a Titan Pokemon didn't just casually meander around the desert doing nothing at all. Heck, even the Generation 2 games established the Red Gyarados as something dangerous to the Lake of Rage area after being forced to evolve by Team Rocket. But this massive ancient beast in 2022 Scarlet and Violet does absolutely nothing. This also isn't the only incident of this. Remember when I said Pokemon rarely ever attack you in this game? Yeah, no ancient Pokemon ever attack you during regular gameplay. There's some scripted events, sure, but usually they all just wander around aimlessly like every other Pokemon in this game. If you want to convince the player of a particular point in the story, you need to actually be consistent, rather than just being like, oh, it's only this way in the one particular instance it needs to be, otherwise we're just not going to bother applying this rule here. Something this game seems to really like doing. As it turns out, there were two Coridon summoned, and the other one is still here in Area Zero. Not locked away in the lab or anything, but just free roaming around. This one is established to be the mean one that spooked our Coridon out of Area Zero in the first place. Not the mad scientist who whisked Coridon away from its home against its will, but this other summoned Coridon who just so happens to be a bully. Also, Coridon can seemingly leave with this gliding power if the intro is any indication. Don't know how it flew up like that with a gliding power, I guess using the power of Revali's Gale. So, if this one is so mean and these ancient Pokemon are such a threat, then wouldn't it leave Area Zero and cause some terror in Paldea? To give the benefit of the doubt here, you could say it's just territorial and claims this is its territory. But then why is it just mean to our Coridon and not a single other Pokemon in Area Zero? Is Coridon a threat to its alpha position here, even though it's shown no signs of wanting to wrest that position from the mean Coridon? You see how as you answer questions in this game, it just makes more and more questions. You get surrounded by ancient Pokemon in front of the lab, and your allies fight off the hordes while you enter to give you some one-on-one -on -one time with Sada. She explains that she's a robot, something nobody saw coming with all that foreshadowing. The original Sada is dead, but she was so absorbed in her work that she made a robot version of herself to continue her work even if she bit the dust. That's how invested she was in seeing her work through, seeing it as something much bigger than just herself. This is another instance of the writers writing things a certain way and then coming up with the simplest possible excuse because they really want to have the story go that way. The story wants the professor to actually be a robot because the original professor died? Let's just say the original professor died in an incident that destroyed research station number four. Like, what's the player's reaction supposed to be here? Was that the incident of research station four? And they've killed off the professor, but her death means nothing to the plot. It's just a lazy, convenient way to shoehorn in the robot that they wanted to write. That's not good writing. Though, I guess you could make the argument that it's an opportunity to shoehorn in the detail that the professor is actually a good person because she protected your Coridon, so that her being a good person at the end doesn't come out of left field. Make that now two bits of information we've dropped in the last 10 minutes so it doesn't feel out of place 20 minutes from now. But if she threw herself between the Coridons to save yours, what do you think happened next? Did it then teach the Pokémon the value of life? Clearly not, since the mean Coridon is still mean! If Sada died then and there, then what stopped the mean Coridon from killing the timid one back then? Or here? I guess the door opening is pretty neat. Fuck this shit, I'm out. Or here? I guess AI Sada called it back to its Pokeball. 
Well then, why didn't the first Sada do that if it's really that simple? Oh yeah, because the plot needed AI Sada, and because they wanted to show that she's actually a good person despite putting the entire region at risk. Do you see just how frustrating and nonsensical this plot is? She explains her reason for making the time machine to you. It's because she wants Pokemon of the past and present to all be able to live happily and merrily together. Uh, wait, that's it? I didn't misinterpret the story or anything? Nope, that's really it. Wow. That has to be about the worst possible motivation they could have come up with. You know they went extinct for a reason, right? Or in the case of Violet, you know they don't exist yet for a reason, right? You call yourself a scientist, someone who should understand the natural order of things, and yet you're willing to throw the environment into complete disarray because you have this disillusioned notion that everyone can live happily and merrily hand in hand across time. Taking, uh, taking creatures from a completely different time period in the planet's history to, like, the current environment, and it's not gonna end up all hunky-dory and all super great and stuff? Who could have possibly foreseen this? Plus, you ever think those Pokemon would be happier where they are in their natural environment anyway, instead of being forced from their homes into a completely different world? I mean, I guess it doesn't seem like they're putting up too much of a fuss about it, but that's just because of how lifeless every Pokemon in this world is. You're no well-written villain. You are... DUMB. And I don't mean it metaphorically, or rhetorically, or poetically, or theoretically, or in any other fancy way. I'm dumb. Straight. A Pokemon professor summoning Pokemon from a foreign time period into the present has all sorts of possibilities in terms of character motivations, but I'd like to dabble into two particular alternatives, each from other games released in the year of 2022. The first is the pursuit of knowledge by Odin in God of War Ragnarok, and the other is the embodiment of regret by N in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. If you don't want spoilers for either of these titles, skip to the timestamp on screen. Odin is blinded by his desire for knowledge, not able to stand the fear of the unknown, the uncertainty. Everyone's got me all wrong. You think war drives me or power, wealth? Nah, never have. You know what drives me? What I really want? I want answers. Same as you. See, mortals have it easy. When they push up against life's big questions, they can look to us to give them meaning, divine comfort. <laughs> We both know that's a sham, but when we have questions, why are we here to give meaning to mortals while living without it ourselves? No, and more than that, and I found something that proves it. What is it? It's what drives me. You feel it, don't you? Feels like knowledge. Truth. All truth. All the answers. We could find out why we're here, learn how to change our fates, stop Ragnarok for good, maybe? Save the people we love. He fills the villain role as someone who strives to pursue knowledge no matter the cost to any of the world around him. Were this applied to the Professor in Scarlet and Violet, you could just replace God with Scientist. People look to scientists for the answers. But when they don't have the answers, what then? Sure, everybody has their own ideas about the bigger picture, but nothing that's definitively proven. The truth remains shrouded in mystery and uncertainty, driving our professor to seek the answers in the future or the past. With the power of time theirs to control, they can find the answers, no matter the cost to the world around them. N is a character who's experienced failure and the loss of the one most important to him, over and over and over again. There is some happiness in the mix, but even that cannot last very long. It drives him mad, makes him feel his efforts are hopeless, that continuing to follow this path that ultimately ends in failure every time will only create more pain. There is no hope. And so, the villain gives him an out, to join him and persist in the endless now, allow the thing he treasures the most to last forever being his time with Mio. Of course, this comes with a steep price, requiring him to undo everything he's built up over countless lifetimes, truly abandon all his hope, fully give in to the endless now. By fulfilling this act, he ensures that he and the one he cares about the most will persist unchanged forever, 
Never again does he have to go through the pain of losing her. But even though he is content to simply continue to exist, she is not, and finds an out, in an attempt to tell him that it wasn't forever she wished for, but to make the most of what they had. This isn't how he interprets it, though. His conclusion instead being, But now, it's all gone. <laughs> if she truly is gone, I'll have to redo it all. Watch me rewind our clocks back to the start. <sighs> Noah, my long shadow, you have stolen her away from me. I will extinguish you and take her back. Mio is mine. She's not yours. She's mine. You are nothing. She belongs only to me. He is consumed by regret, and rather than having the strength to move forward, he would rather try to do everything in his power to undo what's already been done. This sounds almost like a villain motivation that would also work perfectly for, I don't know, a villain building a time machine? Have something happen that consumes the professor with regret. You only see one of the professors based on your game version, and they're both Arvin's parents. So, easy solution there, the other professor drank that gamer god bathwater from the last video essay and died. And now the current professor is consumed by regret, and is completely focused on solving the mysteries of time to undo what's already been done. To bend reality to her will and have the one most precious to her. Blinded to the consequences of her actions, and ignorant to the importance of making the most of now instead of staying trapped in the possibilities. These were just two possibilities from other games released in the same year as Scarlet and Violet, but honestly, there exists a lot of creative possibility to explore here. Unfortunately, they went with about the most bare-bones and nonsensical possible reason they could have given. It seems AI Sada changed her mind about pursuing the time machine. I guess character development that happened completely off-camera, like a Minecraft YouTuber just doing a little bit of mining. So she brings you to the time machine, and asks you to use the Scarlet Book to deactivate the time machine for good. But it seems the system will want to defend itself, and because she's a part of the system, that means that she'll end up attacking you. Something that makes no sense when you think about it for more than two seconds. Okay, so go upstairs. Like, what are you doing here then? Like, leave. Get out of here. If that's such a threat, then like, you know, you could have told me how this works, and then just get the hell out of here. Having seen the bond between you and your Pokemon, however, I believe you can prevail. So go upstairs! <laughs> Once you have ready yourself for this fight, please place the Scarlet Book upon the pedestal. Lock yourself in a room or something! And wait, weren't you saying that you shut down if you leave Area Zero because there's no, uh, because there's none of the special crystals? So just try to leave Area Zero. And then, you know, you can't do anything. And then I'll disable this. And then we'll pull you back in. Like, no problemo. But Logic and Pokemon games do not go hand in hand. That's a bit too much of an ask. So you start deactivating the time machine, things get all wibbly wobbly timey wimey, and AI Sada challenges you to battle, being at the top of the machine far above you like she's looking down on you. You are insignificant compared to her and her machine, something that'd make a whole lot more sense had she not had this off-camera change of heart. I guess you could say it's symbolic of old Sada who programmed this in such a way in the first place, but like, so? We never once meet her during the story and the part of her in AI Sada is all good and not evil now, so it really doesn't matter. She summons Pokemon from the past with the machine to fight you with that's actually hella cool. You defeat her, and as her last resort, she calls on that bully Karaidon who just listens to her every order for some reason. Her orders, having never included don't be a territorial dick to the other Karaidon, I guess. And oh no! Magic plot beam that disables all your Pokeballs from working except for Karaidon's. So you send out Karaidon, who, using the power of friendship and sandwich drugs, is finally able to stand up to bullying. Wait, wasn't that that other plotline? The day is won, except the machine will continue working as long as the key part of it, AI Sada, continues to exist here. We've now successfully shoehorned in these three bits of information within the last half an hour of gameplay. Do you know what that means? The Professor Sacrifice plot point is a go! 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 A well-constructed plot would have build-up be a vital part of the plot when it first comes up, 
which eventually leads to a payoff. Scarlet and Violet, on the other hand, just casually drops all of its buildup in the last half an hour before the payoff. Fun fact, time travel to the past is a one-way trip. I have no reason to tell you this right now apart from it not coming out of left field later. Oh, and by the way, the professor is actually a good person because she lost her life protecting your Coridon. Oh, and you'll never believe this. As long as AI Sada is here, the system will continue to exist. Sacrifice play. None of these things have anything to do with the plot apart from serving as an excuse for the sacrifice play at the end. It's just incredibly lazy writing. So she gives this whole song and dance about how the professor did all this messed up stuff, but deep down really was a good person, please believe us. The time machine is shut down for good, which means that there's no longer any risk of hostile paradox Pokemon to the Paldea region. Oh, except for those probably hundreds if not thousands presumably still in Area Zero who have been established to be capable of escaping the crater if given enough time, but we're just gonna completely ignore that so we can roll the credits and play Sheeran. Turns out, the real treasure was the friends we made along the way. We did it. Roll the Sheeran. All in all, the plot actually did have a lot of really interesting things going for it. A rival who's already champion who you need to rise to challenge. A lad with a motivation that I'm sure a lot of players can relate with to some degree. A journey that doesn't just spout out a generic bullying is bad, but instead doesn't shy away from taking a serious jab at the responsibility of school administration and one's peers to create a positive environment. A professor as the main antagonist who's unleashing a threat out of time upon the region because of their own selfish desires. I have no doubt in my mind this could have been the best mainline Pokemon plot in the whole series. Unfortunately, it's just handled so clumsily, feels like it suffers from being slapped together too quickly. It feels like a paper you only started working on on the day before it's due, and it's got more holes than Swiss cheese. Hey dad, you were supposed to buy Swiss cheese. Much like the game that it exists in, the plot doesn't really have much in the capacity to be explored, and feels like it was slapped together too quickly. They got the basic points, but then never went any deeper with it. Which is why I'd like to propose my own story rewrite, where the general characters and key points remain the same, but the details are changed. This is how I would have changed the story of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, and feel free to let me know what you think of my version in the comments below. I'll be telling my story in the order of occurrence of events. There are creative ways these could be told during the course of the game, but we're not going to delve into that, just what happens and why. As for who the professor is and what time period they're delving into, we'll just go with the Scarlet version for this story, but it could easily be switcherooed. Here's my proposed story rewrite for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Professor Sada and Turo are these famous scientific professors who've developed society-changing infrastructure the player would be able to directly see during the adventure, such as small-scale TM crafting machines, or smaller-scale Pokemon Center machines that allows them to be deployed in the field rather than be connected to a full building to be able to function. In all honesty, the specifics of what they've done doesn't matter too much, just something that does genuinely change society in the Paldea region in a meaningful way the player can understand. They have a son named Arvin, and for a while, do live as a happy family. They continue to research world-changing technology, and Turo has the idea of time travel, something Sada is intrigued by, but would rather pursue other ventures as she believes it's not possible. So, Turo researches it on the side on his own, and eventually manages to transport inorganic matter, as he summons a special Terra Shard that later gives way to the Terra Shards within Area Zero, and eventually permeating the Paldea region. This shard will be dubbed the Origin Terra Shard, but summoning it would destroy the original time machine. With the power of the Origin Terra Shard, however, it would be possible to accelerate time travel research and make way for new possibilities, such as transporting organic matter. Sada is stunned, but enamored with this discovery, and together, the two of them continue to pursue their time machine on the side when they're not spending time at home raising Arvin. However, Turo sustains some sort of fatal injury, the details of which don't exactly matter here, can write in pretty much whatever, like maybe it was Truck-san. 
it's just important that it would have been the cause of his death, and that it was preventable. Sada breaks from this, and when given the choice of devoting herself to her work or to her child, she chooses her work. The time machine was the key to undoing what had seemingly been set after all. If it could be solved, then reality could be whatever she wanted. There would be nothing stopping her and her family from going back to the happiness they once had. And so, she leaves home, pursuing research in Area Zero, leaving some sort of hired caretaker in charge of Arvin. Without the original machine and Turo's expertise, the original machine could not be rebuilt. There existed this origin tarot shard, and that was it. No way to reacquire another unless a new machine was perfected. There was nothing for it but to build from here. Arvin would be brought to visit sometimes, reminding Sada why it was she was doing this. The happiness of her family, never again having to feel this distance she feels with her son, and with Turo. One day, when Arvin is visiting along with his Mabostiff, his one longtime companion, Sada is barely paying attention to him as she approaches a breakthrough. The machine whirs to life, a Pokeball sent to the ancient past returns, the first one to have survived the trip with a resident inside. Sada is overjoyed. It truly was possible to transport organic matter through. As long as she could find some ancient Pokemon that had the key evolutionary DNA connecting Pokemon to humans that would allow humans to adopt Pokeball-like properties to make the trip themselves, then she could use this machine to do whatever she wanted. Arvin comes over into the room to see just what Sada is so elated about, but before she can truly celebrate her success, the Pokeball stirs and rumbles, pent-up emotions of anger and confusion lying on the other side. Sada barely has time to shield her face as the Pokeball bursts open in front of her, revealing the form of striking red with hints of white, in the shape of what appears to be an ancient Cyclozar, the ancient Pokemon Coridon that had only been found in fossils. This ancient beast had been plucked from its home, and was fully aware of this fact. Being a rather intelligent creature, it knew that there still existed more risk to the life of its world, and could sense the power of the origin terror shard that had been plentiful in its world. It was only in a few moments after Sada had time to recover that Coridon readied its ultimate attack to destroy the Origin Terra Shard, no matter the cost, driven by this short-term impulse to protect its world. Standing nearby was Arvin, who hadn't the slightest idea what was going on, and was too shocked to move. Sada had a mere fraction of a second to observe the oncoming attack and the two targets within its radius, the Origin Terra Shard, and Arvin. She hesitates for a moment, but then dives to shield the Origin Terra Shard from the blast, leaving Arvin wide open were it not for his partner Mabostiff coming in to protect him. Mabostiff is only a fraction of his size though, and so Arvin is left with an injury to his upper body, bearing the mark of a toned-down version of a Zuko-like scar, and leaving him with one eye blinded. Sada musters the last of her strength to give the command to the system, to deploy one of her precious Master Balls to bring an end to the beast's attack. Coridon is pulled into the device, and despite its immense power, is helpless in the face of the machine, and is locked in. Mabostiff has now suffered a great injury, but seems to just barely have the strength to continue on, unlike Sada who stares up at her machine with her final breaths. All Arvin can mutter in the face of this disaster is a quiet, why? Sada looks towards her son, who had just suffered irreparable physical and mental damage, and she slowly mutters, with this machine, there exists no mistake that cannot be undone, no events which cannot be changed, nothing will stop me from saving us. As her voice fades out, another machine from the corner of the room whirs to life as smoke bellows out. From it emerges a figure that seems to resemble Sada, although its movements feel robotic and lifeless. It takes calculated step after calculated step before Arvin, until it stands before the scarred boy and mutters, not even death. At Naranja Academy, all seems well on the surface when looking at the student body as a whole. On the individual scale, however, there are some who just don't quite fit in, who are talked down to, bullied, and harassed. The outcasts find companionship in one another, and are united under Penny, who's tired of being harassed for looking like a Switch-exclusive Fortnite skin. Under the name of Team Star, they scheme to exact revenge on the bullies, and confront them in the courtyard. Team Star wins the Pokemon battle, but then goes a step too far as they plan on continuing the attack onto the trainers themselves. Teachers take notice and step in to stop the conflict, which leads to the suspension of the Team Star students, while the original instigators are let off without any question about what led to this occurrence in the first place. Team Star breaks off from the school, 
founding their own bases, and adopts an unhealthy mental stance towards those of the school, an us versus them mentality, absolute good versus absolute evil. If you don't shun the school administrative system and the bullies, or continue to attend and support the school, then you're just as bad as they are. You're only contributing to the problem. How dare you support something so rooted in evil? You deserve the harshest of treatment as a result. Team Star becomes the very thing they swore to destroy. Bullies. Like an angry Twitter debate lord, they devote themselves to the cause of denouncing anyone they feel has wronged them, or anyone who doesn't also denounce them. They try to turn people over to their side against the villains of the school administration and bullies, and if you don't take their side, then that means you're part of the villains here too. Penny realizes that things have gone too far, asks Team Star to stop this, that they're only perpetuating a cycle of hatred, that they need to disband and leave this group that villainizes anyone who disagrees behind. The leaders doubt Penny, feeling that perhaps she didn't believe in them in the first place either, that she's secretly part of the bad guys too. Her word is not to be trusted, she's outed from the team, remove the weakest link so they can continue their crusade of bullying anyone who disagrees. Penny is left with regret at this team she founded she is now seemingly powerless to bring a stop to, having something she created to help bring a stop to bullying, only now further perpetuate it, while Team Star continues to try and gather strength and numbers to do as much damage as they can to anyone who doesn't agree with them. Namona was once a promising new trainer, who embarked on a Pokemon journey not too dissimilar from our own in series past. She began with a starter Pokemon, and set out across the region, taking on the gym challenge and the league. She did it, became a new champion, but now what? In a single player video game, usually when you're through with the adventure, the game gets shelved so you can move on to the next one. But for Namona, this isn't just some video game, it's real life. So that begs the question of, now what? There is seemingly no further challenge to move on to, no next adventure to have, no escape from this position she's found herself in. The credits have rolled, but she's still right back to where she left off, with the journey concluded. What is there to work up to now? What adventure is there left to be had? People don't even treat her like an equal anymore, someone they can genuinely be friends with, but rather, they treat her like a celebrity, someone that affords some sort of novelty to spend time with. She soon finds out that it's lonely at the top, and no longer feels like she has anything to work towards, filled with regret for having seen her adventure through and achieved her goals. She adopts a pessimistic view of the world, and herself. She begins to have some feelings of distrust in others, worrying that they may just see her as a novelty rather than the person she is. Afraid that she'd never be able to see eye to eye with someone else. How would they be able to complete the same journey she had since she had yet to face somebody she'd been able to consider her equal? And so, we begin the events of the game. You've recently moved to the region, and will soon begin school at Naranja Academy. Director Clavel comes and gives you your documents, and a school uniform that's optional to wear, and lets you choose your starter Pokemon. You walk with him over to your neighbor's place, Nimona's home. Nimona doesn't think that you'd ever be able to challenge her, but even so, as a new mover to the Paldea region, you don't come with any preconceived notions about her status or achievements, and so she tries to be kind to you, hoping to be your friend, while giving a weak smile that doesn't quite reach her eyes. As Clavel introduces her as a champion of the Academy, Nimona seems alarmed that he'd reveal such a thing, not wanting her status to get in the way of a potential friendship. After getting your starter Pokemon, if you wish to challenge Nimona, she outright refuses you, feeling that there's no point letting some of her true feelings through the cracks. She doesn't take a starter Pokemon here, and remains with her flagship team throughout the title. The director departs, and you two set out for the academy. Nimona lets you take your time, learning the ropes, battling some trainers, catching some Pokemon, but also telling you, just remember, there's no rush, okay? It's not like you can ever go back and experience something for the first time again. Meanwhile, in the depths of the great crater of Paldea, AI Sada remains absorbed in her work to perfect the time machine, so absorbed in fact that she barely pays attention to anything else around her, failing to notice the rumbling of her machine gradually shifting the position of a master ball stored away, which has been slowly inching itself towards the edge. Eventually, it falls, landing on the button and freeing the prisoner inside as a legendary beast out of time emerges from its cell. 
Sada has since developed a defense system around the time machine, the ability to summon ancient Pokemon from the past to defend it. To not allow such a risk to befall the machine yet again, it wouldn't be possible for Koridon to destroy it in this state on its own. And were it caught, it would only be trapped to the Master Ball yet again, with Sada likely ensuring that it wouldn't be able to escape again. The only option was to flee for now. Koridon takes the Master Ball in hand, and with it, the control Sada has over it, and escapes the lab, mustering all of its strength to soar out of the Great Crater. Without a clear target in mind, it sets its sight on the lighthouse in the southern end of the region. You make it through your first route, and approach a lighthouse. Nimona tells you if you'd like to see the region you've moved to to climb the lighthouse, she'll wait down here for you. So, you make it to the top, and observe the beautiful Paldea region around you. As you scan the horizon, you notice something that appears to be approaching you alarmingly fast, as if it's coming in for a landing. Crydon doesn't notice you until it's too late, and tries to change its trajectory, but ends up colliding with you and losing control, launching both you and it into the waters below. The beach and caves below aren't safe, having territorial Pokemon who don't take kindly to visitors, and Nimona panics, dropping her aura of seemingly not caring, and tries to rush to your aid. Unfortunately, there's no easy way down. The champion has no quick way to rush to your defense. It's not like a smartphone can just break any fall, after all. On impact with the water below, you have just enough perception to notice a peculiar Pokeball making contact with a nearby rock, and pulling your assailant inside, as the Pokeball slowly floats up to the surface. You manage to scramble back out of the water, holding this type of Pokeball you've never seen before. Choosing the compassionate option to free the beast, you press the button in the center, and Koridon emerges, visibly physically hurt after having made contact with the lighthouse, and mentally hurt after having gone through some sort of ordeal to get here in the first place. So, you offer it your food to help it regain its strength, and while it's eating, you patch up its most badly damaged paw, creating a sash identifier that will mark our Koridon from here on. This teaches Koridon that not all humans are bad, that there is some kindness to be had in this world, and if anyone should be the one to have its Master Ball, it should be you, not somebody like Sada. Territorial Pokemon start to emerge from the cave and show open hostility towards you and Koridon. Koridon then makes a snap decision, gathering up the last of its strength that assumes its battle form, tosses you onto its back, and strikes the opposing group with a quick blow, and then scales the cliff to save you, like you saved it despite the hardship it caused you. This is rather draining to Koridon, however, and it's unable to maintain its battle form. Nimona is overjoyed that you're alright, again letting some more of her more compassionate side through. You both decide to return to the lighthouse to rest, check for injuries, and make sure everything is alright with you and Koridon. In front of the lighthouse, you see a boy standing in front of the side door. He wears a backpack with camping materials, clearly somebody who enjoys the outdoors and isn't too reliant on technology. He turns to see you approaching. The boy has striking long brown hair, which serves to cover one of his eyes, which is difficult to tell, but it's almost as if it hides a scar underneath. When he sees Koridon walking with you, first a flash of fear adorns his face, but that soon changes to anger. This is the being that scarred him injured Mabostiff, and marked the moment his mother made the choice of her machine over him. Koridon recognizes Arvin too, and feels shame for its actions. Arvin begins to lash out at Koridon, who struggles to look at him, knowing what it did to him. Nimona steps in between the two, giving Arvin some words about how he shouldn't be so mean, while Arvin mutters, You could never understand. You. You're Koridon's trainer now, aren't you? I'll show you. I'll show you I'm better. That I can beat you. That the fate of me and my best friend won't be determined by you. Unclear whether he's still addressing you, or had shifted his attention to Koridon partway through. Arvin challenges you with something a bit tougher than a level 5 Squovet, but not by a lot, having engaged in a battle that he had no chance of winning. He's clearly frustrated by this loss, and tells you, Just stay away from me, as he runs off. You and Nimona finish your trek to Mesagosa, and make your way up to the academy. Here, you notice an argument happening between a student and two others who appear to be wearing biking equipment. The student is berating them for not coming to class, while the bikers are chastising the student for letting the administration off scot-free for their apparent past mistakes, treating the student like they're just as bad for whatever it was the administration supposedly did. Nearby is a young girl who's clearly troubled by the argument going on on the other side of the path, but without any interest in intervening. You ask her, do you know them? To which she answers, no, and I was just on my way to class, and she takes her leave. 
the Team Star grunts don't seem ignorant to you looking over and talking about them, so they approach you with hostilities, assuming that you too are villainizing them and siding with the ones they see as the true villains. So they challenge you to battle, Nimona introduces terrestrialization to you, and you manage to defeat them, and they run off. Nimona is surprised at how quickly you are able to pick up on battling, and gives you a, not bad. At the top of the stairs looking down is the girl from earlier, who didn't have a class to get to, but rather wanted to see how things played out. She notices how you stood up for yourself and defeated the Team Star grunts without any hatred or malice towards them, simply wanting to bring an end to the conflict. She takes a glance at her phone, one last glance at you, and then walks away. You make it to the academy, get shown your dorm, currently with shelves empty but can fill as your adventure goes on so it's not just a completely pointless room. It seems you enrolled at the academy shortly before the current big project of the treasure hunt, where students venture across the region making their own adventure and discovering what's treasure to them. This is going to need some thought about what it is you should do, and you decide to meet Nimona in the cafeteria to talk about it. You get there before her, though, and encounter Arvin cooking something towards the back. He recognizes you, and begins to lash out in his anger and resentment towards you. To your surprise, all the nearby staff don't even seem to take notice of the situation. Arvin cools down a bit and tells you, You're trying to figure out what to do for the treasure hunt, aren't you? As for me, I'm hunting down Herba Mystica said to be guarded by Titan Pokemon. You got that? So find your own treasure. You better not pick the same one as me. And he leaves. Nimona meets you to discuss the project over lunch with you. All the while, everyone else seems to be keeping some distance from her and whispering things like, Oh my Arceus, is that Nimona? Who's that new kid with her? Are they her friend or something? Nimona tells you, A treasure to seek across the region? The only thing that comes to mind is the gym challenge, becoming a champion. But what's the point of becoming champion anyway? People treat you differently and what's left to strive for? Besides, few people ever manage to pull it off anyway. Go for it if you want, I won't stop you, but just don't set your expectations too high. Nimona has some sadness in her expression and decides to take her leave. Director Clavel enters the room and checks in on you to make sure the new student is getting along alright so far. Here's a good illusion of choice dialogue option, telling Clavel either that the staff seem to turn a blind eye to Arvin's aggression, or the students seem to be treating Nimona differently and it seemed to upset her. Clavel seems surprised to hear this, saying that he's never heard reports of such things, but he'll try to keep an eye out. The director gets up and leaves, and as you begin to leave the room, your phone suddenly goes off, and you're spoken to by the mysterious Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia tells you about Team Star, and tells you, I know you've seen it. The way the staff here deals with problems, and the way the students treat those who are different. Team Star has turned this into ultimate good versus evil. They've just lost their way. You know this, and you're capable of standing up to them. You want to know what treasure there is to seek? Defeat Team Star. Don't let the cycle of hatred continue. And the mysterious user disconnects. Around the corner, Clavel listened in, and is determined to get to the bottom of what exactly is going on at his institution. And so, the world opens up, and you have three paths laid out before you. The Path of Legends, Victory Road, and Team Star. Let's go through them in that order. As you journey across the region, you can't help but notice a Pokemon that seems significantly larger than any others around it, and you wonder if this is one of the Titan Pokemon that Arvin told you about. So you battle it, it runs off and you give chase, it powers itself up, and Arvin runs up, surprised to see you here, but now there's no choice but to battle side by side. Together you manage to defeat the Titan Pokemon, and Arvin realizes he couldn't have done it without you, so he tells you, you may as well see what I'm after at this point. There you find the Herba Mystica, which Arvin believes has healing and rejuvenating properties. It's why Titan Pokemon end up defending them, so they can remain at the top in their territory. If they're losing a fight, they can just fall back on the Herba Mystica for an instant recharge and power up. Them being big is what puts them at the top, and the Herba Mystica ensures they stay there. The strongest Pokemon have access to the Herba Mystica. The Herba Mystica does not create the strongest Pokemon. According to the Scarlet Book that Arvin has, the power of every Herba Mystica together should work as a miracle panacea beyond the understanding of modern medicine, able to heal even the gravest of conditions. So Arvin uses it to cook up some sandwiches for you two to eat, figuring he should at least show you that gesture, considering how you made this possible. While a Master Ball would typically keep the Pokemon indefinitely trapped inside, in the hands of a trusting trainer, the Pokemon can emerge if it so chooses. Besides, the ball also took some damages off of that rocky shore earlier. 
and so Koridon reveals itself. Arvin initially snaps, claiming that there's no reason why Koridon should deserve this kindness as well. This saddens Koridon, who's filled with guilt, who begins to move away with a slight limp on that injured leg we patched up earlier. But as Arvin searches for the right words, his eyes glance down to the sash adorning Koridon's leg. Arvin's anger subsides and is replaced with brief shock, as a gust of wind seems to briefly blow into the cave and lift the strand of hair covering his face, briefly revealing a scar underneath, adorning his closed eye. Arvin looks down and mutters, You too, huh? Realizing that he's not the only one forced to endure pain as part of a consequence of her actions. He pauses for a moment and then says, Alright, you can have some as well. I suppose there's enough to go around. Rydon is surprised by this, but gladly accepts partaking in the sandwich, while still clearly having some shame around Arvin. This helps Koridon regain some of its strength. You thank Arvin for the meal, and set out. Arvin then whispers, you can come out now, to a Pokeball after you've left the cave. You continue to battle Titan Pokemon at helping Arvin, and eventually he's able to warm up enough to Koridon being present that he decides to reveal why he's pursuing the Herba Mystica, feeling like it's important that you know as Koridon's trainer. He brings out his Mabostiff, whose condition has deteriorated, filling Koridon with shame. Arvin tells you that this was caused by Koridon's full strength, and while he now recognizes that he and Mabostiff aren't the only ones who've suffered, and that Koridon's attack wasn't intended for them to, that still doesn't mean that he can forgive Koridon. You continue exploring the region, defeating Titan Pokemon, until you reach the Asado Desert following reports of a Titan Pokemon here. Titan Pokemon is nowhere to be seen, leaving you wondering where it could be. You get a phone call from Arvin, telling you to come to Kaskarafa right now. It's an emergency. You arrive at the city, only to find swaths of it partially destroyed and several buildings set aflame. Trainers and Pokemon are exhausted in the streets, having clearly tried to battle whatever caused this, only to have failed. What appears to be primal versions of Dawnfan rage through the streets, following a larger Titan variant that has powered its way towards a cave around the back of town where the Herba Mystica is located. You arrive by the Titan Pokemon right as Mr. Clean loses his last Pokemon to the Beast, and you and Arvin team up to defeat the Titan Pokemon and bring a stop to the destruction. You successfully defeat the Beast, and the Gym Leader goes to heal up his Pokemon and bring a stop to the others rampaging around town, giving you and Arvin the chance to enter the cave and do what you need to do. Unfortunately, in the mayhem, it seems there is none of this type of Herba Mystica left, all of it having either been destroyed or eaten by the Titan Pokemon to heal itself when facing the gym leader. This tears at Arvin, as a tear rolls down his face, and he assures himself, it'll still work. It has to, as he leaves in pursuit of the remaining Herba Mystica across the land. Along with Arvin, you finish collecting the remaining Herba Mystica, and Mabostiff's condition does seem to improve some, but only as a temporary relief only enough for their time together to last a little longer, and eventually you don't hear of Mabustiff again. Sada has been keeping tabs on her son though, and reaches out to him sometime later to tell him, Now you understand the importance of my research, why I must see this through. But unlike Sada, Arvin does not make the same choice, saying, No, I'm not like you. Sada pauses for a moment, as if contemplating, but then says, Perhaps you'll understand once you see how far I've come. I want you to come to the lab in Area Zero. This prompts Arvin to ask you to come with him, and figure having that a couple others on the team would be helpful to face this challenge that he fears puts all of Paldea at risk if Sada truly has achieved what he worries she has. You set out to challenge gyms across the region. Along the way, you'll sometimes run into Nimona, not because she's stalking you, but because as a champion, she's helping out with the gym challenge, as that's apparently something champions can help out with. Early on, Nimona doesn't have confidence in you, but doesn't want to be too mean, just telling you things like, don't be too upset if things don't end up working out. Anytime you run into her, you can choose to battle her if you'd like, after many yes you're sure prompts you need to select, implying that it's not something you should be doing at this point, but can if you really want to. Nimona would most likely easily defeat you, and decide that no, you won't be the one to challenge her. She'd still like to be your friend as you're somebody that doesn't put her on some pedestal as a champion, but as a champion, she'll continue to remain alone at the top. You continue to take on gyms and blow through them, surprising Nimona. 
She'll remark that it is rather impressive how well you're doing with the challenge for such a newcomer, reminding her of her own gym challenge. She still doesn't think you'll rise up to challenge her, but changes her stance to, you know what, keep it up. Pokemon doesn't often give subtle clues to deeper plot points within its main story. How about we change that with some telling text from none other than the people's champion, Larry, who could expand on one of the ideas he started during the gym leader rematches. At the end of the day, nothing beats simplicity. People are most comfortable when things are simple. Even after returning from a long vacation, you'll be glad to be back in your own bed again. It's when complexity is introduced that people get uncomfortable and want things to change. People's motivations usually aren't that complex. People may want to return to the simple life they once had, and not be able to accept the more complex situation they found themselves in, or may even just want a simple place to belong. We may pretend otherwise, but at the end of the day, what we really want is simplicity. You complete the gym challenge and inspire a glimmer of hope in Nimona that perhaps she isn't the only student who could become champion. She's still pretty convinced of her perpetual isolation as a student champion, so she still tries not to let this hope get too much of a hold of her, but she does urge you. You have to attempt the league. I'm sure you can do it. You overcome the league, and Nimona challenges you to a battle to find out whether you can truly face up to her. She pulls out all the stops, being the second highest level trainer in the region after Sada, facing you with the party that made her champion in the first place. You manage to defeat her, and she realizes that in the adventure of life, there is no finish line, no one goal you can hit to say your journey is complete, that there's always room to grow and further challenge yourself as long as you're open to the possibility of it being there. She's no longer the lonely champion at the top, she's not alone, and has the door open to further challenge ahead of her. She breaks down in tears, the sheer relief of all these emotions she felt she'd be plagued with for the rest of her life and promises to do everything in her power to make sure you too never stop pushing yourself to improve and grow. Had you battled her earlier in the story and successfully defeated her, this would play out then as well, with the only difference being her assuring you that at your current strength there's no doubt you can become champion too, and encouraging you to do it. Team Star has established several bases across the region for them to launch their recruitment and harassment campaigns on students from. With such a drastic us versus them mentality they've adopted, they've decided that might makes right, and are only willing to stop if somebody defeats them, which in turn would only further victimize them. It would feel too personal were Penny the one to defeat Team Star, which means that she needed to ask somebody else. Longtime students of the Academy have it out for Team Star nowadays. It's a big part of the school atmosphere to know that Team Star are this group of bullies that only cause problems for the school, which means if she asks a student who's been around for a while to help defeat Team Star, that they may just try to defeat them out of contempt and only further continue the cycle. Which is why she saw potential in you when you battled Team Star in Mesa Gosa, where you battled without any need to separate things into good guys versus bad guys, but rather with an unbiased stance simply wanting to bring an end to the conflict at hand. Plus, you've also got an ancient bike lizard who seems uber powerful, giving Penny two key reasons to ask you, instead of the only reason being because you're the player. On this journey, you're joined by the suave and hip fellow student Clive, who wants to come to a better understanding of what exactly is going on here. You defeat the Team Star leaders, who chastise you for taking the side of the school administration and bullies. How dare you side with the bad guys? How dare you imply that they were in the right and Team Star is in the wrong? After defeating them, Penny asks you and all the Team Star leaders to come to the Academy, where she's going to finish this. She has the leaders watch as you face her in battle, to symbolically deal the final blow to the team and end it for good. The Team Star leaders are distraught about this. How can we possibly disband? We're the good guys here standing up to bullying and the negligent school staff. They notice a small group of students in the corner of the courtyard, cowering, to which one of the leaders says, Look, there's more victims right there, in fear of the bullies present at this school. Penny has a disappointed look on her face as she says, They're not afraid of bullies present at this school. What they're afraid of is you. The Team Star leaders are at a loss for words as realization adorns their faces, them now realizing that they've become the very thing they swore to destroy. Some drop to their knees, 
Others stand frozen in shock. Clavel addresses them, telling them that while their actions were indeed wrong, what brought about in the first place was his own negligence. He neglected the responsibility of head of the academy, didn't hold the staff accountable for their own negligence, and didn't take the time to make sure the staff and student body were creating a positive environment, as all he saw was the overall student body which seemed to be doing well enough, ignoring those who were outcasts of the group. He swears to do better to create a more positive environment, and asks for Team Star's help in doing so. Create a club at the school anybody can join and belong in, which consults and advises the school staff on how they should be best supporting the student body, and hold them accountable if they continue to ignore issues present right in front of them. Have this club also serve as a means for a wide range of different students to talk and get to know one another, sharing all sorts of different worldviews, diminishing the chances of the group adopting such drastic us-versus-them mentalities in the future. So, with a renewed sense of purpose, both Team Star and the school director vow to do what they can to create a positive school environment. You meet Arvin at the entrance to Area Zero, along with your other close friends of Nimona and Penny, gathering all the strength you can for what Arvin assures you will be the final battle of this journey. You need to glide down to Area Zero with Koraidon, who has a bit of fear considering what happened here last time, but who also knows what Sada has created and that it must be destroyed. And this time, Koraidon isn't alone, instead being joined by friends who will see this machine destroyed once and for all, giving Koraidon renewed resolve and it makes the conscious decision to glide into the depths below for the greater good, and the world it left behind. Because it's not afraid of some second Coridon that wants to slap it, and because in this universe Pokemon Scarlet and Violet is a game actually designed for the Nintendo Switch, you can continue to ride Coridon within Area Zero. Arvin could probably just go and knock on the door to the main lab and get his mom to let him in, but if she saw that he brought the Cartoon Network Avengers with him, she might catch on to the fact that Arvin means to stop her, and so, Penny proposes opening the doors from the outside, using various research stations to access the infrastructure and gain access. So, you trek across Area Zero, as Penny uses her hacker skills for more than turning on lights, and this could be a good opportunity for exposition without just text dump. Let's say Penny was able to surface some old video feeds that show you what happened to the old professor instead of just telling you about it. There's dangerous Pokemon around here that will attack you, similar to the aggression of the ancient Pokemon who laid waste to Kaskarafa. You make it down to the lab, and Sada is already there to greet you, clearly glad that she can unveil her creation and staying largely optimistic about her faith in herself to win Arvin over, but also slightly unnerved at the unexpected crowd. Arvin, my child, I'm so glad you could make it, and I see you brought your friends. I am on the cusp of fixing everything that went wrong, Soon we'll be able to be a happy family again when I fix it all, even you. As if gesturing to the eye, Arvin keeps covered by hair. Arvin pauses for a moment, and then speaks up. There's nothing that needs to be fixed, Mom. I know you're torn from the grief of losing Dad, but you need to keep moving forward. You can't stay lost in the past. I'm still here, so please, come back! Sada is disappointed to hear this. She knows she's right. All the calculations show it's possible. Perhaps all it takes is some more proof. To show Arvin that it is definitively possible. That she can change their fates. Turn back the clock. She's so close to her goal after all. She needs him to know that it's possible that they can all be happy again. She only needs a bit more time. It is possible, Arvin. I know it is. I need only show you. All I need is time to work on my machine. As she turns to re-enter the lab. Is that why you ignored me growing up? Because you spent all your time on your machine that you couldn't see who your own son grew to become? Sada pauses for a moment. Yes, because soon we will have all the time we want together. As she enters the lab and the door seals behind her. Soon after, several smaller doors on the side of the building open up, unleashing ancient Pokemon contained therein that soon surround your group. She's buying time to keep us from tampering with her plans, or maybe she figures whatever's happened in this timeline won't matter soon anyway. You do battle with the ancient Pokemon, but they just continue pouring out in vast numbers. Soon your party will run out of stamina before clearing the threat. Just enough time, Penny is able to use the back door she created to reopen the laboratory entrance, but at the cost of forcing it to stay open. 
You can't exactly run in, only to have the ancient Pokemon run in after you and swarm the team in a confined space. A powerful ally will need to stay here to fend off the threat. Before you have time to decide on who it should be, Coridon emerges from its Pokeball, pushing the squad inside the lab and taking guard before the entrance. Coridon put its trust into a human for the first time with you, after you took care of it despite what Coridon had done to knock you off the lighthouse. Now, it was Coridon's turn for you to place your trust in it. Arvin had once been gravely injured along with Mabostiff due to Coridon's hasty action that lacked regard for those around it. Coridon had inadvertently taken a life dear to Arvin and changed his life forever. Now it was time to make amends for that as best as Coridon could. This time, Coridon being the one in the line of fire to shield Arvin and the team from all these ancient Pokemon. Arvin sheds a tear, just able to mutter, Please, no, not you too before being grabbed by Nimona as the party runs into the depths of the lab. Just before the outside world fades into darkness, you see a flash of light as Coridon assumes its battle form and begins to fend off the ancient Pokemon looking to harm all intruders. The party makes it to the depths of the facility where the time machine lies. Sada works away at it with speed impossible for a mere human. On the side of the room, the Origin Terra Shard glimmers with an otherworldly glow and has clearly been pushed to its extremes as the crystalline materials seem to have been caked over not only the surface of the enclosure, but even up the walls and around the facility, giving the whole room a crystalline, mirror-like appearance. Arvin begs Sada to stop this, but Sada says that she's come too far to stop now. There's no going back, outside of this machine, of course. It's never too late to focus on the present, Arvin yells, but by the time he's finished his sentence, the machine whirs to life as a massive tower is erected from the center of the facility. Sada looks down on you from above, all of you simply more victims of time, but soon you'll all be saved. Sada begins calling down Pokeballs from out of time, ancient prisoners held within, and she challenges you to a battle. You defeat Sada, and the tower comes back down to ground level. She falls to her knees, seemingly defeated but head quickly twitching as if making some sort of advanced calculation beyond human comprehension. She comes to a conclusion, and decides to gamble it all and do one final summon of the most powerful Pokemon the machine can manage to snag from the past. The machine whirs to life once more, alarms start blaring in warning of the Pokemon attempting to be summoned. Please, stop this! You know I can't. I've come too far. Think about everything we've lost. With this power... We can reclaim the time that's rightfully ours. I've watched your journey. You should understand better than anyone. Don't you feel regret? Wish that things could be different? Yeah, of course I do. If only I'd made the right choice. If what happened hadn't. Of course it's easy to get lost in the past. But no matter my regrets, I won't let it dictate the now. I won't let myself get lost in the past. Lost? In the past? I can't let what happened blind me to what's still around me. I refuse to neglect what's still here, now. It's not right to live your life wishing that things could just go back to the way they once were. Or to let the pursuit of your own ideals hurt others around you. It's about making the most of now. Making every day count, so that you can live without regret. The most of now. Without regret. Surely, what I'm doing will grant us as much now as we could ever want. Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. Arvin. But what I do know is that we have this time. It's up to us whether we're going to live in the now or drown in regret. So please, if you're still there, Mom, come back! To live without regret. Before Sada can finish contemplating this thought, the machine begins to whir faster as it readies the final Pokemon. The facility shakes as the machine abducts another victim from a foreign time. A Master Ball drops to the floor, clearly worn from having been used for summon after summon, filling the population of Area Zero over the years, seemingly just barely held together at this point. The light is barely blinking on, struggling to muster the power to function, until the light peters out. No, impossible mutters Sada before the ball explodes in a flash of light, the result of overuse and greed. From the ball emerges a familiar figure, postured in battle form and clearly enraged at having been taken from its home. 
It turns to spot the origin terror shard on the side of the room, near where Arvin is at, and without a second thought, it readies its ultimate attack. This had been the most traumatic thing to happen to Arvin, and so he finds himself paralyzed by fear when faced with it yet again. The abducted Coridon fires its blast, and as it approaches Arvin and the origin terror shard, Sada dives in front of Arvin, shielding him from the blast. The explosion echoes throughout the chamber, and as the smoke clears, the first thing that comes into vision is the glow of the origin terror shard penetrating the haze. As it continues to clear, however, it's clear it's beginning to show imperfections as cracks snake their way down all the way down the crystal, until the crystal shatters into millions of pieces, sparkles flying everywhere. The machine stops its whirring, slowing to a halt, never to be able to extend its reach across time ever again. The new Coridon scoffs at its successful attack, but is still filled with rage at finding itself here, and so it turns to the player, Nimona, and Penny. It begins to ready yet another of its most powerful attack, but before it can finish, the door bursts open and another blast comes through the smoke directly into the Coridon. The figure responsible steps through the smoke, near identical to the aggressor, but with a sash adorning one leg and clearly tattered after having fended off all the Area Zero Pokemon who aimed to enter the lab. In such a state, Coridon won't be able to do this on its own. So you, with Coridon and the rest of your team, along with Nimona and Penny, prepare to battle the new Coridon. Arvin kneels next to AI Sada, her robotic form now clear for the world to see, as she tells him, Don't be like your mother. Go. Protect your friends. A single tear falls from Arvin's hidden eye, as he closes his eyes and silently stands, determined to do what he knows needs to be done. He runs over to join your group to protect his friends, including Coridon. You four engage in the final raid battle, eventually decreasing Coridon's health enough. You throw a Pokeball, which shakes once, twice, three times, and then clicks. The battle had been won. Arvin and the team rush over to what remains of Sada. Mom, it really is you in there, isn't it? Sada struggles to speak, sometimes having glitchy effects in her speech. What I am, I'm not entirely certain. For so long, I searched single-mindedly towards the control of time, because I thought it would give us happiness that was otherwise unobtainable. But right now... What I feel I estimate to be happiness. Please, I can't lose you too. You lost her a long time ago, dear Arvin, but I'm sure she'd be proud to see the path you forged for yourself. Continue to follow your own path. Live in the now. You have amazing friends who will continue to support you along the way. I'm ending this cycle of regret. Thank you for showing me what it meant to make the most of what you still have. Sada gives one final command to the system before the light of her eyes fades into darkness. Penny is the first to break the silence. What did she mean by cycle of regret? As if to answer her question, new lights come to life on the other side of the room, revealing several pods, each of which containing another robotic Sada, as one by one, they get powered down, never to get the opportunity to further pursue the time machine they had been created for. Arvin stands and turns to the others before saying, My friends, thank you. Let's keep making the most of every day. And if we start to lose our way, we'll be there for one another. Yeah. Rhydon comes up to Arvin and gives him a big lick to show its gratitude. Of course, you're my friend now too. Come on, let's go home. And so, the party heads off, determined to make the most of the now. I had two key focuses around this story rewrite. One was one singular overarching idea that connects everything together, and the other was a meaningful lesson for the player to learn along the way. My chosen overarching idea was the theme of regret, as not only does it work for our professor motivation, but also a theme of the other stories. Nimona is plagued by regret that she had seemingly achieved all she wanted to achieve, there wasn't anything to work towards anymore, and now she was alone at the top. She regrets having completed her journey, her goals, 
now finding herself living aimlessly and lonely. The lesson she learns in her story is that there is no end point to a journey, no finish line where you can say you can stop improving and there's no reason to keep moving forward anymore. No matter how skilled you are, there will always be room for improvement and room to challenge yourself. Penny feels regret over starting Team Star, who initially were the bullied minority, but then became villains themselves in their pursuit of trying to harass and condemn anyone who isn't completely with them. They let their regret of the past determine their mindsets, their whole personalities becoming based around this one aim, not too dissimilar from the professor. Penny learned and helped teach Team Star that it's not right to treat things in such an us versus them way, and not to become the very thing you swore to destroy in your pursuit of your own justice. Arvin regretted and resented the fact that he essentially grew up without his parents, losing his dad early on, and then soon after, losing his mother to her pursuit of undoing what had been done. He resented Coridon for what had happened to him, shifted this blame onto the legendary beast. But on taking the time to begin to understand Coridon better, he learned that perhaps they weren't so different after all, and that Coridon had no intention of repeating what had happened in the lab all those years ago, and so, even if he can't forgive Coridon, they should at least both continue to move forward, rather than being stuck in the past. This lesson helps form the basis of his character after he loses Mabosif, why he doesn't come to the same conclusion that Sada did. It's not to say not to let yourself experience grief. It's healthy to give it time to be able to move on past the loss, but that's the important part, eventually being able to move on. Arvin, despite the incredible pain, was able to move on, whereas Sada could not leading to the inevitable conflict between the two. Sada was the most wrought with regret during this story, lingering in the past and the possibilities in pursuit of trying to change what had already been done. It didn't matter how much damage she caused, whether to her own son, his dog, Pokemon of the past, or even the world around her. The possibilities were endless after all. Once anything could be rewritten, the costs would no longer matter. The now had no importance. All that was important is what could be written once the machine was complete. She continued to monitor you and Arvin on the side of her research, observing your journey and feeling that once Mabostif was no longer around that surely now Arvin must understand her, but then being confused at his continued defiance. What could he be seeing that she wasn't? It couldn't be that she was mistaken while he was right, could it? Arvin tells her the importance of living in the now, making every day count so that you can live without regret, continuing to move forward instead of dedicating yourself to undo or fix your own regrets. We all have regrets in our own lives, but the best we can do is learn from them and continue to move forward. In that pivotal moment, Sada decides for the first time in years that she's going to live in the now, and by doing so, was able to have her final action be free of regret and experience happiness. I didn't want this to be seen as, the villain did this one good thing right at the end that sacrifices themselves that means we as the audience need to forgive them for all their past sins, and now that they're dead the writers don't have to worry about the muckiness of the villain owning up to their past actions. I kinda hate that trope. Whether you would forgive Sada or not here doesn't matter. What matters is showing that it's never too late to start moving forward, to get your life back on track, to stop drowning in the past and start looking ahead. We all only have so much time together on this rock flying through space after all, which is why I would argue the importance of making the most of the time we have. That right there is the greatest treasure. The soundtrack of this game has nearly 200 themes, well, technically at least. Many of those are various jingles that the game uses. But regardless, we're already over four hours into this video. I started working on this shortly after the game came out and I'm currently narrating this from mid-April. I'm not going to discuss every single theme in this game, but I would like to talk about all the main ones, or ones that stood out to me. As I typically do in soundtrack discussions, I'll be sure to include theme names in the upper corner whenever a new one comes on, but as always, the full music credit will be in the pinned comment below. There isn't enough room in the description considering we've already gone through over 80 music pieces to be credited up to this point. The theme for the player's home, you'd think it wouldn't need to go that hard since you'd only really hear it at the beginning and that's it. Though I suppose it does make a good first impression, but this theme is actually just really calming and welcoming feeling. Definitely a good first step into the adventure.
I normally wouldn't talk about a theme as niche as, say, a cave theme, but this theme is actually pretty good at striking a sense of mysteriousness. When I first listened through the soundtrack for this discussion, I didn't actually recall where in the game it played. It's for the cave in the beginning when you're following Coridon, as it turns out. But there isn't really all that much in terms of extensive cave networks to explore throughout this world, and this theme you never really hear again past this point. The Pokemon Center theme I don't think I ever fully heard until listening for this discussion, but as it goes on, it gives me almost mystery gifter or Wi-Fi connection kind of vibes, and I like that. I suppose the only context that you'd hear this part is if you stick around the center long enough, perhaps using the online connection features, so it makes sense for the theme to be like this. The sandwich making theme is essentially the same as the mini game itself. Silly and wacky the first time, but it doesn't take long for it to get annoying. I wonder if that's what they were going for here. The South Province theme. I honestly really love this. It strikes such a sense of adventure, and an incredible use of this light motif that we'll be hearing throughout this adventure. As well, something that I realized when I was listening through the soundtrack is each of the four main sections of the world, so north, south, west, and east, all have one main light motif associated with them that is reused throughout areas within that section of the world. So for example, if you go to a town in the North Province, there's a good chance that within the town theme you'll hear the same leitmotif that you heard while exploring the North Province. And the same thing goes for the Wild Pokemon Battle themes in each of these respective areas. Hello. So the fact that the various elements of these four main sections are musically connected to one another is honestly really cool. To start out going through the South Province leitmotif, another really great example of it is the Cave Overworld theme. It has a lot calmer of a tone to it, and an almost echoey effect as if you're in a cave. And now, how about we speed round through several other examples of this leitmotif.
the East Province theme. Alright, now this is quite a slapper. I'm not going to go through every single one, but a lot of themes in this game have alternate versions which follow the same tune, but with a completely different tone. And for several examples of this leitmotif, The West Province theme is a whole nother style to adventuring around the region. It's pretty nice.
Want another theme that gives mystery gift or Wi-Fi connection vibes? Look no further than Cascarafa. Except this one then turns into jazz, and then other things I don't know what to identify it as, but it's cool. The North Province theme begins with some Pokemon Super Mystery Dungeon vibes, and becomes very grand for the mountains laid out before you. Casserole Lake, as I like to call it, is a rather tranquil, mysterious, and relaxing tune, and using the same light motif.
The trainer battle theme sounds pretty par for the course for a Pokemon battle theme. It has a lot that gives classic Pokemon vibes, including the original Pokemon leitmotif the series uses a lot. In my opinion, it's a pretty alrighty theme, but I feel like it doesn't really set itself all that much apart from other games' trainer battle themes. Professor Sada and Turo's theme. I'm not super big on the style of it, not exactly my kind of music. It's kind of like Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team Thunder Wave Cave. At first, you're digging it but it doesn't take too long for it to get repetitive and annoying. However, the robotic -y and electronic nature of the theme serves as musical foreshadowing for the professor being a robot. That type of foreshadowing I do have to applaud. It would have been neat for the theme to take a more ominous tone to hint at their dark nature, rather than this kooky and zany feeling theme we got. Though, I guess this game isn't my version of the story, this is the actual game that shipped which means that the professor is completely free of wrongdoing and therefore there's no dark nature to hint at, I suppose. Penny's theme is quite relaxing and pure. It's quite a nice theme that sounds like it'd be fitting for a springtime area. Don't think it quite embodies any of her desire to get Team Star to disband, which is like her entire character. Though, to be fair, I don't quite recall the context in which this theme plays. Perhaps that's when you wrap up her plotline. This theme also lacks any leitmotif which is reused in her battle theme, as far as I can tell at least. Arvin and Mabostiff's theme is another quite relaxing piece that feels like it tries to capture childhood innocence and the purity of the bond between this boy and his dog. His battle theme, I honestly don't know how exactly to describe it, but I quite enjoy it. The Titan Pokemon battle theme I'm personally not quite as big on. It reminds me of the Breath of the Wild Talus battle theme where there's particular parts of it that are really good, but the rest are just pretty typical and blend together. Another leitmotif use though, I gotta give it brownie points for that. Nimona's theme does work quite well for what it's supposed to represent in this game. The upbeat and kind rival who just wants to have you see your adventure through and truly challenge her. Her battle theme is a pretty typical Pokemon rival battle theme, which means that, yeah, it's pretty nice. But it's definitely not going to stand out amongst the series.
The Academy Ace Tournament theme is a typical Pokemon post-game hopeful fun main battle theme. It does what it needs to. It's a fun time. For the gym lobby theme, Pokemon continues to reuse the same general tune, the same light motif, for its gym lobbies it's been doing across the series. This means that the tune in new titles needs to take a different enough approach to set itself apart, which I feel this does. This is a style of the theme we haven't heard before, and I quite enjoy it. Ayano's livestream theme is incredibly annoying and obnoxious, exactly like it should be. Perfection. What's even better is it only gets more annoying. This stupid theme has had to remain stuck in my head ever since last December, and any time I go through that part of my playthrough in editing, it suddenly comes back into my head like some sort of PTSD flashback. So now you need to be subject to it too, screw you. I guess I wasn't paying enough attention while playing the game, but on listening back to it, this is a bit of a slapper, yeah. The general gym battle theme, I do like how it adapts as it goes on. As you continue to knock out the gym leader's Pokemon, the theme adapts and changes. That's really cool. Unfortunately, the music loop is really short, which means if you're stuck on one Pokemon for a good while, yeah, you're just hearing this loop over and over again, and it gets annoying. If you don't believe me, here, you just listen to it for a while. Some of the loops are luckily a bit longer, but still, remaining stuck on one Pokemon for a while, it's not great. 
Adapting music in video games can be really cool when done well, but I'm really not a big fan of this one. I think this is probably one of my least favorite gym leader battle themes, which doesn't mean it's bad, gym leader battle themes consistently slap, and I do think this is a pretty alright theme, but it's just not quite as much of a slapper as the others. I think I would have honestly preferred one of the styles of here's one theme throughout the whole gym leader battle until it becomes this more intense tune right at the end for their final Pokemon. I do think trying to have a slightly different version of the same theme for every single gym leader Pokemon is a really cool idea, but it means you're putting your eggs in too many baskets. Not every one of them was able to get the same amount of attention, and some are condemned to very short loops that can drag on. So cool idea, I'd love to see it explored in a way in future games where each part of the theme gets a lot more attention, but if that can't happen, I'd prefer one theme that only becomes something different for the final Pokemon. The Pokemon League interview theme, I'm going to be honest, I'm not entirely certain what I'm supposed to feel here. The Elite Four theme. It's a pretty typical Pokemon Elite Four battle theme. Nothing more, nothing less in my opinion. First off about the champion battle theme, whoa, they used the tune! The rest of the theme remains as a pretty epic and climactic theme. A bit more electronic than I prefer, but still a slapper. And some of those solos, absolutely amazing. New Champion is a rather hopeful tune, and an excellent use of Nimona's light motif. And with the use of similar instruments that we've heard in context like the main theme, helps to give a familiar feel to this tune.
The Team Star Grunt battle theme makes me mad. Because the theme is so good, but you only hear it once per base. You battle some random grunt in front of the base each time, and that's pretty much it. And there's a different theme for the raids, and then a different theme for the boss battle. So you only hear this theme a small handful of times in the whole game, and that's it. And it's a theme that goes hard. I love this theme, and I want more of it. This has got to be up there with my favorites in terms of best Pokemon Evil Grunt Battle themes, right up there somewhere with the Black and White Team Plasma Grunt Battle theme. The Team Star Raid theme follows the same general tune as the Team Star Grunt theme, but the use of that tune is just so... alright to me, while the Team Star Grunt theme using it is just so good. When it finds its own identity later on in the theme, though, it does get pretty cool. Team Star boss theme, I think it's pretty good, but honestly, I prefer the Team Star Grunt theme even more.
Team Star flashback was a niche enough theme that I didn't think it would warrant talking about it. Nope, I want to bring this one up, because it still has the punky kind of feel, but it's also so much more reflective in nature. It honestly nailed what it aimed to be. This feels like a theme that would play in a Phoenix Wright game when all the pieces come together and reveal how the victim was truly murdered, probably by somebody who didn't mean to but covered it up and tried to pin the blame elsewhere. Director Clavel's battle theme, I'm not exactly a big fan of the intro of, like, what exactly am I supposed to feel here? But then, it has a great use of the Academy leitmotif. And then follows it with a more calm, epic battle type theme I'm rather fond of. From there, it turns into another of the main leitmotifs from the game. So honestly, I'm pretty meh on one third, but the other two thirds I think is pretty great. Penny's battle theme is certainly one of the most popular battle themes of the game. And I realize this will be an unpopular take, but I'm really not a big fan of it for one key reason. Balancing. In a piece of music with multiple elements, you should typically have the foreground taking precedence, be the thing the listener can most clearly hear, while the background elements are quieter and serve to complement the foreground. To further accentuate this, you can even use different instruments for these different elements to make it clear where the listener's attention is supposed to be. Take, for example, Zinnia's battle theme, which uses many musical elements at once, yet it's clear throughout that the main focus is meant to be on the violin. It takes priority over the other elements, it's the main focus, and the background elements don't interfere in it, but rather complement it. You can even change what the main focus instrument is throughout the track. Take, for example, the Smash Ultimate remix of Zinnia's theme, which begins with focus on the electric guitar, before becoming a mix of guitar and violin, becoming solo violin, and then returning to the two. The track eases us into the next main focus, all while the background never interferes.
In Penny's battle theme, however, the different elements aren't very distinct from one another, instead all just being the same type of electronic-y noise. And the separation between foreground and background isn't quite as distinct, which results in it blurring together to an extent, which doesn't let me appreciate the foreground as much as I otherwise would. Take for example the Family Jewels cover of this theme, which does feature a more distinct separation between foreground and background, and each being different types of sound as opposed to both background and foreground just being electronic -y noise. I actually heard this cover before I ever heard the in-game theme, and I really thought it was spectacular. So when I heard the in-game version, I honestly feel like I never would have seen this theme as anything all that amazing if this was the version I heard first. Because rather than being able to focus on a foreground and have a background that complements it well, everything just blurs together as generic electronic noise. For example, whenever I'm editing a video, I make sure to have my voice be clearly louder than the music, because my voice is where the listening focus typically should be, whereas the music in the background is just something to complement it, not blur together with it. So I would never realistically do something like this in a video, because I want to have distinct foreground and background so it's easy to focus on where the attention should be, instead of having my elements blend together. I didn't bring this up during the Team Star Grunt battle theme, because I feel like the elements were a lot more distinct in that theme, despite it having a similar tone. I'm also someone who will always prefer real instruments to electronic sounds. I figure, why wouldn't you use real instruments at that point? I'm really not all that big a fan of electronic boops and bops. We once had to use it in video games due to the limits of technology, but we don't have that limit now. Yes, hello! I was wondering if you could play that song again. Hmm, which one, man? The one that goes... No, man, you're thinking of... It's a rather short theme, but Penny and Team Star is such a relaxing theme, and an excellent use of the violin, one of my favorite instruments. Team Star Disband theme has an aspect of sadness to it but it's far overshadowed by a greater theme of hope to carve a better path going forward. And look, there's a light motif. The Treasures of Ruin battle theme. Not the biggest fan of it personally, but it's alrighty.
The Area Zero theme has aspects of grandness, mysteriousness. There's some great threat here, as well as an aspect of sadness, and I think it's pretty well done. The raid battle theme intro, and some later parts of the theme, actually use the Area Zero motif, interestingly enough, creating a clear association between the terrestrialization phenomena and the place it originated from. Confronting the Professor to me feels like a mix of epic and reflective, which I think is pretty neat and fitting for the situation. Then, in the Zero Lab, we hear that same leitmotif, and turn it into a more intense battle theme. It also takes a tune from the raid battle theme, telling you through the music that this is the ultimate culmination of terrestrialization.
The Koridon Miraidon battle theme is an excellent use of the main light motif right at the end. In my opinion, the best final battle themes are the ones that deliver incredible payoff to a main theme that exists throughout the adventure, because at that point, you've earned the payoff, and now means something to the player, because you've made it mean something throughout the adventure. It's not just some lazy approach like including a theme in a trailer, calling it your main theme even though it barely exists in the game, and then include it in the final battle like it achieves some massive payoff. I'm looking at you, Breath of the Wild. This is a great example of how to have awesome payoff at the end by having a theme that's present throughout the journey. The credits theme, Celestial, is how to speedrun getting demonetized 101, so here's a different cover of it instead. I honestly don't really know anything about Shirinar's music, blasphemous I know, but this song I honestly think is really good. What's strange about it though is that the lyrics feel like they represent my version of the story much better, because the song is all about treasuring what you have, and while one goes through pain, that's a normal experience and together with one another we'll find magic in the smallest things and get through. The story actually in the game on the other hand, instead teaches you that the love and break part of the lyrics can have the break part completely eliminated from the equation with the power of magical weed bullshit. Can't believe I'm doing a Sheeran song review on my channel, but here's a quick analysis of the lyrics and how it actually fits my story really well. <laughs> These lines tell us that life is unpredictable, it could go either way no way to know. But that's alright, it's a normal part of life to experience that all. Unfortunately, when things don't really go your way, when you're going down, you can get stuck. You can feel hopeless. We drown in the regret of the path we found ourselves going down. But with one another, we can get through. Be there for one another living in the present. It can be easy to get stuck when you're down bad. Feel like things are hopeless when the way things went weren't what you wanted. But there's light shining through the rain. Things are never completely bleak and hopeless. You need to be able to take the good in the bad, be able to still see the good in life when things are down. Rather than being some piece about we're going to become something greater or anything of the such, this piece takes a different approach. One of the lines that stands out to me the most is, we were made to be nothing more than this, which might sound bleak and depressing at first, but instead it's hopeful. It tells us to appreciate what we have, what's here in the present, rather than drowning in one's regrets and devoting oneself to the possibilities of the past rather than living in the now with those important to you. Live life in the now, making every day count. Make tonight go on and on and on and find magic in all the smallest things. And this is a song about how life can go in all sorts of ways and will both love and break. And when breaking, it's easy to get stuck when the world's too loud, when you're going down and in a hard place but there's always light shining through. It's important not to get lost in the bleakness and regret, not to forget to live life in the now and make the most of what we have. That's straight up the main lesson of my story rewrite. All in all, I do think it is a really good credits theme with a meaningful lesson behind it, just one that feels rather misplaced for the story that was actually in the game. As a whole, the soundtrack of this game is really good, and it has to be one of the best examples of leitmotif use I've seen in a video game in a long time, especially with the distinction between the four main sections of the world each having their own recurring tune, 
that's really cool. There were definitely a lot of themes within this game that were just pretty par for the course for a Pokemon soundtrack, which still means that they're good, but aren't really going to set themselves apart all that much compared to the rest of the series. There were definitely quite a number of tracks within the OST that were really, really good though, and I quite enjoyed. So I didn't think the soundtrack was perfect by any means, but it was really good, yeah. Unfortunately, the same can't exactly be said for the graphics, performance, and glitches. Can you believe we've come this far into the video essay without even talking about the graphics, performance, and glitches? The thing that many say is the only issue with this game? There is a lot I'd like to delve into with this chapter. But first, I'd like to share with you a graphics and performance comparison compilation I made. Comparisons will only be made to games on equivalent or worse hardware. A lot of these will be delved into in more detail in this chapter, but first, let's get on the same page here.
there's a lot to unpack here, so where exactly to begin? How about the general world itself? As you saw during the compilation, it's certainly in a bit of a rough spot compared to other games on similar or worse hardware. Looking closer at the world of Scarlet and Violet itself, I honestly can't help but feel like so much of this world looks like crumpled up paper that would set the scene perfectly in a game like Paper Mario, but in any other game just looks completely out of place. Distant details the game has a difficult time with, often pulling up lakes and other details into strange triangles like this, and a lot of the time major sections of the world just won't exist at all as we'll discuss again when we get to the glitches. This game really struggles to run with its open world it made, yet we have Breath of the Wild running no problem, or as a more recent example, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 running no problem as well both titles with a far greater detail of graphical fidelity to their worlds. Or even going back seven years before the release of Scarlet and Violet, Xenoblade Chronicles X on the Wii U in 2015 looked like this, whereas Scarlet and Violet looks like this. The texturing work around the world is incredibly basic repeating textures that I was initially going to say look like they came out of a GameCube game, but that would be an insult to GameCube games like Metroid Prime. And Metroid Prime Remastered on the Switch is a great example of how to handle the texturing work around your world. Even parts that you'd think would be as simple as overlaying an image over it like the Team Star flags outside their bases came out looking worse than the paintings from 1996's Super Mario 64. Or looking back at Xenoblade Chronicles 3 again, even when close up the textures look much more realistic. In Scarlet and Violet, you need to find the nice middle ground to see the world. If you look at it from too far or too close, it'll look like somebody designed it in 2004's Rollercoaster Tycoon 3. Uh, actually, that might be an insult to that game too. The environments themselves in this game are pretty bland and basic as well. You would think in an open world Pokemon title that they'd seize the opportunity to create all sorts of diverse biomes. I don't think I ever saw a single forest in this game. There was Tag Tree Thicket, but it depends on if you'd classify the small clump of trees as a forest, per se. Even Sword and Shield tried to implement some more creative biome ideas we hadn't seen before. Scarlet and Violet is more of, here's a world of mostly path, rock, and beaches, and little sections of areas of other things. And as mentioned in the open world chapter, there's really not much to do in them. Combine that with the fact that the areas are so tiny, like if you want a forest to explore, here's tiny tag tree thicket, that it makes it feel like you're some child let loose in a tiny play area at a daycare, not a player exploring an organic and vast world. Hey, maybe they're all at that new playground over there. Playground! Learn away me young customers! Yes, Krabby Land! Where a kid can have fun! For the right price, I give you... If we were to find new areas to explore in games such as Xenoblade Chronicles X, here there's plenty to explore and collect and it has such a fascinating and visually appealing world that exploring is its own reward. Scarlet and Violet, on the other hand, want a desert? Here's a big open area with nothing but sand, some big rocks, and a buried tower. What an amazing thing that was to explore. Obviously, several areas have more to see in them than this, but really not by much. Of course, the developers want the players to think there's lots cool in this world, which is why they made things like the Ten Sites of Paldea, featuring amazing vistas such as the Empty Void and eventual DLC area. Probably shouldn't look at the region itself from up here anyway, knowing what the world looks like at a distance. A waterfall? A cave held up with pillars where the pillar texture is so different from the cave ceiling texture that they look like they're made out of completely different kinds of rock. Waterfalls on either side of the crumpled paper texture. A snow rock some rocks and water. The olive orchard that unfortunately was a bit too much to ask to have each field rendered. We decide to build a tower right under a waterfall. Also, yes, that's how waterfalls work. Distant buildings that look like they're rendered on the Nintendo 64 from here. 
and one of the game's 5 billion beaches. With such amazing sights to see, I'm sure the tourism industry in this region must be out of this world. But in my opinion, the thing that makes the world look the worst isn't the awful textures, the world not functioning properly, or even the questionable environmental details. The thing that paints the worst picture for this game is the lighting. It feels like you can't really grasp how important proper shadows and lighting are until they're taken away, and you realize just how empty and bare bones it makes everything feel, as if it's an early, unfinished version of the game. Sakurai puts it better than I can, so I'd like to play a clip from his video where he claims you should attempt not to draw the asset, but rather the light it reflects, as everything we see, if it is not emitting light itself, is reflecting light. まあ、これでもダメではないですが。まず光を意識する。色がついた光が差し込み、軍隊としての明暗をもたらす。スプレーを上から吹きかけ、明るくなりそうなところを意識するとか。そして、様々な要素から色相の落差をもたらす。光も乱発射するものだし。そして空気感を出す。単に空気遠近的な方向をかけるというわけではないのですが、世界の奥行きを感じられるようになってくると思います。え、日照方向に対し明るくフィルターをかけるなどの手法もありますが、これは素材単体
What is ha- Every time I'm moving the camera, it goes to shadow, and every time I stop moving the camera, it just... Well, well, I get to that Pokemon Center, I said- Wow, it's so ugly. Uh, oh my goodness, it's so ugly! Oh yeah, another funny glitch that I've seen with- Oh my goodness gracious that I've seen with this game. Apart from that, that's a different funny glitch there. Um, yo, it, it's critical! Whoa, wait, here he is, MC Sledge. What is happening to the lighting? Hope things are going well today. Ah. Ah. We'll be pretty cool. But we don't do cool things around here. What is happening with the lighting? What is going on with the shadow here? This Is it how shadows work? It, I'm so confused. Hi. Ah! <laughs> I don't think there was a single area in the game where the lighting truly felt atmospheric in any way. It may have seemed like a strange comparison at face value in that compilation to Live Alive, an HG2D remake in the style of Octopath Traveler of the 1994 original. But one of the most amazing things about the HG2D games in my opinion, is the incredible use of lighting and setting the atmosphere. In the compilation, I use this scene where Arvin is confused about why all the lights are off, while there continues to be myriad lights on in the background, and there's still plenty enough light to see what's going on here. It's only after Penny turns on the main lights that it becomes clear. Oh, so that's the normal brightness of this room. In the Live Alive Far Future chapter, something I actually have a video essay on interestingly enough, you play as this little robot on a spaceship where the crew are gradually being killed off by unknown means, and a dangerous creature the ship was carrying as cargo has been released onto the ship, which hunts you down like the SAX from Metroid Fusion. The main power is off. All that seems to remain are these backup lights, which gives just enough illumination to tell you where you're going, but setting a mysterious tone, especially as you know this creature could lunge at you from the shadows at any moment. Despite one game being full 3D, and the other being 2D with the HD2D style of these titles, the latter has a much stronger handle on its lighting and atmosphere. Let's talk about some more specific world details. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet uses this technique where distant numerous objects such as trees become simple PNGs to save on processing power. This is actually a pretty standard technique, even Breath of the Wild used this. The difference is that Breath of the Wild, you typically aren't going to be able to tell those are PNGs without looking really close, and that's what you want to keep in mind when using this technique, not having it be noticeable at face value. In Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, however, it's pretty evident whenever you're looking at a PNG tree, which looks like it's an asset they've had around since Colosseum in 2003 or something. Or take the water in the Fairy Team Star base. It's like a massive puddle on a steep incline, which has an animation to appear as if it's flowing down. Except the amount of water here is staying exactly the same. Where is this water coming from? Am I meant to presume there's an infinite supply of water spawning at the top at all times, and an infinite void deleting all the water at the bottom? Wait, how does the water work like this? Like, why are these, like, puddles that are sticking around if it's constantly streaming down? Wait, is this a lake or a river? It's... This... Huh? Oh, look how slow the game is running. This is not how water works! This is not remotely how water works. Uh huh? I'm so confused right now. And as for how the layout of interactable things in the world was laid out, it doesn't at all feel natural. It feels like it was slapped together quickly in a panic without any regard for how realistic it really is. For example, uh, oh, uh, hold on a second. It seems like we're cutting to a quick commercial break. Trainers. Which one of these video games was unable to render a character on a TV screen? Looking for the perfect gift to get for whatever the closest holiday coming up is? Look no further than Delibird Presents. Delibird Presents has all your needs and wants to absolutely destroy your loved ones this season. We've heard your concerns about difficulty getting in because of how popular we are, which is why we decide to open a second Delibird Presents right next to the original. So come on down to Delibird Presents in Mesa Goza. Or that Deli Bird Presence in Mesa Goza. Or that Deli Bird Presence in Mesa Goza. Or maybe even another Deli Bird Presence in Mesa Goza we don't even know about ourselves yet. It doesn't matter. Just come on down to Mesa Goza and shop at Deli Bird Presence. 
Like any store in this region, when you're done shopping, we'll kick you out, asshole. So, we heard that Delibird Presence is opening in multiple locations, but they're not the only ones. We know how to open in multiple locations as well. Come on down to Go For Broke Grill. We were genuinely willing to open two locations directly next to one another. So, Go For Broke at one of our two neighboring Go For Broke Grills. Fuck you, Mesa Goza! You really think that opening two locations directly next to one another is a big deal? Not anymore when Seafood Fresco steps up to the plate, because we're opening not one, not two, but three establishments right next to one another. We are so far in the red after this investment, so you better come by and get us out of this sea pickle. Seafood Fresco. Looking for some stylish wear to impress that rival of yours? Look no further than Rough and Tough. The place you know from our ads sells stylish jackets, pants, and shoes, which is why we sell none of those things. Rough and tough. False advertising since 2019. Use code I'm going to purchase despite the false advertising at the link below to get 0% off your first order. Okay, trainers, if you chose Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, you were right! Alright, sorry about that. I know nobody likes sponsored segments in YouTube videos. Where was I at again? Something about the details around the world not being all that realistic? Must have been imagining it. I don't think this game has anything like that. Let's move on to that trainer's choice. I realized the compilation at the beginning kind of spoiled the answer to that already. But yes, somehow, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet was unable to render a character on a TV screen. Something we've seen in the last generation. But more importantly, something we saw 20 years ago with Pokemon on the GameCube, no problem. And yet, it's a bit much of an ask for modern Pokemon. What Pokemon now does instead to cut down production time is place an image on the screen the characters start talking to. And whenever the game wants to show the professor's model actually moving, it does a fade transition to a smaller scene it loads with the professor in front of a simple image backdrop. When it wants to show our other characters again, it fades, switches back to the original scene, and the professor is back to a static image on the screen. I cannot emphasize enough, how is this something that was being done 20 years ago by a small team that didn't even know what Pokemon was before working on this game, and yet it cannot be done today? I'm genuinely surprised that the fact that we talked to a picture in this game isn't something that more people brought attention to. Did more people genuinely not think that was strange during their playthrough? Let's talk about the NPCs of this world. First of all, the details on the main characters is really high. You can see the stitches on clothing on characters, and their overall designs are honestly really good. But it confuses me because I don't understand why there's such a disparity between the human models and the rest of the world. Huh? Oh, it seems as if inspiration is stuck. pencil! <laughs> 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 What's this? My pencil! <laughs> as for the general NPCs around the world, as always, the trainers waiting to battle stand around doing nothing like emotionless robots. I was mentioning during the first session that I was a little bit worried about Pokemon in this game just feeling like they were deliberately placed around for you instead of, you know, existing in their environment in a natural way. And, well, I still seem to be quite concerned about that in terms of the Pokemon, but now I'm also concerned about that in terms of the trainers! There'll be random people like a ra waitress just freaking in the middle of a random field in the middle of a motherfucking nowhere. Just why? You know. So it doesn't really feel like I'm genuinely in what I would imagine the Pokemon world would be, you know, that this game would hopefully be able to achieve. It doesn't feel like I'm in a real world that exists the way that you think it would. It just feels like, here's a really ugly looking land, here's a whole bunch of things that we're just placing in it for you. Like, it doesn't feel like that's where they'd naturally be, you know? It just feels like spots the developers are like, yeah, that seems like a good place to put that. So, I can't exactly say that this game is all that immersive at this point because of that. What, you know, Pokemon going open world, you'd hope that it would be pretty immersive. But nah. 
put a random waitress out in the middle of some field because screw it. NPCs walk around with simple animations that look like someone shit their pants. They tried to make the professor seem more robotic compared to other NPCs around the world, but it was a bit of a tall ask considering how robotic everyone is in modern Pokemon games. I'll even reuse the same shitpost I did in the Legends Arceus essay, for example. <laughs> Any characters that move have very simple routes or loops, and have zero reaction to anything happening in the world around them. We really are living in the Matrix. And when the game is deciding whether to put an NPC on this preset route, it doesn't seem to have any checks to see if one is already on that route, or has traveled a certain distance on it first, which made it not uncommon to see NPCs merge together. Cause you and me, we're like brothers, only closer. Okay, I realize I've used a lot of Spongebob memes, but it is genuinely the first thing that comes to mind for me. Whenever you're in a major battle, such as against a gym leader, the NPCs on the outskirts will do basic cheering loops, which they continue with to cheer at nothing even after the battle is done. One of the NPC animations they decide they wanted is one where they will sway their torso slightly left and right as they cheer. So how did they achieve this? Why by tilting the entire model back and forth obviously. Facial details on NPCs completely tank when at decent distance from them which becomes very evident for the cheering NPCs who often look like they were taken straight out of some horror game. Quite frankly, they're rather disturbing. There's usually not much reason to talk to NPCs in this game, and even if you try, you probably won't even be able to if there's a Pokemon nearby. I assume that means that there's someone that gives something? Is what you're saying? Really? Well, your head's going through my legendary. What? Oh, it's a Grumpig. I don't... Let's look at your cock! The NPC variety is very shallow. This game frequently uses the exact same models right next to one another. At least Legends Arceus when it used the same models right next to one another, they changed the skin tone to try and sell it a little bit better. Scarlet and Violet doesn't even do that though. The NPCs don't even work properly a lot of the time, such as when I faced the Alphornada Gym Challenge, and this group of NPCs were just breathing down my neck with emotionless expressions as if I was the one girl who showed up to a Smash Bros tournament. Oh, and we also can't forget that my opponent seems to have fallen asleep partway through the battle. Not the opposing Pokemon, but the opposing trainer, which, I mean, fair. I almost fell asleep while trying to play this tech demo sometimes too. This battle scene also seemed to feature the NPCs going back to their default stance shortly before the game faded through black at the end of the battle. I get you now. Oh, I'm despawning. What? Oh, okay. Yep. And anytime this game needs a character to do a slightly more difficult to program animation, it's going to fade through black. That animation wasn't in the budget, I guess. It's put on the consumer to fork it up with their imagination. The NPC animations overall are very simple and robotic. It really doesn't flow, giving the NPCs of this world a very soulless feel. Your soul is mine. <laughs> the example comparison I used in the compilation was to Fire Emblem Engage, a title that released just two months after Scarlet and Violet. Fire Emblem Engage has a lot of cutscenes that use simple animation presets. They need to considering how many support conversations are in this game, which typically comes down to just two characters talking to each other. But rather than boring, lifeless movements for these simple chats, the animation presets that were created really flow, feel like movement how a human would move as opposed to very stiff and rigid movements that only move the parts of the body absolutely required for this movement. Engage has the characters move their entire bodies with their movements, making them quite vivid and full of life. Once you've been playing the game for a while, you begin to pick up on the different types of animations. Like, oh, it's that animation they're using for this line that I've seen many times already. But to me at least, it doesn't feel like it gets repetitive because of how much the characters flow through their movements. Take another example, the Xenoblade Chronicles games are incredibly cutscene heavy, which means that not every cutscene can be the insane cinematic scene in trailers, though the games do still have a lot of those. But for the majority of cutscenes, encompassing the less important scenes, 
The game uses simpler cutscenes that use animation presets, which can result in more rigid movement by comparison to the higher quality scenes, but still not anything jarring. The characters' expressions still hold enough emotion to get a good grasp of what they're feeling, but most importantly I'd argue for the Xenoblade comparison, these lesser cutscenes still feature the camera moving in interesting ways, drawing the viewer's attention to different things throughout the scene and keeping things interesting as opposed to Scarlet and Violet, where your attention in any given cutscene is going to largely remain on one thing, and the game only seems to know how to do three types of camera shot for the most part. Far out enough to encompass all the characters are one character who's the focus of the shot, behind the trainer to show the more distant gym leader, and from the feet up. It doesn't exactly make for very interesting cutscenes. Now about that render distance and pop-in. It really feels like you need to be within a few meters of a Pokemon for them to pop into existence in most instances. Constantly as you move around, Pokemon will be spawning around you, giving you a very short window to react to and navigate around them. To save on processing power, the Pokemon's detail completely tanks if you're not immediately next to them. So that's probably the play. Oh my goodness, the Polygon's on you. Ugh. Spherical? Polygonal. Spherical, polygonal, spherical, polygonal. Modern Pokemon optimization in a nutshell. For example, take Facing Boots' Torkoal. Up close, you've got this super high detail Torkoal, but from the normal battle camera angle, here's this N64 looking Torkoal. The game actually takes one frame after switching camera angles before it renders the high poly Torkoal which means that we can actually see the low-poly Torkoal up close. It looks like this. Here's the normal Torkoal. Here's the low-poly Torkoal, which again, all we need to get the low-poly Torkoal to appear is just be this far away, not super far. And the developers would know for sure that a battle will be happening here with exactly this distance that results in low-poly Torkoal being rendered here. It's not like finding some Torkoal out in the wild, where it's like, oh yeah, I guess by unexpected circumstances, here's low poly Torkoal being rendered. No, this is something where you know for sure that this is something that the player is going to be seeing. My goodness, those legs, the cylinders, they're not even cylinders. You can count like the straight sides that make them up. I also love how <laughs> this goes from uh, six sides to four. But from a distance, I guess they hope that it'll still look like six. The textures on a lot of the Pokemon are actually pretty not half bad. I'm surprised that those stay completely the same, while the model itself changes from this actually pretty good looking Torkoal to whatever this abomination is. And it's not just the Pokemon. The quality of a lot else in the world drastically drops with a little bit of distance to the point that a lot of the world even changes form as you get close. What is happening to that pond? It just like changes form. Now, for the Pokemon behavior themselves. As a kiddo playing Pokemon, I would sometimes watch the anime and think to myself, wow, how crazy would it be if this was the type of game I was playing, where Pokemon actually exist out in the world and I seek them out can't wait for the day that technology exists. Was an exciting thought, traversing a Pokemon region filled with all kinds of environments and biomes in which you'd need to actually seek out Pokemon existing naturally in their habitats. Well, we now have the technology to make that real, but what we got instead is here's Pokemon constantly spawning in around you, often in big groups that don't even make sense, and their behaviors seem to consist of wander aimlessly, run, and wander towards the player. Oh, and it seems like we didn't learn much from Legends Arceus considering Pokemon once again have no reaction to being fully submerged in water and treat it no differently than being on land. The Pokemon do not remotely get me immersed in this world. They feel like incredibly simple AI agents who exist only for the player to battle and catch if they want, not beings truly living in this world. Here's what I would have done. I would have placed the Pokemon on navigation meshes that are dependent on their species slash evolution line. For example, the Spinarak might only have a very limited area it can trek out of the forest because it's most comfortable there. The pack of Mabostiff, however, has a wider area the AI is allowed to travel to. 
And while the spin rack is alright venturing out on its own, the Mabostiff is programmed to prefer traveling in packs. Each Pokemon has a schedule that gets generated for them on spawning, which is influenced by their species. For example, a Hoot Hoot may seek shelter in trees during the day and go foraging during the night. If unexpected conditions arise, such as a player being spotted, change the behavior based on species. Some may change nothing, others may attack the player, others may run off. A simple version of that is already implemented in the game. Unexpected conditions could also be changes in weather, such as rain, where many Pokemon may now seek shelter, and perhaps after the rain is cleared you'd see a resurgence of more Pokemon, and perhaps Pokemon like Orthworm begin to come out. The rough schedules the Pokemon follow are based around objectives they need to fulfill, such as acquire food and water, and shelter when it is needed. And I would have more places in the world that could act as Pokemon shelters when they need rest, or to take cover from the elements. This is how I would have handled the Pokemon, to have them act as agents in the world, and the world too changing their behavior in turn, as opposed to just popping in and wandering around aimlessly like the laziest approach they could have possibly taken. To combine the discussion of the lifelessness of the human NPCs and the Pokemon, we see this in full force with the Team Star base raids. The idea of bringing several of your own Pokemon out at once to go all out with this powerful foe who is doing the same, that's really cool and something I would have loved to experience. Unfortunately, what we got was... Team Star says they're going to go all out, but if you don't do anything, they don't either. Team Star just cheers with their simple animation loops, and like all the other NPCs, have no reaction to anything that happens in the world around them. The Pokemon will either wander aimlessly, just like any wild Pokemon in the world, or sit around and make threatening noises at you. The Team Star trainers don't even throw the Pokeballs. I guess a throwing animation was a bit much of an ask as well. Sometimes the Pokeballs spawn near-ish the trainers to make it seem like the trainers threw them if you weren't paying attention, but sometimes it'll just happen in completely open areas. If somebody told me to imagine the simplest possible version of what this minigame could be like, well, the one already in the game is it. The frame rate and performance. I suppose you could say the game does indeed run on the Switch, but that's about all it has going for it. The performance is terrible. Anytime the game does a fade transition, it will lag and drop frames. As we discussed in gameplay, if you so much as jump with Coridon, that's going to slow the game down a bit. The game speed is tied to the frame rate, so if the game begins to lag, you're going to be going really slowly. This would make things quite a slog to get through in particularly laggy areas, such as Team Star Raids. The frame rate. The game is running so slow right now, holy crap. The frame rate of anything which isn't immediately next to you is going to be almost non-existent, if it exists at all. Near-ish to these windmills, here's super low FPS windmills. Are those even turning? Oh my, are, wow. Okay. That one's not turning at all. That one's not turning at all. This one's moving at like one or two FPS and wow. Decently far from the windmills? Suppose that means they're not turning at all. Are those windmills even turning? Oh, they are. Just at like... One frame every 10 seconds, question mark? No, they're still not moving. How long do I have to look at them? I saw them turn briefly. Are they just not turning anymore? They can only be bothered to slightly turn like once every minute or something like that. Even major cutscenes have frame rate and lag issues. Take for example opening the lab at the bottom of area 0. This footage has not been edited, that's straight up the animation of it opening. We see the game continue to run at a lower frame rate as the other Coridon looks down, and it only gets back to normal speed once it roars. Being able to stick at 30 FPS is a bit of a struggle for this game. And I can't talk about the graphics and performance of this game without talking about the dev ball. It seems that during development, Game Freak needed to have some sort of object to assign models or behaviors it may need to access for that scene. And this is something I've done in my own games before, having objects, variables, and behaviors assigned to some invisible object out of bounds that I can access on this map if I need to. 
Unfortunately, Game Freak wasn't that smart, and decided to make their equivalent object both visible and inbounds, their object being a Pokeball, the Dev Ball as I call it. You'll often find the Dev Ball in the middle of doorways, or in the center of certain maps, and it will just continue to exist there through cutscenes. Arvin just brought his dog back from the brink of death? There's the Dev Ball. AI Sada is giving you exposition as you take the elevator down to the time machine? There's the Dev Ball. Everywhere I go, I see his face. Interestingly enough, the Dev Ball will always be the Pokeball type of whatever Pokemon is in your first slot. Meaning, if you switch a Pokemon in a different Pokeball to the first slot, the Dev Ball will update in real time. Don't know why they didn't set the opacity of this object to zero, or move it out of bounds, or both. Though, I believe they did several patches later. Speaking of patches, I played the first section of my playthrough without the day one patch to find out if it was another BDSP situation with some content locked behind it, and to find out if rumors I heard were true that there was no Elite Four battle music without it. It wasn't true. But I did find out that animations such as the stationary in water animation had to get patched in since staying still in water before that point resulted in the swimming animation playing on loop. The dev ball remained in the game for some time however, and was something reported by a lot of players. It seems I even got a much more tame version of it, being just a Pokeball. Some players had a Pokemon rather than a Pokeball, which could lead to some… interesting circumstances. If the leaving in of a developer Pokeball doesn't say this game was rushed, I don't know what does. Did they really not have a single playtester say, hey, what's with that Pokeball on the ground? Should he maybe get rid of it? The camera of this game, it's… not great. Very frequently it'll clip out of bounds. Even for trainer battles, you'd think the developers would be able to know exactly where this battle is going to take place and so they could take measures to prevent this. Perhaps it depends on player Pokemon size, but then just test with the largest and smallest Pokemon to make sure there's no out of bounds clipping. Even the Alphornada gym training battles which can only be at this one location in this exact way and that's it, still has the camera clip out of bounds. Oh my goodness, they look so lifeless, they look like they had their souls sucked out of them. Ah! <laughs> Throughout this game, you end up getting to see the wonders of Out of Bounds quite a bit. Did you see the latest Nintendo newsletter? Whoa, nice graphics! I'd like to get my hands on that game! You mean you haven't played it yet? We can play it on my Nintendo Entertainment System. Even when not clipping Out of Bounds, some camera angles and shots are very questionable at times. And when it comes to the camera, to save on processing power, the game will often unload entities that currently aren't in the camera shot, which can be NPCs, Pokemon, or even entire mountains or sections of the world. This would be fine and standard practice if it wasn't noticeable, but the game doesn't actually load them in until 1-2 to two frames after the camera has switched over to them. This can make for some really wacky shots if you pause at the right moment but during normal gameplay is going to result in these strange flashes that make you ask, what the heck was that? In the sense that you know something was different for a frame or two, but who knows what. <laughs> we shall see there, how's that- oh, did you just pop out of existence for a second? Some of these one frame differences are quite easy to pick up on. For example, whenever you attack an opposing Pokemon and the camera zooms in on them, your Pokemon will freeze off camera at the end of their animation and they only teleport back and resume their idle animation once the camera resets its position. There are some cases where it's not even a one frame difference. Things that should be in the shot just aren't for the duration of the shot, the most notable example being whenever your opponent terrestrializes. The entire rest of the battlefield despawns, except for the trainer throwing the Terra Orb. You're gone, your Pokemon is gone, even the target of the Terra Orb is gone. But all of the NPCs that make up the crowd are still there. I find this especially funny during the Elite Four battles where the other three Elite Four members just watch Hassel throw a Terra Orb at nothing. Which, by the way, this League room is super bland and basic. Same with the League interview room. I didn't know where to put that in so I'm putting it in here. Back to the one frame differences. This can also include the lighting. If the game needs this lighting for this shot, but this lighting for another shot, there will be one frame where the new shot uses the old shot's lighting. Much like this example, usually when you see stuff like this, it'll just be this 1-2 to two frame flash with no way to know what actually happened there. Which is why I'd like to go through some of the particularly wacky ones I encountered while editing this video. 
Alright, so here's a weird one. So, in shots like this, if I go forward one frame, zoom out, next shot. But, but why though? It sticks around here for so long, for so many frames, and then right before it switches over, one frame of zoom out, and then next shot. Wh huh? For whatever reason, this just generally seems to be a thing with the gym leader battles. I don't know why, but for some reason, there's always the one frame of zoom out, and then cut. It's so weird. So, another bit of weirdness that I noticed while editing here. In the Bombardier battle, after you complete the first phase, and you get this scene right here, right before it starts eating the Herba Mystica, if we switch on over to right when it switches scenes, you still exist over here. Here, I can make it easier to see even by extending it out. Wah, like, DS a little bit. You still exist over here for, I believe, two frames. Yeah, two frames, and then you vanish. But your shadow still exists. They made the trainer invisible, but they left the shadow completely visible. So, <laughs> there's the shadow under each of your feet. I guess your body doesn't have a shadow. And your feet come together since you no longer need to be in that pose. So Bombardier begins eating something over here when you're right over here. And then when it switches over to the next shot, <laughs> if we go ahead and switch right here, there's your shadow still existing, you don't exist. One frame later, you exist. Arvid spawns over here in the middle of Bumblefuck Nowhere. I don't know where the heck he came from. This is a cliff over here. But he appears and he runs up and he's like, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> so, you know, what a, uh, what a perfect video game here, huh? All right, so this is another silly one. This is right as Arvin is pulling out his Terra Orb to terrestrialize his Mad Boss Tiff. So you'd think, you know, he'd put his hand kind of behind his back looking like it's going into a pocket. And then he pulls out the Terra Orb. Like, that's perfectly A-OK. -okay. So, you know, his hand goes off where you can't see it. And then he spawns the Terra Orb off camera so that it creates the illusion that he just grabbed it from his pocket. Only, that's not the case. It spawned from the get-go. So he's already holding the Terra Orb. And then he reaches into his pocket and pulls it out again. <laughs> what? Actually, you know what? We can make a fun mini game out of this. It's called How Many Visual Errors Can You Spot Within Five Seconds of Gameplay? Well, here's one where, you know, he does that. That was the first, and then immediately when he goes to throw the Terra Orb, this isn't exclusive to Arvin, this is whenever any opposing trainer throws their Terra Orb. Um, everyone on the field just despawns, so there's no bad boss stiff, there's none of my Pokemon, I'm not there either. Just Gonzo. So, then he throws it, it comes down, it's terrestrializing Mad Boss Stiff, and then, right as it's terrestrializing him, right as the crystal explodes, there's no hat on Mad Boss Stiff's head until it suddenly spawns in right there. It doesn't fade in. Like, Mad Boss Stiff, and this is, again, the same for any Pokemon that terrestrializes, not like it's exclusive to this, is glowing as if it's going to fade in like you'd see in, like, the anime. Nope, just sudden pop in. It just comes in like that, you know, <laughs> very, very suddenly. So, there's another one. Then there's the weird crystalline effects that are across the ground. Like, what is happening here? What is this? I'm genuinely so confused. So, Mad Boss Stiff is successfully terrestrialized, and then those weird visual effects. Well, here's the sky being all crazy and stuff. It kind of stops being crazy pretty soon, but this weird ground weirdness, that's just a single frame that it just snaps away. If, uh, yeah. Just a one frame difference here, if my video editor actually loads, there we go. The, the, sorry, these projects lag my computer a decent bit. We also can't forget that during terrestrialization, there's the weird thing that goes on with the horizon here, where it's like, here's the weird kind of terrestrialization sky, and then <laughs> a line that marks complete darkness underneath that. Because, yeah, that, uh, that seems reasonable. There's also whatever weird shadow effect is going on with those lines on the building, if you want to count that, too. Look, I get that when something is off camera, you can unload it. But you should ideally have it loaded back in before you switch the camera over to it, especially if it's an actual actor in your scene and not part of the environment. Switch shots here and there's no Arvin. Funnily enough, your trainer 
and Nimona, who you just barely see on the side here, are still fully loaded, but Arvin only comes in one frame later, which is very strange considering he's the focus of this scene. He's the one that's speaking, which means that he's the one that's most important to keep loaded in here, but he's the one that they decide to load, <laughs> unload, and just to load in like a frame after the camera shot switches. This isn't exclusive to this scene, like not even close, but it's just so strange considering you'd think that he would be the focus of the scene and therefore they'd have a higher priority on making sure that he's at the ready for that shot. But this kind of thing crops up with countless cutscenes in this game where you switch over and there'll be like a brief flash as it loads things in. Which is really strange considering a good handful of things always are already loaded and then a good handful of other things aren't loaded. Also, for a little bit of behind the scenes here, I cannot understate how much in this video I've needed to do extra little smidges of editing work to make my transitions a little bit smoother that the game itself couldn't be bothered to do. Like, this is the first frame of this shot. This is by default, like, where I'd start here because I'm using this clip, so I may as well use the very beginning of it so I have it go for, like, the most runtime potentially for however long I need to use it. Skip one frame in and there's a scarlet book. So it's like, okay, well, I go ahead and split it here and then I ripple delete. So now this is the new starting point. Cool. Now we're good, right? Nope. Go one more frame in and then her hand also corrects her position. So it's like, all right, split, ripple delete. This is the new starting point. Like, <laughs> so I have to go to extra effort in my video to make it look nicer that the developers couldn't bother to do in their game in the first place. What's also really strange is they have shown themselves capable of not having these weird one frame differences. Like the final cutscene, for example, where Coridon's here, here's the back of Arvin right there. And if we switch to one frame forward, all of a sudden, like, it looks fine. It looks perfectly fine. Coridon teleports over to where Coridon needs to be, Arvin is here. It works a-okay. I don't know why there's this strange inconsistency. It could be that this cutscene is just pre-rendered or something like that but it still seems really strange that there are cutscenes that just don't suffer from this issue at all. All right, this one's gotta be one of my new favorites. So cut over to here and it looks just fine. There isn't even anything on the immediate next frame that jumps in or anything like that. But if we advance this a little bit, bam, hair physics. This is how hair works. Yes, I agree. Yep, that, uh, that seems about normal. You know, as a, uh, as a long-haired guy myself, I can definitely assure you that that is actually how hair realistically works, so good on Game Freak for honestly nailing it. There's another kind of interesting one. So the moment that it switches over to the other shot from here, it's slanted, and then it comes in like that. It fixes itself shortly after. But there's one frame of it's tilted, and I was wondering why that was is because this camera shot is tilted. So on one frame, they change the camera shot, and then on the immediate next frame, they correct the camera shot tilt. I don't know why they wouldn't just do it all at once. I mean, this is why we need a Switch Pro, obviously. Apparently, some visual details, like the sandstorm effects, are only even loaded in where the camera shot is, not even just around the edges of it. Considering when this cuts over here, here's one frame of... Everything is just completely open. Heck, even a second frame of everything is just like this, and the player's already loaded in. And bam, there's Arvin, and there's the sandstorm that is now suddenly loaded in once the game managed to catch up a hot second later. So I noticed a brief flash while editing here, and usually that has to do with changing camera shots, and then here's like one frame or two where it needs to catch up and render everything that it needs to render. This is an instance where it's just like, huh, but why though? What? Yeah, what now? Is it just like an easier to render Pokeball or something that comes up because the white is covering that area as no, I I don't know what the heck this would be. What what is this? It lasts for a few frames and then it goes back to normal Pokeball. I I'm so confused by how this game functions. It is genuinely held together by duct tape. Sometimes when it cuts, it doesn't even render the main actor of the cutscene at first. There's no clavel there. Oh, there he is. Wow. It's funny how, uh, funny how that works. I guess handling six models at once when only five are being shown on screen is a little bit much to ask. 
What's especially confusing is sometimes there are these scenes where the character that it's going to primarily cut to is already in the shot, they're already loaded in, but when it cuts over, it despawns them. And in an instant, like it does it instantaneously, it's not like Arvin's there and then he despawns within the shot, and he's despawned for two frames before the game catches up and puts him back here again. But he should already be like that. I don't get it. Why would it despawn him? It doesn't make sense. Dude, what is this? So we cut to the next shot from here. Arvin and Penny are already on Coridon like they're supposed to be. Nimone is over here now for some reason. And then two frames later, she's here. What? <laughs> you know, I think I've come to the conclusion that anytime Arvin becomes the focus of the shot, his hair just needs to go crazy. Whoa, that's how hair works. I mean, that's totally what my hair does every time I come into focus as well. So like, I completely get it. Dude, I just can't with this game anymore. Look at this, we jump to the next shot. Seems fine. Next frame, still seems fine. Uh, now we're all looking up for one frame and now we're back to this. But why though? But why though? <laughs> Here was another pretty jarring one of in one of the beginning cutscenes of the game. It cuts over to the other shot and this is the lighting and then surprise, completely different lighting. For whatever reason there, I guess this is meant to be the lighting of this shot and there's my dog shaking over here. And this is the lingering lighting of the previous shot. I don't know why it wouldn't change exactly what it had to. I guess the game needs to catch up a little bit. Also, something that I want to emphasize with this is I've had comments on previous video essays that are telling me like, oh, you only noticed that because you're in editing and you're going frame by frame. You wouldn't notice it in like normally playing. I don't scan through frame by frame trying to find as many instances of this. Like if I wanted to find every single instance I could find of this, we'd be here all day on that alone. This is just the things that I discover by going through my footage and editing stuff. Like as I'm editing this part of chapter six here, I'm watching my footage and I see that flash and I'm like, what the, the heck is that? That's how these things crop up. That's how I have all these clips of them cropping up as I see weird flashes like that. I'm like, what, what the heck was that? What am I seeing? It's very jarring. It's not smooth. It. What's also really strange is there's a lot of one frame shots that just don't serve any purpose. Like take this shot here, immediate next frame, we're at this shot. Then we're here. Just a single frame of this angle here. But, you know, it's that for the most part. I guess you could argue that the one purpose of this shot is to change it from tilted camera angle back to straight camera angle so that this can immediately be straight. Because knowing how this game works, the alternative would be it comes into this shot, but it's tilted for one frame and then it corrects itself one frame later. So here, the developers decided, huh, instead of having it be tilted for one frame right beside Kofu, how about we just, for one frame, untilt it here, and then we get it great right off the bat at Kofu, even though this is even more jarring here, and ideally you wouldn't have either in your video game, but what do I know? Oh, wow. As it turns out, Arvin is far from the only one whose hair bugs out when the camera switches over to him. Yep, that's that's how hair works. <coughs> Even having COVID is not going to stop me from finding wacky stuff with this game. This one was really funny. Arvin jump scare. You know, I've mostly noticed weird one frame differences, but here's one that's a decent bit longer. So here's an entire section of this mountain just completely gone and someone, I don't know, barfed along the side of it and it's here for one, two, three, three frames. Oh, I guess that vending machine pops in as well right that same moment. <laughs> so there's a uh, three frame one on that. And so we finally get to the glitches proper. I'm not going to go through every glitch everyone's encountered in this game. We probably could have filled the total runtime up to this point if I did that. So let's go through all the ones that I encountered during my playthrough. Use my time as an example of roughly the amount of glitches you can expect on a casual playthrough. Note that some of these have been seen earlier in the video as they were brought up if they pertain to the topic at hand. 
The A button doesn't work sometimes when trying to pick up an item. The one frame differences. The camera clipping. Though those both are more of oversights and glitches per se. Picking up an item, just skipping a whole bunch of text. Pokemon becoming temporarily big or small. The game creating some borders on the screen that are either a solid color or flashing like crazy, which was especially common during terrestrialization. Day-night transitions sometimes just being a sudden cut instead. <laughs> Wait, is that actually how this game transitions to night? When Guardian Leviosa climbing just not really working. But luckily, you can use a different glitch to climb up anyway, as long as it isn't too steep. Clipping through the world. Terra Pokemon despawning when you get close, and other Pokemon too, but mostly the Wild Terra ones. Characters slightly floating in several scenes. It seems where the game counts as the ground isn't quite right. The game spawning you out of loading zones with the incorrect elevation, which results in you briefly falling on the other side. This happening the most often when you get kicked out of a shop. This elevator just having the most unnecessarily large trigger. Pokemon evolving sometimes results in flashes of all sorts of things all over the screen briefly, including the platform your Pokemon battles from in the water for some reason. You can fall infinitely. Some entities don't despawn when they should, like this random sun floor you can find who just continues sitting here depressed throughout the whole Brassius rematch. Hair glitching out. The terrestrialization hat not quite being at the right place. Say goodbye to sight, pseudo wudo. Hitboxes and hit detection not quite working properly. Surprise, motherfucker. Pokemon turning invisible. Items spawning in inaccessible locations. Of course, we can't forget the dev ball. Even the text lags at points. Only in a Pokemon game, huh? The lighting bugging the heck out. The weird shadowy effect that briefly comes up on people's faces. I call it the Morbius glitch because it looks like a visual effect that you'd see in Morbius before he morbs everywhere. Sometimes the music just stops working. Apparently it broke the game so much that the music just dipped out for a hot second. The NPCs the game refuses to let you interact with because it would rather have you interact with the Pokemon on the other side. Of course there was that NPC that fell asleep mid-battle too. NPCs being merged together. Yes, that's how water works. Pokemon being in walls. Pokemon spawning before they should. For whatever reason, this game seems to spawn Pokemon early before they're sent out. Which is fine in and of itself as long as you do it off camera rather than on camera. So for anyone who caught this little annotation earlier in the video, like, good on you, but yeah, that's a... Uh, why? <laughs> the horrendous poppin. The pawn to Narnia. I mean, to the beginning of the game. NPCs that spawn where they really shouldn't. NPCs that reset to default states far before they should. And whatever this is, Being pulled into another immediate battle right as one ended, sometimes in chains of battles. The horrendous render distance and flashiness of so many NPCs. The UI not quite working the way you'd think it would. The game inputting the throat button after evolutions for some reason. Pokemon existing fully submerged in water and treating it just like land. No hit detection on some Pokemon. And of course, let us not forget how prone this game is to crashes. Surprisingly enough, the game only crashed for me once during my playthrough, but it seems to be a pretty common occurrence. Not all of these were glitches. Several were just oversights and lazy development choices that's below standards of what you'd expect to see in a AAA game. And so, they'll get included in glitches anyway, because in pretty much any other game, they would be glitches. Still, about 50 different types of glitches encountered in one casual playthrough, many of which would occur over and over and over again. Also, one more glitch I wanted to mention. This glitch didn't happen to me, but rather a family member who told me about it. This game came with save data bonuses of the other mainline Pokemon Switch titles, being the Rodon phone cases. One of my family members told me that she redeemed one of the save file locked Rodon phone cases, and then shortly after, the game had crashed without having been saved losing a decent bit of progress. 
On going back to try to get the phone case again, however, the game told her that it had already been redeemed and could not be done a second time, despite the fact that it was no longer in her inventory. This makes it impossible to ever have that save file be a perfect 100%. This item is never obtainable again without using third-party cheating software we know Nintendo hates. I don't use this word lightly, but the state this game launched in is genuinely an embarrassment. These fish committed credit card fraud while their owner was away. On YouTuber Mutakimaru's channel stream, their fish are set up to play video games. However, when the game that was being played suddenly crashed, things quickly went south. The fish, no longer bound by the walls of Pokemon, began navigating the home screen. And before long, they were able to reveal Mutakimaru's credit card details on stream, while purchasing a number of items from the Nintendo eShop. I do wonder which game is glitchier. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, or the original Pokemon titles. Finally, a worthy opponent. Our battle will be legendary. I would hazard a guess that this game is either impossible or near impossible to beat glitchless, much like the original Pokemon titles. Sure, there are supposed glitchless runs of the game, but I wouldn't be so sure about that. I suppose you need to take liberties and say it's only glitchless in the sense of using no glitches that give you some advantage. Let's talk about the final tidbits affecting the player experience. The word sensor in this game doesn't seem like it was quite fully implemented. Some words it will censor as long as that combination of letters is present at all, but many others it will only censor if that word exists on its own, meaning if you have a character before or after it that isn't space, it's fair game. The year is 2022, well not anymore, but at the time the game released it was 2022, and the highest grossing media IP in the world still lacks any voice acting. Why? This is especially strange in scenes like when Penny asks Clive what's with the old geezer act to let the player know, oh Clive will change to his standard tone rather than the young and hip Clive tone somewhere during his dialogue without us realizing. Sure would have been nice to know that that was the way he was speaking if he actually spoke. But with the old geezer act, Clive, you're creeping me out. Oh. I had no idea that anything changed in his tone. For those who say that Pokemon doesn't need voice acting and it makes no difference, I challenge you to play your voice acted games from now on with the voice acting off and see if you really do get the same level of enjoyment. I'll even give you some examples so you can tell me if this is how you'd like to experience your games.
there is just no reason for such a massive IP to still be so behind the times. The Trainer Customizability Ever since X and Y, we've been able to customize our look with individual outfit pieces, giving all sorts of options to how our trainer looks. Scarlet and Violet decide to come along and say, We'll let you customize everything except for the jacket and pants. You can choose one of four school jackets and that's it. In the 10 years since Pokemon X and Y, Scarlet and Violet is the second least customizable mainline game to have trainer customization. The least is Bug Diamond and Shipped Pearly because it only had a handful of complete outfits you could go into. You couldn't change out individual pieces. And if we're counting every mainline title since X and Y, not just those with customizability, Scarlet and Violet has the third least customizability. Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire still takes the cake with none. But come on, even Let's Go let you customize your whole outfit. It feels so strange to force you into wearing the school uniform and making the game so school themed when you barely spend much time at the school. The school uniform should have been optional to wear to let the players customize their trainers a lot closer to what they want their trainers to look like. At least this school isn't livid about students who wear hats like the schools I grew up in were. And not only that, but by removing the option to wear a skirt, Scarlet and Violet takes away its long-standing female empowerment. Wait, what the f what does that even mean? It does what now? Okay, I, I don't think it does anything about female empowerment or whatever the heck some people are spouting, but it is really disappointing from a customization standpoint. However, there is one great aspect about trainer customizability, and that's that customization options such as hair are no longer gender locked. Finally, I can be a long haired guy in Pokemon, it's about time! This was one of the things in regard to customization I brought up in the Legends Arceus essay, and I thought I'd be hyped if the day ever came that these things were no longer gender locked, and it does definitely make me happy for there to be a step in the right direction, but I also can't get too excited about it, because the longest hair option isn't even that long, it's just barely past the shoulders. Look how long the long hair was in Sword and Shield. I guess they realized in this game longer hair means more prone to glitching like crazy, so they said screw it, there's no such thing as hair longer than this for the player, and even the longest ones after that don't even go past the shoulders. Maybe one day I'll be able to play a dude in a Pokemon game with hair as long as I have in real life, but that day is still a ways off it seems. Well, the aesthetics of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. We've done this multiple times at this point, so here's the short version again. One way by which to analyze games is the MDA framework, mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. Mechanics are the game mechanics, the rules, what's possible and how. Dynamics are what actually happens during play. So while everyone has the same mechanics, the dynamics may be completely different depending on what ends up happening and the player's own choices. Aesthetics is how it makes the player feel, it's the play experience. Is the game surfacing any emotions, are the players having fun, feeling tension or relief, so on. So, across this entire video essay thus far, how did Pokemon Scarlet and Violet make me feel as a player? Well, I think the best word to sum it up would just be disappointment. Pokemon was one of my childhood franchises, so to see it become the soulless husk it has, it's just incredibly sad. Also doesn't help matters that my other two big IPs growing up of Rollercoaster Tycoon and Sly Cooper also had their own downfalls, only theirs were so bad that they don't really put out new games anymore. Though I suppose Atari surprises us out of nowhere with unexpected crap they release sometimes. I love Pokemon. It's something that has been important to me for a long time, and I grew up playing it with close friends. But to see the series so dead set on this strict three year generation release cycle when they clearly can't do it at the same quality anymore, instead of taking however much time is needed to make a genuinely incredible product, it's just incredibly disappointing. I feel like had I not picked up this game to cover for the sake of this review, I would have felt completely ripped off. Heck, even knowing that I was picking it up because this is a review people were interested in seeing, I still feel ripped off. The aesthetics of the MDA framework refers more so to direct play experience rather than overall feelings towards the game as a whole, so let's get back on track and delve a bit more into that. The use of light motifs in the soundtrack gave me joy, it really was incredible use. Characters like Larry and Ayano would put a big smile on my face. It felt cool to have a legendary beast you rode on around the region. Terrestrialization strategies felt awesome to pull off, though the Ghost Gym was the only instance where I could pull something like that since changing Terra-type in the main game is easier said than done. 
the main human character models I thought were charming, and their animations during the higher quality cutscenes were quite visually appealing. A lot of the glitches were super funny to laugh at if they weren't hindering me. Sometimes the glitches would give me joy and laughter, though other times just disappointment. Some of the Pokemon emotes sometimes I thought could be cute. I think that's about it for my positive feelings in regards to this game. I felt bored exploring around a lot of the time just because there wasn't really anything to do. I felt tension during times I shouldn't have, namely in my efforts to avoid the plagues of Pokemon constantly spawning in around me if I didn't want to be dragged into random encounters and have my time wasted. I felt some excitement and tension at taking on some challenges early, but then it brought my boredom to new levels as I went back to do everything I missed. I felt underwhelmed by the story, with how much potential it had, but not exploring any of it. I felt stunned, shocked, and disappointed at the quality of this world, and how it pales in comparison to not only other games of this generation, but even games of previous generations. I feel like once I had taken on and won over my first challenge I was much under level 4, there wasn't anything left to do to give me a thrill again. I didn't have reason to continue playing anymore except for my series and for this review, and so I powered through despite my boredom. I had started my playthrough of Pokemon Colosseum towards the end of the Scarlet Violet main game coverage, and one of my complaints about Colosseum is how so much of the game is just battle after battle after battle without much in between a lot of the time and how I needed to face so many optional trainers if I wanted to have a fighting chance in the main story. So, that game started to drag on a bit for me as well. So, it got to the point that I decided in an effort to be less bored and more time efficient, I would play both games I was doing menial tasks in at the same time, facing countless trainers for the sake of grinding in Colosseum, and collecting stakes and trying to catch legendary Pokemon in Scarlet and Violet. So both playthrough series have parts in them that feature the other game. And you know, honestly, it worked. It was kind of fun balancing both at once, neither one of them fully engaging me, but together, balancing my attention back and forth, I got engaged. So what I mean to say is, Scarlet and Violet needs more to drive engagement, because that was something I lacked through a lot of the game, and I can say for certain, had I owned and played this game without being a content creator doing a series and review, there's no shot I would have been able to bring myself to beat this game. To sum up this chapter, the state of Scarlet and Violet is rough, to put it lightly. But how did we get to this point? Pokemon on the Switch has been no stranger to bad performance issues and glitches, though only really coming to the forefront in the last one year span of titles, BDSP to Scarlet and Violet. When Let's Go released, it was pretty fleshed out. The game ran smoothly, almost always seeming to work as intended. Its quality was perfectly fine. That game's biggest criticism stemmed from the fact that it just wasn't the game that most longtime fans wanted to play. Sword and Shield released, and I don't recall ever really running into much in the way of glitches or dips in performance. Its optimization is mostly fine. Visually, the big cities looked mostly fine. Certainly handled lighting much better than Scarlet and Violet. Only criticism here for me being that they're not really all that large. In terms of how these games performed, yeah, it was mostly fine. Apart from the Pokemon that I'd just be shrinking and growing Ant-Man style with a little bit of distance from them. Although it's leagues better than just popping in. The biggest criticisms consumers had for these titles was the dex cut first and foremost, which as I've calculated in previous video essays, it was more than possible to include every Pokemon on the current Sword and Shield cartridge sizes, which led me to the conclusion that the dex cut was done to drive revenue through Pokemon Home, which serves as a place you can put your Pokemon into, but can only take them out of if a title is made available with those Pokemon in it making it essentially glorified ransomware as they hold the right to delete your Pokemon at any time for any reason. Along with criticisms that animations, the supposed reason for the dex cut, were about as basic as you could imagine when they weren't just recycled, that the texture work and aspects of the graphics, another supposed reason for the dex cut, was severely lacking, that the region was a big straight line, the wild area was just a big open area of nothing, the multiplayer barely worked, the raid battles were a joke, and so on. These titles had their fair share of issues, but in terms of performance and glitches, they worked well enough. Then came Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, games leagues glitchier than their originals. Catching a Pokemon could banish you to the Shadow Realm. Walking Pokemon had no AI apart from move towards you and would often get stuck somewhere along the way, or even get you stuck somewhere. 
or result in all manner of weird interactions. And sometimes follow Pokemon would even get randomly disabled. You could crash the game in all myriad of ways. Teleporting between elevation levels was a thing that would happen sometimes. Visual glitches galore, like black bars appearing that would be indicative of playing the original games on emulator. Pokemon not being lined up with you. And countless other visual issues. Controls wouldn't work all that well sometimes. Sometimes controllers might not work at all. The rendering on the chibi model details was very questionable at times. These games barely functioned. And did we see these games get flack for their performance issues and glitches? Not all that much. Everyone was too hyper-focused on it being a tried and true Diamond and Pearl remake, which was a serious issue, but the optimization of these games wasn't really at the forefront of discussion. This was a game pumped out by a company who, while having helped with many video games, had never actually made a full video game before, and was probably under strict deadlines by the Pokemon company, and released an unfinished mess. And then we come to Legends Arceus, whose optimization was even worse. Pokeballs just wouldn't function sometimes. The hitboxes of anything that wasn't a Pokemon wouldn't work properly a lot of the time. Sometimes Pokemon would randomly go to the stratosphere, or even into a tree. Targeting was finicky and would often just not work. The way this game rendered things was very questionable. Cutscenes would frequently feature a character popping in on the edges of the screen, rather than spawning off-camera like anybody who's ever designed a cutscene before would likely do. You'd sometimes be floating above the ground you're supposedly on. Every tree that was on even the slightest incline would be floating because they were designed for perfectly level ground. The Pokeball Crosshair for the Featherball series wouldn't actually line up with its center point. A lot of this game would involve fighting with the camera. Fungus can fly. Fish can fly. I'm suddenly an angelic being. Sometimes the game just won't give you the quest the NPC clearly has an icon above their head to say they have a quest to give you. Lighting effects in this game barely worked and had very questionable design. Icons would bug out. Sometimes the UI might vanish completely. Sometimes the Pokemon might vanish completely. Or even just temporarily not have their hitbox. The way a battle would measure your distance to it to determine if you strayed too far from battle. Yeah, that didn't work either. Sometimes a mountain separation between two areas you can explore will be separated by an invisible wall above. Accuracy just doesn't work in this game. And yeah, I've gotten probably hundreds of comments telling me, um, actually, accuracy works just fine, it was just foggy weather in that clip, as they completely ignore the clips where I miss 100% accuracy moves in perfectly clear weather, so I don't want to hear it. The environment just doesn't at all act how you'd expect. <laughs> Why is the moon suddenly no longer full back there? It was just full a second ago, and that was the, uh, mission requirement, was a full moon, it's not even full during the cutscene. Quest progression just doesn't work sometimes. Quest tracking just doesn't work sometimes. Gosh darn it, I got debated. I went into like autopilot mode by going towards the quest marker and... The render distance of this game was a joke. Models just didn't work sometimes. Sometimes the turn tracker would straight up lie. Something else that I've been um actually on as well, despite the fact that no you're wrong. Bottles would sometimes have these weird white outlines around them. Pokemon had no reaction whatsoever to shallow water and would treat it exactly the same as land, as we mentioned earlier. I'm sure there's plenty I've missed, but there's at least the immediate things that come to mind from my playthrough. Alright, we've been through all of this before during the BDSP and Legends Arceus essays, so why am I drawing attention to it again here? Because while Scarlet and Violet do have a lot of performance and graphical issues as we've gone through, to the point I would argue it's the worst of the lot, it's not like it's anything new. Performance and optimization problems weren't really part of the general discussion of BDSP and Legends. BDSP, everyone was so focused on it being a faithful Diamond and Pearl remake. And Legends Arceus, everyone was so focused on, oh my goodness, it's a Pokemon game where you can explore around these areas like a worse version of home console games we were seeing over a decade ago. This is amazing! I'd argue, the performance issues have been getting worse with every entry on the Switch. How do we live in a timeline where friggin' Let's Go is the most fleshed out mainline Pokemon game on the Switch? But it's gotten 
really bad from BDSP until Scarlet and Violet. It makes me feel like the Pokemon company is progressively pushing the boundaries of how much of a buggy, unfinished mess they can pump out for easy earnings by nature of being Pokemon, seeing if there's any point where they might have to change their ways. If we keep getting less and less optimized with every game, I can totally see 20 years from now playing a Pokemon game that's just squares moving out of screen. The Pokemon company is testing the waters to see if there is any point where they need to stop. BDSP? There was backlash to some issues, but the performance wasn't really one of them, and the titles sold like crazy. Alright, time for the next step. Legends Arceus. Let's put out a beta version of our game and see what happens. What's this? Almost universal praise and selling like crazy? Alright, Scarlet and Violet are good to ship no matter what state they're in. So they put out their alpha version of Scarlet and Violet that feels like it's barely had the opportunity for testing, and now there's suddenly backlash for the performance and optimization. So maybe now we need to increase the quality a little bit. Not a lot, just back to the barely functional Legends Arceus levels. Or maybe not at all, because despite the criticism, it's still the most successful Nintendo launch ever. The point I'm trying to make here is that it shouldn't have gotten to this point in the first place, to take so many games before suddenly this means enough is enough, and not this, or this. Those are both perfectly fine. Do not touch that mushroom, you'll die! Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That one's perfectly fine. Scarlet and Violet are a buggy mess, but good thing we never saw any issues in the previous Pokemon games on the console. Scarlet and Violet are ugly. Why can't it be as gorgeous as Legends Arceus was? The player base needs to stop treating these issues like it's something that only came into question with the release of Scarlet and Violet. I always try to say in my video essays that everyone is free to enjoy what they enjoy and spend their money however they like. But to see games that take however many years they need to push their respective hardware to its limits and deliver the best experience they can, not even be able to hold a litwick to the incredible success of some of the worst optimized video games I have ever seen, with Scarlet and Violet probably being the second worst optimized game I've ever played, well, it makes me sad. So, here we are, over six hours later, and over half a year that I've been working on this project. My goodness. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. What a video game, huh? And that's not even all of it. More happened in the past seven months, so let's go through that all quickly. Game Freak released new forms of Suicune and Verizian, turning them into a Velociraptor and Robot respectively. Which, from what I could tell of online reactions I saw, it didn't seem like many people were all that enthused. These Pokemon would be available as a time-limited raid event. Unsurprisingly, at this point, many players found themselves unable to capture the legendaries, getting eggs instead, as if playing an old-school Pokemon game and you got the bad egg glitch. It would seem Pokemon released an event before it was functional, much like the games themselves. So, Pokemon put out an apology, and then claimed they'd release the event one more time later so that everyone would have a chance to catch the legendaries, the later rerun of which was actually only just recently. The February Pokemon Presents came and went, oh. uh, with the Pokemon company revealing the upcoming DLC. Well, sort of. They didn't show anything in-game for the DLC at all. They showed no gameplay footage, and still haven't to this day at the time of narrating this. Which means it's either in an incredibly poor state, or the Pokemon company figures consumers have probably realized by now that what they see in the trailers is what they're getting. Or both! They essentially showed two PNGs, asked, well, what do you think? And then immediately shoved it in the face of all players from this point onward. And by shoved in players' faces, I mean from this day onward, any time you open the menu, the DLC will be advertised to you, which you could click to be redirected to the store page where the DLC is listed at a marked up price. Look, I get it. Inflation plus the parent company is Nintendo who will gladly take additional revenue wherever they can get it. Recently, Nintendo's wanted to try out an increased price for games and DLC. Start easing people into it until it becomes the new norm, as Nintendo does with many other things. 
It makes sense that the first video game they pull this with is Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, one of their hardest hitters, their highly anticipated Breath of the Wild sequel that's been in development for the past 6 years. If there was any game to charge $10 more for, it would make the most sense to start out with that one. But Nintendo would want to start easing consumers into increased DLC cost as well, and at face value, Pokemon is an incredibly smart candidate. And these titles may not have been as good of candidates for the base cost increase, as they may miss out on double pack sales from those who'd change their mind about that, something that you wouldn't have to worry about with Zelda. Sword and Shield, despite being essentially the same game, made loads off of its DLC since the expansion pass was counted as two separate DLCs in the eShop, meaning if you owned both games and you wanted the DLC for both, you would need to buy the expansion pass twice, enough for a third copy of the game. So buy one game for the price of three, what a deal! And unsurprisingly, they've done the exact same thing yet again for Scarlet and Violet, making this an amazing candidate for the increased DLC price. The consumer has already bought the game at that point, potentially twice. It's not like the DLC situation would have influenced whether they bought the base game or not at this point. And as the highest grossing media IP, they knew before launch it was going to sell a lot of units. So let's plan for Pokemon's DLC to be where we start our increased DLC price, and Zelda to be where we start our increased base game price. To be fair, I don't know how much say Nintendo has over Pokemon compared to the Pokemon company. It could have been their own independent decision to increase the price of the DLC. But as I said, at face value, this was a very smart decision. But actually, in practice, it was a very bad decision. Reason being, the game having shipped the way it did, quickly becoming the lowest rated mainline Pokemon title in series history. It was so bad that Nintendo apologized over it and even offered refunds, though let's face it, the reason they did that was because they didn't want this abomination of a game giving their other video games a bad rep. Oh, I think you've got to... <laughs> what? Fuck! I'm on... Fuck off! I'm on live telly! Fuck off out of it! Get out of my office! I'm on fucking hell! Fuck off, you little twat! Sorry. Nintendo very rarely responds to things, never mind apologizes. I even looked into every time Nintendo's apologize I could find, which are as follows, and it actually turned out to be more than I would have expected. Some of these are because of aspects of games, such as the same-sex relationship situation with Tamodachi Life, but not a single one of these is because they released a game that was in such an unfinished and garbage state, making this, as far as I can tell, the only time Nintendo has ever apologized over the quality of a video game. That's a big deal. So for Nintendo to issue their only ever apology over the awful state of a game, and then charge extra for its DLC, there really is zero consumer respect from this company, especially towards Pokemon fans. If they think they can get away with charging even more for this DLC than their other ones, you can bet they'll try. It also seems that every time they push a patch to this game, there's a mystery box of glitches that get put in. This patch that included the ad for the marked up DLC actually saw many users' save data corrupted as punishment for going to the store page. You wanted to check out the DLC we advertised to you? Say goodbye to your save data! That seemed to be the most common cause of corrupted data after the patch, though users reported corrupted data for all myriad of reasons. Anytime a new patch came to this game, safest play is just don't touch the game for a week or two and hopefully the additional glitches they patched in will be sorted out by then. Speaking of patches, it's now been over half a year since the game launched, and there's still no home support. Home support and being able to transfer Pokemon? Let's face it at this point, with any new Pokemon game, home support will just be out whenever they can be bothered. In terms of Game Freak's handle on fixing the game, there have been patches every once in a while to the game since launch. The only big thing that they seem to have fixed is the game apparently doesn't crash as much anymore, at the cost of there's now less entities in the world. Huh? The game already rendered so few to begin with. They can't fix this game without nerfing it in the process, and they can barely cut back on it considering there's barely anything left to cut down. The render distance and pop-in is horrendous. If you're not immediately next to a Pokemon, its detail is going to look worse than Pokemon seen on the GameCube. 
the frame rate of anything not immediately next to you is going to barely exist. This game already uses almost every trick in the book to improve performance, just for it to almost run on the Nintendo Switch, because it's so poorly designed at its core. This game cannot be fixed without rebuilding it from the ground up. Game Freak knows this, plus they've got their hands full with a DLC since they refuse to budge on their release schedules. So, the patches they put out are all sorts of little fixes that are things that most players would have never run into, or easy fixes like setting the opacity of the dev ball to zero, even I could have done that, rather than tackling bigger game breaking issues, to give the illusion that they're working to fix this game, that you should keep playing it because fixes are on the way, so you might still be interested in playing by the time the DLC drops. And any players thinking about picking it up should still consider doing so because it's being fixed! Games like Cyberpunk were able to make a bit of a comeback because they did put in the years necessary to fix themselves, although a bit too little too late since it had already lost most of its player base. But at least it is a functional video game nowadays from what I hear. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet is so broken to its core, the big issues are either unfixable without working from the ground up, or making the game even worse than it already is. This is simply the way this video game is always going to be. During the BDSP and Legends Arceus video essays, at the end I totaled up all my pros and cons with the game, quickly going through all of them. I feel like I covered the most important ones during the discussion on aesthetics anyway, and with how long this video ended up I'm sure I'm not the only one who wants to move on with my life by now. So instead I'm just going to display my list on screen rather than spending the next half an hour going through them all, even if it would pad it to 7 hours. All in all, I'd say there's about a dozen things I liked in this game. Trastalization was a honestly kind of cool mechanic. Aino and Larry are great, love those two. The ride Pokemon's pretty neat. Pokedex of this game was super charming. You know, as clunky and awful as the multiplayer is, I at least gotta give it brownie points of just being able to play alongside one another in the same world. Like, it can't be understated how big that is, so that'll be included in the pros. Bunch of points for music, because the music's freaking amazing, honestly. Main character models look amazing, and the hair options aren't gender locked, and I think the clothes in general, but I honestly didn't tinker around that much with customization considering why would I, since you have to wear a school uniform, you can barely customize anything. So about a dozen pros. As for cons, well, here's everything from chapter one, so up to, uh, up to there, and then chapter two, everything about it being open world goes until somewhere around here. Yeah, around, uh, around there is where chapter 2 goes. Chapter 3, gameplay, goes from 21 until it was on a decent bit. Goes on a little smidge there before we get to the story stuff, yep. Definitely, uh, definitely a few things that I wasn't exactly all that happy with in terms of the, uh, in terms of the gameplay. Uh, where do we get into the story? Because, yeah, it goes on for a little while. Okay, here are 84 is where we start with the story. So here's a, uh, here's, there's my gripes with the story as we went through. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a few things there. And then, yeah, goes until, uh, goes until there. Nothing for chapter 5, because chapter 5 is just my story rewrite. I only have one con for the, uh, one con for the music. That's just the gym leader loops. There were some other complaints that I had with the soundtrack. Like, I feel like the elements of Penny's theme blended together. But I'm not so, you know, distraught about it that I'd include it in a con. You know, the only one that I felt warranted being included is just like the really simple loops of the gym leader theme if you're stuck on one Pokemon for a while. As cool of an idea as it is, just not super well executed. So the soundtrack in general was really great, so that's a chapter with the least cons of just one. And then visuals and aesthetics and stuff. It, uh, there was a lot of things that really weren't all that great with that. Yeah. So I'd say there was about a dozen things that I liked about the game and about 150 things that I didn't like. Oh, and yeah, th here's some things that are just in this chapter, the conclusion that I mentioned here, like the fact that I marked up the DLC price. So yeah, that's a little bit of a disparity <laughs> for the way that I see this game. For reference, there was about 40 things that I liked in Pokemon Legends Arceus and about, what was it, like 80? No, it was, it was 100. Things that I didn't like in Legends Arceus. 
And then in Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl, it was about six things that I liked, and this was the one that I think was 80, right? That went up to 77. I think that there was some uh, things that I missed, though, and I think that it went up to 80, <laughs> if I recall. Around 80-ish, at least. Oh, by the way, while I was scrolling on my script here in the video essay, you saw that right. It is 141 pages. <laughs> Ah, so much pain. My goodness gracious. I've done so much writing. I give myself carpal tunnel. To conclude this video essay, I like to tell the story of how I've handled what games I cover on this channel. When I first began content creation, I was streaming on Twitch doing viewer games of Smash 4. That was my main game. Sometimes I'd stream other multiplayer games for fun like a smidge of Pokémon Tournament, or a bit of Dead by Daylight, to the point that Smash Bros. and DVD eventually became my two main games. I didn't really do playthroughs all that much. I wasn't opposed to the idea, though, and my shelf that had every physical game I own, I figured was just a big shelf of opportunity for things that I might like to cover one day. Here's this shelf with all these things I have an established connection to that I can share with the world if I ever choose to. And so, I did sometimes, doing playthroughs of some old classics, along with new titles that caught my interest, but for the most part I was still streaming Smash Bros and Dead by Daylight. I eventually quit being a Smash viewer game streamer, though soon after got involved as a Smash commentator, and was still streaming DVD just as regularly, being rather addicted to the game honestly. As time went on, I began to shift towards doing more playthroughs, covering more games, having more complete series that get added to my channel forever. For years, this was still mostly games I already owned or had an interest in, things I already had some sort of attachment to. In the last several years though, I've made much more active efforts to diversify my gaming palette, playing things that I'd only heard about before, things that I would have never considered playing years prior, that I'm now trying out and getting to add to my experiences. I've played about every genre of video game you can imagine, and while sometimes I'll find myself playing something that I end up really not enjoying for one reason or another, more frequently I'll find myself enamored with this adventure I never knew was out there. Nowadays I only really play Smash Bros with friends and family, or during an annual event I help out with. And I haven't touched Dead by Daylight in well over a year now. I barely touch multiplayer games nowadays. I figure, why stream more of those same games I've already streamed so much of, when I can make further progress in an adventure I've never experienced before, get another experience under my belt, and more examples that I can use in video essays, and knowledge I take with me as I prepare to work in the gaming industry. My game queue keeps me busy, and stressed out because it's a lot to manage alongside video essays like this, but it keeps me happy, and going forward I have so many different experiences I can draw on. The moral of this story is how easy it is to get comfortable with things that you already have an established connection to. Why bother trying something new when you can be content on more of the same? We see that feeling be very strong for us in the western world with established brands. This is a brand we've been with for so long and will continue to be with. I grew up playing Pokemon and have an established connection to it, therefore it's important that I pick up the newest mainline title. We also see such a big emphasis on things that are new in our world. This thing is the new one that's only just now coming out, therefore its value is far greater than anything that came before it. A great example of that is being willing to pay full price for Pokemon BDSP instead of just playing Pokemon Platinum. The gaming industry is still relatively young, but even so with 40 plus years of games that can still be played today, there's a whole world of potential here only it doesn't have the shiny new moniker anymore. There was certainly a time that I would have almost always only picked up and played games from my established brands, and not taking the time to go back and play games that have already been out for some time, or are from IPs that I have no established connection with. But I'm glad now to be having all sorts of new adventures all the time. So what I want to share is, don't be afraid to try new things, go on a new adventure, rather than retreading the same one over and over again, and having this to show for it. And if anyone wants any game recommendations, feel free to join the Discord, and I'd be glad to share some based off of what types of games you're interested in. For those who are perfectly content with Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, 
this is my discussion question to you in the comments. What does this game deliver you that you feel another game cannot? My answer is Larry. And well, it's the end of the video. I thank you for taking this journey with me. I guess this is the part where creators usually link all their platforms. Meh, if you care, you'll figure it out. The only platform I will mention is something because I'm only creating it as of this video. I've been working on this video as my main editing project for over half a year now and put hundreds of hours into it over that time. It's occurred to me with that insane time investment that, huh, I could have put that kind of hours into an actual job job and benefited myself much better. So I decided to make something that I never thought I'd make. By giving some money to my Eevee, I evolved it into a Patreon. What the shit? Because you see, I've always considered myself to be rather passionate about not starving to death. So, in case anybody is interested in enabling my video essay making addiction, that could be my excuse to keep on making videos like this over putting hours into other work during that time instead. Only other thing of mine I can think to mention is, if you like the kind of stories that I write, you can always check out my Minecraft series I suppose. Although, it's still a work in progress, and working on this video really put that project on the back burner. Oh, I guess one other thing that I can mention is if you do want to find the other video essays, where they are is the very top of the channel homepage. For whatever reason, one of the most common types of comments that I get, and I've even gotten in emails before, is WHERE ARE THE VIDEO ESSAYS? Literally first thing at the very top of the channel homepage. In terms of the last things worth mentioning about Scarlet and Violet, I'll cover the DLC as part of my Scarlet Violet series when it's out. But after how many hundreds upon hundreds of hours this video essay took me, I'd rather move on to other video essay projects, so chances are I won't do a DLC video essay unless it's actually surprising the state it comes out in, or there's a lot of demand for seeing that. So let me know if it's something you'd like to see, and I'll certainly consider it at least. Otherwise, if you want my full thoughts on those DLCs, either check out that series, or if you just want the review, here's a life hack on my channel. I give my full review for every game when the credits roll during the finale part. So, if you just want my review, go to the finale part of a series and skip to the credits. So, you can just do that for the DLC if you want when it's out. When it comes to video essays, I think I'd like to go back to doing some shorter form ones again on gaming industry topics, or specific aspects of games for a while. Those are fun. <laughs> it's over half a year on one video business is pretty draining. Of course, I'll keep doing some longer full reviews of games I'm passionate about like this. But, nearly seven hours? Yeah, that I don't know if I'm ever doing again. Which, speaking of, thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. It really does mean a lot. How is this the most... The highest revenue generating uh, media IP of all time? Like, I can see right through that mountain. Ugh, this game's an embarrassment. Well... Wait, what? WERE YOU IN THE ROCK?! It was great, wasn't it? I pressed the R to throw a ball and nothing happened, there we go. What? Wait, why'd the ball bounce you up?! Yeah, that lady's still floating and that- Whoa! What is going on with that guy's hair now? He has like a freaking saw blade lodged in his head and his eyes are glitching out! I know, right? I agree! It is, isn't it? Wait, is the one on the inside saying something different? Who knows what it is. <laughs> they both have coffees as well. Oh, man. Wait, do they even have- they even have the exact same model, they just have a different skin color and clothes. Alright, this way we go. Oh my goodness. Yeah, game speed tied to the frame rate. You, uh, you love to see it. If I'm about to go to the Thinker Bob anyway. No, let's do this. What? 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 I was trying to attack the Chansey! This is criticized for being an empty game. What if this game's cities have the opposite problem of too many ugly de- Why is it that the bottom of the screen bugs out like that whenever we terrestrialize? No, I'm switching back here. Look at the bottom of the screen like flashing green like crazy. Look at it go. So wait, do I go alongside here? Oh my goodness, the frame rate. What is happening? But yeah, let's see here. 
Because how stiff she is, her movement looks almost like that of a highly intelligent robot. What, Nimona? Um, wait. Oh, but some people made theories that she could be an evil robot in disguise. Gita, you mean. <laughs> She's a little bit too robotic for people's taste. What about this one? What happens if I hit this? Oh, I can move this one around! Oh, look at this! Wait. Woohoo! <laughs> The opening acts turn the cheering and the stage lighting up to 11. This is a cutscene! The world isn't existing in a cutscene! Did they not even playtest their cutscenes and be like, hmm, the world doesn't exist? Should we maybe change that? Nah, ship it out. We have deadlines to meet. Oh, I can't believe this video game right now. Time to die. Guess I'll die! Is this scripted or something? What's going on here? Well, you can run away from this opponent. Fine. I'll throw a Pokeball at it and get good RNG. Hands are trembling so badly you can't pull items out of your bag. Alright, do I just select attack and then Paridon or Miraidon? I don't remember which one is which. Alright, yeah, I just select attack and then this happens. And then Sprigatito's not gonna get hit and the Legendary comes in. How long are you gonna take before you do Crunch? Just like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it eventually. Wait, use Crunch? That was Howl! That sent my Pokemon back! That's the complete opposite of Crunch. I'm not seeing things, right? Are you kidding me? This is no longer even the day one version. This is version 1.1. This has been patched. Like, this is updated. I knew it. That's not an item Pokeball. That's just like a placeholder that marks the center of the cave, and it hasn't even been patched. The game has been out for over a month now. Wait, no. It came out on the... Yeah, it came out on the 18th. Over a month now. I think it might actually be ground level. Yeah, I see it. I see the center over there. All right, we don't have to. We don't have to scale this after all. Good to uh, good to know. Uh, so much slowdown. What the heck is this? We'll never know. We'll never know what the hell that was. It's just gone. I have to follow the. But yeah, I have to follow the prophecy. There is no jump button with your trainer. You have to get onto uh, that. Do that there. So chilly. Whoa. What? <laughs> Me too. Oh, what's going on with a pixelated bit in your eye? Why is it like the red reflection in your eye just like a few squares? Oh. Let's get this party started. All right. And then it's a similarly long black screen to load. Again, what's in the exact same area. Whoa, he's got a DJ on his laptop. You're challenged by Giacomo of Team Star. Whoa, was that mountain not existing for a hot second there? <coughs> I'm just over here dying. Again, sorry for my coughing, but I'm a little bit under the weather is the case but the show must go on is that hopping back there just frozen is this pokeball floating it's just floating Ooh, wind guardian love you pokeball i guess or something yeah jumping and gliding are the things that destroy the frame rate the most my god and then what well, bam a beautiful picture are you here or are you not there they don't have any hit detection this strip do not have any hit detection. Yep, this um this seems about right. What happens if I do this? Nothing. Nothing. The game doesn't think they exist. Can you do that? Hey, why are you fighting Galissapod and nickname a cruise, but I'm invisible! I'm gone! I've been banished to the Shadow Realm! <laughs> anyway. That uh, what the heck is this thing? Don't crash my game, please. Oh, there's an ominous black stake driven into the ground. Will you pull up the stake? Okay. I don't know. When you pull up the stake, it crumbled and vanished. Wow, it really took that long to load that? Great. My life feels so much better now that I did that. It's probably going to censor it. It probably won't let me. <laughs> I don't think it'll let me here. Wait! It, it doesn't... Really? 
Haven't they been censoring Pokemon names since like Gen 4 or something like that? Nani? <laughs> Where do you want to send Flittle Bitch? <laughs> All right. This has to be traded to someone eventually. Oh, what is that? <laughs> I'm going to take great care of her. She's going to be my best Pokemon on my team. The two NPCs behind, are their eyes just like missing. And what is going on with like the world back there? There's like the mountains and then there's like that weird triangle shaped thing where it's like, is the world not existing? Are those textures down below being like stretched up in a weird way? What is that? What is happening? We Alright. Oh my goodness, the frame rate. Yep, I see water seems to work the exact same as in Legends Arceus. That non-aquatic Pokemon is just completely submerged and walking like it doesn't care at all. <laughs> it's back to an image again. <laughs> not that I, I do not mean to offend you. In fact, I wish to ask for your assistance. It's literally just a freaking screenshot that they plastered on the on the TV. <laughs> With what? Been like variations on red and blue because I guess Game Freak just really, really loves the colors red and blue. And maybe it's also just like a marketing thing where whoa, whoa, whoa! Why does the ground get all weird? The surface there. It's like it's a magical sur This looks like it'd be platform nine and three quarters where it's not quite real and I could just walk right through it. Nope. You know, just know as Diglett. Senpai's new artwork, she's bathing in the blood of her enemies. <laughs> wait, wait, why am I up here? Yeah! Woo! Woohoo! Yeah! You go! Don't give up, partner! Keep on making weird noises at him! Oh, that was the weirdest noise of them all yet! Good job! From an old game. No, technically in re-releases of Mario 64 they patched it, sadly. It is big sad there. Anyway, um, are you gonna do that every single time for all three? That's so annoying. That's so dumb. This is like the 3,000 year long attack animation. The game doesn't count it as a step, it counts it as a slope. Which means I can slide down this very slightly. Oh. 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 At least you know for a fact that you won't get blinded by that screen. Why is there an item here? I can't even collect it. I go into the loading zone. Well. Bam. Defeated Gisela the student. No level ups there, but close. Can't believe this gym test makes us steal each other's clues. That's fighting dirty. Is it? That's a gosh dang it sandwich sign. Yeah, it seems like as time goes on, this game is probably going to have, like, very minor things fixed in it, but, you know, if you really want to fix this game, Coridon's invisible now! What was I just saying? This game is inherently broken to its core, and it's never going to get fully fixed. You would need to rework it from the ground up to be able to fix a game this inherently broken. Alright, is everyone else gone? It's just you and me? Alright. Just between you and me, the real treasure was 